Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. So my name's Tim. I'm an alcoholic. I, I haven't prepared this in the sort of traditional sense of doing an outline or something. I just thought I'd wing it, hope, and so hopefully that will work. So it's not necessarily going to be very linear. Um, before we get on to step one, though, um, you've got to make sure they're ready for, for step one. It's no good launching into step one unless you've got someone that knows what they're in for. And... Uh, the thing is with saying, well, how do you how do you get someone to step one? Well, it's almost like the question, how long is a piece of string? Well, it depends how long the piece of string is. Uh, it depends on so many different factors. There are so many different types of people who've got so many different types of experience. So I'm going to outline a few different types of person. It won't be exhaustive, but it'll cover some of the main bases. So the first one is someone who is completely new to recovery, completely new to AA. Um, as Margaret Atwood said, doesn't know that doesn't know their ass from a hole in the ground uh, as far as AA is concerned, and as far as alcoholism is concerned. Um, and if, this is the easiest person, in fact, to get to step one, because you don't have to clear lots of wreckage out of the way. And also, they've probably been drinking in the last week or so, so they're, they're usually a little bit chastened by that and just a tiny little bit willing. They don't know they're allowed to argue with you yet. Um, that comes within about three or four weeks, they figure that out. Someone tells them and then they start to argue. But but, but the really new ones are, are very good. But, but um, I think it's very helpful for people to know a little bit about the fellowship. And so I would always make sure they go to a gazillion meetings. And if their mind is still working, I get them to... Uh, read the big book up to page 164. A lot of people these days, have, uh, the, the rock bottom is higher than it was 20 years ago on average, I think. Uh, people seem to be a bit less damaged cognitively than they used to be. It's different with drugs. Some some drugs, it's actually the other way around. Um, but with, with the alcoholics, they, they, they tend to be uh, readers, able to read, certainly around here, they tend to be able to read, and that they're often spiritually literate. They've often read spiritual books, which they hadn't 20, 25, 30 years ago, by and large. So you can give them that. If that, if, if they're not readers, uh, I give them good old-fashioned talks to listen to, like Clancy, who seems to, and Don Pritz, who get, who seem to get through to people very effectively. So they've got some sense of what AA is about. And uh, at the very least, I'll outline uh, why we have the steps in the first place. And of course, you're sort of begging the question, really, because to explain why you need all of the steps, you have to give them a little bit of an understanding of step one. The steps two to 12 are there because of step one, namely uh, that uh, left of my own devices, I'll drink. If I drink, I'm going to drink buckets and I might never stop it. It'll kill me. So I need something to change me so I don't have the first drink. Uh, so you, people have got to be bought into the whole thing uh, or it won't, it, won't, it won't work. They won't know why they're doing it. If people understand why they're doing it, there's a much bigger chance that they'll actually do the work which is required and not get too bogged down in step one. There's a lot of material in step one. Um, so that's the person that's totally new. You've got to give them an introduction. Um, the next character is someone who's been bumbling around AA for, uh, for anywhere between a few months and two or three years um, in kind of good old fashioned meetings where you go along and you just, you know, people just share about their week. And there's a little bit about drinking, a little bit about gratitude and things are so much better now. I'm not drunk and a few sort of tips so that they haven't really been exposed to the program. Um and again, these 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 people are uh, there's less work to do with preparation. Normally, if they ask for sponsorship, it's because they've reached a crisis. They've figured out that there's something more than just meetings. 
uh, and they've they've isolated you as someone that kind of knows something that they don't. And so the cell is relatively easy there and there. I definitely get people to read through the first one, six, four pages. They're physically sober for a while. They're almost always capable of reading. I'll come to the case of people that can't because I've had that. Um, uh, the, the hardest case is people who've been 5, 10, 15, 20 years in AA with or without relapsing. They've been to 100,000 meetings. They've, in inverted commas, uh, been through the steps a number of times, but they're still crazy. And they've got all sorts of little bits of knowledge, uh, but it doesn't add up to anything because all the pieces of the jigsaw puzzle haven't been put together. There, um, you've got to come at it very differently because they they sort of know everything already. They might know all the individual bits of information, as I say, they haven't put them together. And there, the cell is why what I'm offering with a path through the big book is different than what they've been doing. And I simply do that with my own experience about how when I did a, a piecemeal with little bits here and little bits there, I got some progress and some results, but it fell short of getting the rocket into orbit. To get the rocket into orbit, every single NASA needs to get everything right. If it gets one thing wrong, if it misses one thing, the rocket ain't going into orbit. There might be a big bang somewhere, but it ain't going to get into into orbit. Um, so uh, again, that's a different that's a different question. And also, there are lots of problems with taking someone through step one if they've been through the steps before, but are kind of, uh, are nuts or all over the place, or they've drunk again, or something like that. Because what you've got to do is undo a whole load of stuff before you build a fresh, before you build a new. Uh, so people need to know what they're in for. Um, they also need to be prepared for some hard work uh so and i don't make any bones about this and you sort of i do it slightly apologetically i say well i, I was it's very i'm sorry to have to break this to you but it's going to be hard work and i totally understand if you don't want to do it i wouldn't want to do it unless i absolutely had to my friend tom says you want to hold out as long as you can you you want to <laughs> don't rush into this and it says in the big book about you know, if he wants to proceed straight away, don't let him. Make sure they think over it for 24 hours. Otherwise, I'll say you rushed them if you go into it. Um, so uh, what I've got to prepare people for is is, is this. It's a little um, sequence. Number one, uh, do you have a problem? What's your problem? And you've got to isolate the fact that there is a problem with uh, the substance. What One th actually interesting thing, a lot of people who've been sober a while don't think they've got a problem with alcohol anymore. They think, well, you know, now I've got a thinking problem, not a drinking problem, and now I've got life problems, not realizing that unless those are solved adequately with a spiritual awakening, they're going to drink again. It's not. The other steps are not disconnected from step one. The steps are there because of step one. And the benefit to one's life is the, is the side effect. Um, so they've got to recognize as a problem that they've got the problem that the steps are there to solve. They may have a hundred other problems too, but have they got the problem that the steps are there to solve? Namely, uh, a mind which is so broken, they need a power greater than themselves to be the higher authority to turn to. So that as, as Grady OH says, you want to put your life in the hands of God because God isn't thirsty. Um, they've got to recognize that, number. so for number one, they've got a problem. Number two, they don't have a solution. Um, and to recognize whatever solution they think they've got so far in totality hasn't worked. So it's, the whole thing's got to be set aside completely. Um, otherwise, any new information you give them, if it's consistent with what they already know, it'll they'll let it in. They'll admit it. If it's inconsistent, uh, that the, their antibodies will reject it, and and they'll end up no further ahead because they'll only admit the information that is consistent with their existing uh, worldview. 
So there's got to be the sense that although you may have, you know, the person may have achieved a lot and understood a lot and, and learned a lot, everything needs to be set aside. Anything which is true and good and useful will come back through the course of the process. So they won't be permanently getting rid of anything useful. They're just temporarily setting it aside. And to do that, the, the best way, I, I had someone say to me, this was a sort of, the, the, it was someone on a tape, but they were, as it were, having a dialogue with the audience and I was listening to the tape. So I was having the, you know, part of the dialogue and, and it went something like this, you know, uh, how old are you? And I thought to myself at the time, I'm, 30, I don't know, 34, whatever I was, 34, 35. And are you happy? No, was the answer. I struggled to get to that, uh, you know, initially. Well, I'm not sure. Am I? Am I um, I'm happier than I used to be. I'm happier than lots of people I know. I'm happier than the people at my home group. But fundamentally, I was there were things I was unhappy about, and that poisoned the whole thing. And uh, it then went like this. So you've been trying for 35 years to be happy, and you're not happy. If your plan was ever going to work, don't you think it would have kicked in by now? If it hadn't kicked in by now, when do you think it was going to kick in? So I had to admit complete defeat. And it's, it doesn't take long. This is a 24-hour, 48-hour process for people to, to admit the complete. I, I don't find it takes long. It just The question needs to be asked. Are you happy? No. Uh, do you want to set aside everything you think you know for a new experience? Yes. Good. Are you willing to let go of your old ideas? And are you willing to go to any lengths? If they say yes with are you willing to go to any lengths? I've got a daily program that I give people. Actually, there's a little note I'm going to put in the chat. If I'm if the chat does the chat work? Yes. Um I don't know what that link even is now. Um, oh, yeah. So some, oh, by the way, icebreaker questions. That's the icebreaker questions. That's to get to know them. I adjust those. If they're super new, half those questions won't make sense. So I've got a different version for people who are totally new. But you want to get as much information about them as possible so that you know how to pitch it. But the thing, if they say they're willing to go to any lengths, I just sent a second link, which is the daily program. And that also includes basically the notion that they're going to be doing step work daily, uh, schedule it first thing in the morning, as then it won't get bounced by anything. So go to bed early, get up super early, get up before the cat gets up, get, get up before the kids get up. Um, do your step work early because then you've spent all day smugly thinking, I've done my step work today. And you can tell everyone you've already done your step work. Like everyone you speak to, you can brag about that. If you leave it till night, number one, it won't happen. Number two, you create guilt. And then the guilt actually prevents you from doing it because you don't want to admit the guilt. So you pretend the cause of the guilt is not there. And then you forget to do your step work and you're not forgetting, you're repressing the knowledge of it so you don't need to feel guilty about it. Best way around that, do it in the morning. Um, I always, always get sponsees now, if they do some step work, to find a gang of little people who have also done the steps to run the step work past, preferably people who will challenge and not just be nodding dogs. Um, because once it's once they've talked a topic through with three people, everyone gets everything. There's, I've, I've ceased to have problems with people understanding things. If it's just me trying to explain something, for some reason, that there's something that happens. When you're the sponsor, you're the authority figure, and this barrier comes up, and it, it causes communication problems. However nicey-nicey you do it, you can get it right on your side. If you're the sponsor, you're, good, you're the problem because you're the authority figure. So sometimes with the initial processing of information, they need to bash it out with someone else um, who they don't have an authority problem with. So, And that's what people did with me when I was new. They said, you know, my sponsor said, talk to all your little friends about step one. Don't just talk to me about it. Talk your step four through with all your little friends at your home group, which I did. I did a bit more structure, but I give people a list of people who I know have got a, a good sound understanding of the program. So the daily program is terribly important because they won't they, they, they won't do the work unless it's supported with lots of people, lots of meetings and something 
which kind of gets, starts to give them access to a higher power with steps 10, 11, and 12 straight away. Now, as regards step one, it's, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm going on a bit longer than I was. Is that all right, Alistair? Okay. Um, is it such an unusual thing to actually talk about? I, I'm, I'm, <laughs> I kind of don't care. It just takes as long as it takes because it just isn't the opportunity to do this a lot of the time. Um, the actual step one, I'm going to start with the hardest case and then work backwards. The hardest case is people that can't read for educational reasons. And they can read the words. They can, they can, if you ask them to read out the sentences, they can read out the sentences. Um, but you'll, the, the, the sign is where the biggest sign is when people don't see the full stop as the end of the sentence and they carry on reading as though there isn't a full stop. So they're, they're literally just pronouncing the words. If that's happening with the ends of sentences, it ain't going to go in. You have to read it with them. Uh, line by line and make sure they get it. Uh, this is also the case with people who um, are still acting out with food or sex. I can't read. I've needed to go through it. I had someone that was many years sober but was acting out very badly with sex stuff and he was trying to Put a lid on it but it was you know it was a lot better than it had been but it was still there the mind was so scrambled by what he was doing sober that you couldn't give him a page to read and hope that he could come back having heard what the page was saying he heard a whole load of other things so we needed to go we sat day after day week after week in in a coffee shop in east london just went through it page by page the problem with that is it can take a long time it take a bloody long time to get through it. Um, so what you can do is select key passages. And if you want to do a selection of key passages, so you get them to listen on tape. Sometimes people can listen on tape. If it's a nice, soothing voice, it actually goes in in a way that stuff on the page doesn't. So they listen to the whole thing, but uh, you, hide, you basically pull out some key passages in the doctor's opinion, um, get them to listen to Bill's story for identification, key passages in chapter two, and then the key characters, a few, couple of passages in chapter three and the key characters. So you, I'll come to the characters later. Um, so... You're still going through it with them in detail, but you're not making it take three months. It can take, it can literally take three months if people's minds are super scrambled. And there's a danger of just losing the patient in the process because it's just taking so long. Um, what, what I've done with a lot of people over the years is not something I do now, but uh, it, it's very successful. I've got various worksheets I've used for step one with lots of quests with a bunch of questions for each chapter. And there you can do it in two ways. You can either give them the chapter plus the worksheets, say, have a look at the chapter, have a look at the worksheets, answer the questions, come back, we'll go through. Uh, or. Um, I go through the, again, if there's an educational problem or the mind is scrambled, then I'll go through the questions one by one. Um, a third method, and I did this for a while, and this was, this was very good, is get them to read anywhere between two and five pages at a time. Uh, so today you're going to read two pages and then you call me and we talk about it. Maybe you call two other people, talk about the two pages, then call me and talk about the two pages. And then they say, I say, what did you get out of that? What did you understand from that? And they say some very peculiar things. And then I say, well, I think some really interesting points here are dot, dot, dot. You might want to write these down. <laughs> They're always like the important bits are never the bits that they spot, but it gives them a chance to interact with the text and kind of make it their own. But you're also pointing out the important bits afterwards that breaks it down into chunks. Some people can manage. They can't cope with the idea of getting through a book. But you say, can you read two pages? They can read two pages. Um, if people have been through the steps before. And have got some comp some understanding and competence of what is going on um 
uh, rather than just going through the chapter, the book chapter by chapter, because the kind of chap the chapters jump all over the place. One minute you're on the problem, next minute you're on the solution, then you're back to the problem, then you're back to Bill's story, then you're back to the solution, then boom, spiritual awakening, then you're back to the problem again. It kind of goes all over the place. Um, uh, so sometimes I do it by topic. And so this is the, my preferred method at the moment, especially with people who've got some experience, is to do it in this in this specific order. Physical craving, no such thing as a safe slip. And I'll come, come back to these one by one. Physical craving, there is no such thing as a safe slip. Mental obsession. And those three together produce the diagnosis. And then there's the prognosis, progressive, fatal, incurable. And then there's a discussion of unmanageability. And then there's a discussion, well, what's the solution? The solution is spiritual. And you can either, given all of those topics, uh, I think I've got a note I can give you on this. Um, yeah. There we go. So this is my standard step one note I give people. And it's got some links to some blog articles as well. I don't always give them that. If 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 they're going to have trouble processing lots of material, I don't give them the blog articles. I just say ignore those. Just look at the book. Um. So that 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 covers those those, those topics. Um. Because I think step one builds up logically, and. If if there's any doubt about so if someone's very competent, they you know I I've, I've got someone at the moment who's thirty odd years sober, so I gave them the whole of step one to look at in one go. But uh, often I'll break it down into those individual elements. So the first one, and I'll, and I'll tell you why. Um, I established that they got a problem with drinking. What's a problem with drinking? You're drinking so much that you get consequences, which after the event you regret. I mean, at the time, you take them in your side. I even take them in my stride. Do you tell me before a drink what the cons consequences are going to be? I'm fine. Afterwards, when they've hit, I'm not so fine. So that's someone who's got a, a drinking problem. You're drinking enough that you get consequences that after the event you don't want. And you look at the question of, uh, well, solution number one is can you moderate? And if the answer is, uh, if your experience is that you haven't, then you, it means you can't. And the simple way it was put to me, and I think this works very well. Well, if you know that moderation is uh, uh, an answer to drinking too much and you didn't do it, you're either powerless or you're, what? Well, if not, what are you? Are you mad? Are you dumb? I mean, you don't seem to be either of those. So... If you're not powerless, what are you? And that's the unanswerable question. And that's that's really straight from the doctor's opinion. It didn't satisfy us to be told that we couldn't control our drinking just because we were um, in full flight from reality, uh, mad, outright mental defectives. That you just don't have the you know the brain cells to rub together, or in full flight, or, or were maladjusted to life, unhappy. Uh, none of those make sense. And so the only thing you're left with is powerless. Now, the reason it's so important to get this done first, if someone is equivocating about whether or not they can moderate, they need to solve that. Because the question of am I, would I be insane to have the first drink is only a question if having the first drink is an insane thing to do. If you might be able to moderate, it wouldn't be insane to have the first drink. So the, uh, the Mental obsession is all about insanity, and that can't be a question unless you've got the physical craving down. So you've got to get the physical craving understood first. And the, there's a pivot point in the book. When I go through the book in a linear way, so page by page, bottom of 22, top of 23, it says that's the pivot point where it, it finally draws a line under the physical craving and says, right, now we've established that when you drink, you have little control over the amount you you take. Um, oh, no, 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 it's a different quotation. Um, uh, 
something yeah that's it when you have a drink something happens in the bodily and the mental sense which, may, which makes it virtually impossible to stop the experience of any alcoholic will abundantly prove this and then it says uh if that be if if that's the case then the problem is in the mind i.e the mind which gets you to have the first drink in the first place but you the premise behind everything else on step one is that you can't drink without drinking too much and they, there's uh, the the one thing almost everyone, especially even the slippers, is totally down with the idea that, you know, one drinks too many and a thousand aren't enough. They're down with that. What they're not down with is the corollary of that, which is if that's the case, you can't. There is no such thing as a safe slip because you literally might never come back because you have a slip on one day. If you slip on one day, you're much more likely to slip on the next day, too. And I always give the example of my poor old friend, Paul, who uh, started drinking. He was the same age as me, started drinking in 1995. Uh, it's 2021. And he's, I, the last I heard, he, 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 he'd left AA again. Um, Harry, you may know what's happened to him if, he, if he's back or not. But 26 years later, and the poor kid isn't, still isn't back. And that, that started with a slip, which started with one day of drinking. So there's no such thing as a safe slip. And once you've got that, if you understand that you you not only do drink too much and do terrible things, but you might literally not come back from that slip, then you've got a legitimate question. Am I the sort of person that would be crazy enough to have the first drink? Uh, by the way, the story for there's no such thing as a safe slip is the man of 30 who could stop once, stops for 20 years, starts again, and then can't stop. Um, once you've established that that you've got the physical craving, no such thing as a slave, safe slip, you're into mental obsession territory. And there is, it's downhill from here. Uh, basically, uh, if you've got years of experience, this is how I always put it to people, if you've got years of experience of drink doing bad things, yet that didn't deter you, then again, you're either dumb or you're mad or you're alcoholic. Pick one. Which one is it? Um, keeps it super simple. Uh, people get very wrapped up, but I don't know if I really wanted to give up and I don't know if I ever really tried to give up. And Irrelevant. It's the fact that you didn't. The fact is sufficient. Um, and the, the, the key passage is top of 21 where it talks about if a sufficiently strong reason comes along, a heavy drinker can moderate but an um, or stop, an alcoholic can't. So I get people to give a year. What year? Give me a year when um, you started to have very bad consequences from drinking. They'll say, well, 1991. Um, and what year is it now? Well, it's now 2021. Okay, so for 30 years repeatedly bad experience did not um stop you from having the first drink so the question of whether you could is neither here nor there if you could have you would have uh, and that cuts through that whole thing of whether or not they tried which is always i think is a complete red herring if you establish that you're the sort of person that um uh for whom experience doesn't consistently keep you away from the first drink. You're the sort of person who uh, then uh, drinks excessively and is minded to keep doing so because it just seems normal at that point. Then that, the, the, the diagnosis is done. And the in, there's an interesting line on 21 where it says, at some point in the drinking career of every alcoholic, he uh, begins to lose all control of his liquor consumption once he starts to drink. So I said, okay, what age did you first start to lose um, uh, control of your liquor consumption? Um, I'll say, give me an age. And I'll say, well, the first time I, you know, overshot was when I was 40. Okay, you've been a real alcoholic since you were 14. Often they think they've been a real alcoholic since last May or last Thursday, whereas in fact they've been a real alcoholic since, you know, the Callahan government which was the first time that they overshot. So your key, if you, if you, if they, if people can't, some people can not 
hold more than four or five ideas in their brain because they're so frazzled from drinking drugs. If you can't do anything but this, you look at 21. Did you have bad experiences from drinking? Yes. Did you moderate? No. Did you stop? No. You're an alcoholic. How long have you been an alcoholic? When was the first, first time you overshot? 1984. You've been an alcoholic since 1984. Would you like a solution? You, you can kind of do it in 60 seconds. Uh, the prog so that's the diagnosis. The prognosis is very, is very straightforward. There are three ideas. Progressive, fatal, and incurable. Uh, and those pretty much speak for themselves. Progressive, fatal, and incurable. Um, unmanageability. There's... Uh, it is one of those things where it, it throws it into the big book on page 59. It says unmanageable for the first and last time. <laughs> and it doesn't define unmanageable or unmanageability. And of course, to, when if, it, if it's not defined, there are two possible conclusions. Number one, they wrote the book like the Da Vinci Code, hoping that everyone was going to miss Marple their way into some you know secret divine truth or it was so bloody obvious they didn't need to elaborate because it was so bloody obvious and it's so bloody obvious that aa collectively has missed the point of what unmanageability is in large part there are, there are of course people who do get it um there's a, a tape it, of course the, the problem the what i'm speaking about here is the you know well, I'm not just powerless over alcohol, I'm powerless over people, places and things, and I'm neurotic and I'm incompetent and I'm disorganized and my life is unmanageable and I'm late for my tea service and my room is a mess and I shout at my mother, so my life is unmanageable. Uh, and those may or may not be true, but they're not distinguishing features of alcoholics. Uh, and lots of alcoholics are not, when they're new, necessarily disorganized, incompetent and neurotic. It's not what it was about. A lot of people are, I was, but they're not distinguishing features. They're sort of common symptoms. Um, I heard a public information tape, an AA public information tape on prisons many years ago, where there was this sort of Mr. Chumley Warner uh, voiceover. And the voiceover said, uh, and there was a sort of actor playing some, some alcoholic in prison. And the voiceover said, uh, this is Brian. Brian has lost control of his drinking and thus his life. And I thought, blimey, that's the best presentation of step one I've ever heard. If you can't choose whether or not you're going to drink, and when you drink, you can't choose how much you're going to drink. And if you drink too much, you're going to do some strange th things and you can't choose if you're ever going to stop. You're not in control of your life. Whether or not you have a drink is in control of your life. And if you're not in control of that, you're not in control of your life. The course of your life is literally determined by whether the switch flicks in your mind and says, let's go to the pub. Now, you may also be mad. You know, but you, you get bonus points for that. You know, if you haven't if you haven't turned over your mattress in six months, again, you get bonus points. But this is not unmanageability. Now, you've got to be very careful where you say this. If you try to make this point in an AA meeting, you'll get lynched afterwards um, because people are very attached to the idea that unmanageability is being sort of unhappy and very bad at doing things, uh, incompetence. Um, if you're uncertain about what Bill, because we know who wrote the big book, basically it was Bill. Other people had input, but Bill wrote it. 20 years later, he writes the 12 and 12, and they've got a problem because already by then, the unmanageability question had um, morphed within the AA fellowship. So they had a problem. People, as he puts it in the 12 and 12, with um, uh, a two, you know, a nice house and, and two cars in the garage, a job in a house and two cars in the garage, were coming to AA and struggling with the question of whether or not they were unmanageable, their lives were unmanageable. So he says, well, how do we get them to see their lives are unmanageable? So 
it's clearly, I mean, I mean, he doesn't say, well, you know, if you're doing well on the outside, I'm afraid you can't take step one. You'll have to get sober through some other organization because you have to be neurotic and incompetent to do step one. He doesn't say that. He says, going back through our own drinking histories, we could see that years before the onset of real problems, our drinking was no mere habit. It was indeed the beginning of a fatal progression. So unmanageability hasn't even got anything to do with consequences is got to do with choice if i am powerless i am not managed i am not in charge of my life the alcoholism is in charge of my life i'm in the grip of a progression which is bigger than me the progression is in charge of my life um and that's something that all alcoholics should be able to sign up to if you understand powerlessness then you then the best way it's explained to me if you're if you don't have the power to adjust the steering wheel uh you're not managing the car you're not in control of the car you've got to have the power to turn the steering wheel to change the direction of the car you've got to have the power to stop drinking to change the direction of your life in other words to manage the course of your life that's something that only uh alcoholics can sign up to and all alcoholics can sign up to and that gets around all of those messy problems with um unmanageability and the last point is is needing a spiritual awakening uh, i don't mention god unless i absolutely have to with sponsees in the early stages um I, my uh, alia will probably laugh at this um but the uh way i like to explain it is if if Susan and Clive used to drink a bottle of gin every day, they did not have the power to stay sober. But now Susan and Clive do not drink a bottle of gin a day. They have acquired the power. They've gone from being powerless to having power. So whatever is keeping them sober is available to me too. The 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 what, one doesn't need to understand the mechanism or where the power comes from. One simply needs to observe that, that, that your problem is lack of power. So the answer is axiomatically the acquisition of um, power. Um, so those, those are the basic elements of, of step one. And then the last point is the rounding off point is on page 44 where you say it, if when you honestly want to you find you cannot quit entirely or if when drinking you have little control over the amount you take uh then you're probably alcoholic now it's interesting it gives this is the last point i'm going to make now then i'm going to stop it says if if either of those two tests are passed you're alcoholic now i'm told that this is intentional but i i don't know i have no way of corroborating it i suppose and no, i have i just haven't asked the chat in question um, it shouldn't be all with those tests. It should be and. If I could, if I'm compelled to have a drink, but then I can totally keep it to one, I don't have a problem. I'm not an alcoholic. Uh, if I only, if I'm, if if when I drink, I drink buckets, but I can totally stay away from the first drink, and it's not a problem. I'm not an alcoholic of the big book variety. Both tests have got to be passed uh, for me to have a problem, which. I need AA to solve. And what's fascinating, people guard their reservations because they're frightened of not being able to get through the turnstile of step one, having to kind of leave AA or something. So often people pay lip service to step one. And that test, because it's or, I've had, had this countless times where people would admit, yeah, I definitely drink too much when I drink, but I could probably stay sober on my own. But it says either or, so yeah, I'm an alcoholic, or they or or it's the other way around. They say, yeah, I, I I can't stay away from a drink, but you know, I probably could control it if my life was more under control. But it says or, so yeah, I am an alcoholic. It inadvertently gets people to, or it, it gets people to inadvertently reveal reservations that they don't know are going to be obstacles. So that's an incredibly important paragraph. If you get them through that, then you're well on to step two. So I'm going to stop my timer there and uh thank you for indulging me for 38 minutes thanks a lot tim um thanks tim
usually what we're um the kind of format is um if if you'd be okay with it uh that we um, kind of open the floor to the ask questions if we if we have any um uh yeah um does anyone have any well, I had one, so I'm going to jump straight in if that's all right. Um, with uh, working with newcomer sponsees, um, and uh, that was a great um, outline of, of working step one. Um, do you find, and you, you outlined the different types uh, that you've come across in your experience, um, in, in your experience of like, we, we've been meeting people face to face for a long period uh, and and then we've gone into zoom i know you sponsor a lot of people around the world um is there a different do you use a different technique to sponsoring someone you've never met face to face do you insist on certain things done differently perhaps or yeah i'm kind of leaving it uh, yeah it is, it is difficult um I think it's all the more important to get people talking to more people than they other, otherwise might need to if there were face-to-face -face meetings. But honestly, I've, I've, what I've been struck by over the last year and a half is I haven't seen any greater likelihood of people slipping or not getting it because it's over the phone and over the internet than than face to face. I I just haven't seen I just haven't seen that. Um, uh, there's a line in A Course in Miracles about it's not bodies that join, it's minds that join. And a cur one very curious thing, there's a, a Course in Miracles teacher who does these remote set because, I mean, he's in a particular place. So the sessions he does are remote. And when he does one to one sessions, he does them over the phone, not on a video call. because He says the visuals are distracting. You'll hear what's going on in the voice much better if you can't see them in front of you. Now, um, the, the one thing to watch, I've got, I'm a, a sort of extremely aggressive A-type personality, which is not exactly to everyone's taste. Uh, I find myself much gentler with people face to face. I have to watch it on the phone. I, I, I can be very difficult. Uh, I'm better than I used to be, but it's still, I'm still nowhere near fixed. Um, uh, I do notice I see people's fragility and vulnerability much more readily um, when I see them face to face. Uh, so even if I can't meet them physically, it's super helpful if they come to one of the groups I go to where we can at least see each other on video. Um, if I'm folding laundry, I turn the video off, but otherwise I, I try and keep the video on. Or if I'm in an office and there are people walking behind me. But but I, I think some of that face to face stuff, you can it's amazing how much you can read when you just see people even on a video screen about where they are. So I think the important thing with the face to face thing is is um is to see what's going on emotionally behind the actual words. Um that I think that's all I've got on that. But uh, but I on from a, a pure sponsorship point of view, I think it works just as well over the phone as as anything. Except with super new people who it's first time, they're the ones who will almost certainly need lots of face to face hand holding. Hey, is it time to ask questions? Thanks, Tim. Um, I had a question about, so sometimes it's a straightforward alcoholic case and sometimes it's, well, my problem is alcohol and Coke and I've been making opium tea and I can't stop shagging around. And so how do you, do you take them through a, a rainbow step one? <laughs> okay, this is a nightmare. Um, right. First of all, is I... If they have a substance in the mix, uh, I've got to have one substance in common. If I don't have one substance in common, they should they need to find someone with a substance in common. Um, although with the, uh, one substance or one other addiction, so I, I've had people who are drug addicts and sex addicts. And it works because of the sex side of things. I, you know, there's the, the real kind of visceral connection on on, on that. Front. There's got to be some visceral connection. 
if you've got the visceral connection on one substance or behavior, you can cross apply it to everything else. And now you can do everything under one roof, except for um, uh, food, sex, and romance, I think are the three main ones where you can't. Uh, I'll come to the Al-Anon question in a moment. So that's a slightly different question. Uh, basically, uh, the behavior needs to stop or be massively reined in for any of the step work to work. So the sexual acting out has basically got to stop, or it's certainly the, the, the acting out which involves other people. Um, Similarly with the, the food, someone who's in full-blown anorexia will not hear a word you're saying. So what I do with, I, I can't, well, I've had food problems. I can't, I can't, I don't have it. In, I don't have food problems in the same way as people who go to OA. So I can't step one, two, and three them. And they also, the food people need a plan. Uh, and the people do plans in very different ways. You know, people in OA argue about this. Uh, you know, it's like it's it's like Christianity. There are lots of different ways of being an OA, and none of them agree, and they don't even talk to each other. Um, but I tell people to go. I give them a list of people. Say you need to go and do a. St let's say they're an AA and OA. You need to go to an OA meeting every week. You need to um, uh, do a step one, two, and three, and then the two programs merge when it gets to step four. And either you know, do the rest of the steps with them or do the rest of the steps with me, but don't try and do two sets of steps, four through nine, with two people at once. That's completely mad. That doesn't work. Um, uh, and it's so that's true with food. It's also true with the, the sex addiction stuff. Um, and I encourage people to uh, go to a SLA meeting every week or an SA meeting or an SAA meeting. Again, totally different approaches, different flavors, but to get bottom lines in place and if they do SLA they do the daily questions after the relapse um that's super important uh with with the kind of drugs and uh drink the only carve outs where the, i think they need specialist input because there's something different going on is pills so barbiturates benzodiazepines amphetamines um um Opiates and opioids, those are those your, and hypnotics, those are your basic uh, classes. If they've got a little pill thing going on, there's a deviousness, like with anorexia, there's a particular deviousness with the, and charm, which go together. I get them to talk to people with a pill history because they can wheedle through into what's going on inside the rationalizations behind the pills in a way that, so I don't have a pill history. So if it's pills, I get them to uh, talk to a pill person. If they're in the in the whole kind of ca uh, the the, the um, uh, crystal meth and sex combined with sex scene, they need to be going to CMA and talking to other people who've been in that scene again because that's that's incredibly hard not to relapse in, and you need incredibly strong support around you. So I'm all for getting multiple support on one, two, and three, but you kind of need one sponsor to take you through the whole, the process of one through 12, with the other kind of, you know, the one, two, three waltz and all the other fellowships as a kind of uh, bolt-on, but that you don't want like fully separate programs, otherwise it becomes super confusing. Does that answer the question, Harry? Yes, one quick thing is, Quite often I will get, I'm just powerless over everything. So I, 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 I try to get them to be very specific about what it is because otherwise we're just, uh, yeah, the level of specificity. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. The, 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 there is a, there's a very important point with that. Sometimes people can hide the gravity of a particular thing, which is going to kill them within three months by just saying, you know, I'm powerless over trees and I'm powerless over Netflix and I'm powerless over the, you know, and it, it diminishes the gravity of the thing which is actually killing them. Uh, I'm also, I know it's a, a, a bit naughty of me to do this, but I'm very, I'm not keen on the notion of primary and my, my drug of choice. If you're dead, you're dead. And it's not like the family are going to say, well, I'm so glad it wasn't his primary addiction which killed him. It's only the secondary one. If you're dying, you're dying. With the Al-Anon step one, what I get them, 
uh, to do the Alan on step one. I don't. I, I think is is it requires <laughs> it requires a subtlety and a sophistication. It's like AA. You don't need to know anyone to get into AA. You need to know someone to get into Alan on. Um, uh, the step one, I think, is, I mean, Ellie Shevard can correct me on here. It can be, it's a tough sell, the Al Anon step one. It's, there are layers, there are layers there. It takes people some, um, some defrosting. If someone is like, let's say, pure, purely out, this is a very common combination, purely alcohol when it comes to substances, but adult child of alcoholic, maybe married to an alcoholic, maybe alcoholic children. I get them to, to concentrate on the AA step one first and get them to do, you know, 100,000 Al-Anon meetings on the side to gradually thaw that side out. And once they've got a fully functioning AA program, then they can formalize the Al-Anon stuff. But my experience with the Al-Anon stuff, it helped me. It was the informal stuff, the fellowship, like the hearing the stories, was immensely powerful before I even did the formal work. Uh, one problem with the the psychologically with the people who are AA and Al-Anon, they will often feel psychologically much more drawn to the Al-Anon stuff. It seems to help much more quickly. And then the alcohol stuff gets ignored and then they're drunk and they don't, you don't see them for 10 years. And so if, if with, uh, with the Anon stuff, a tiny bit of delay to make sure they're on firm, a firm foundation uh, in firm sobriety or abstinence with whatever the thing which is going to kill them in six weeks is, is really helpful before you get into the subtlety of the Anon stuff. Uh, I don't know, Ellie Shepard, do you want to add something on that? Ellie yeah, Shepard. Hi. If, if someone has multiple addictions, um, do they work one, two, and three with one sponsor, then one, two, and three, one, two, and three, and then start working four to 12? So what what I'll do is um I'll get them I'll do one two and three with them and get them to go to the other fellowships to kind of initiate themselves with the other fellowships once they've understood the one two and three like for the first time in one fellowship they've got the basic ideas then they'll go and run through they'll sit for an afternoon with someone in OA and just run through how the ideas that so they'll let's say, let's say it's food. Uh, there's an, an OA meeting in London where they use the big book. So I, and I've got a list of people from there. So if I send them to one of those people, they'll get something which is big book consistent. They won't get confused. So I take them through the, the first three steps myself in on the AA side and then get them to go and sit with Cara for an hour to do one, two, and three in 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 OA, uh, but it doesn't take long because they've already done it. They just need to understand how the same principles they've already understood apply to the other thing. And maybe there's a bit more work they need to do, and they'll need to do food plans or agree some kind of you know daily calling in thing. Um, and then it's like tributary tributaries to a river. Once you've uh, you know that like each one, two, and three in in, in let's say AA and uh, SA and OA are there, the three tributaries come together and you've got a single program going forward on steps four through 12. Does that make sense? And then actually just one thing, and rather like with a river, when it gets to the coast can sometimes form a delta, when it gets to step 12, that they're gonna need some special input from about how to sponsor, you know, if you're, how do you sponsor an anorexic? How do you sponsor a sex addict? How do you sponsor someone with pills? You need to find someone that's got that specific experience. So again, it spreads out again when you get to that part of step 12, because there are different major differences between the fellowships there. Yeah, I, I, could you sponsor me? But by the way, I'm, I'm going to take, I, I have a problem with alcohol. I don't have a problem with acid and I'm going to be taking acid this weekend. Any yeah alcohol uh, in any form at all <laughs> there, there's a yeah it's it's tricky um i think we've got to understand that the notion of sobriety for me and other people are allowed to have a different notion of it is the notion of of being free of any influences so that i'm i can 
appreciate life full on. So whatever I'm experiencing, I'm experiencing because that's that's the experience of life I'm creating myself, not because of it's been chemically induced. Uh, there are people in AA that will sponsor people who are on all sorts, who do all sorts of things. I mean, I, uh, ayahuasca, for instance, is, is something that, that you know, in, in, there's a notion of California sober, <laughs> where you're sober on alcohol, but you know, who, who knows what else is slipping under the radar. And so I don't judge that. I don't say it's just not for me. So what I I'm interested in is wouldn't it be fun to discover what you can make of life without any chemicals? If you want something else, you need going to need to find someone that's made a success of doing that. Um, but there's a Jim Willis quotation. I'm struggling to. I wish I could find it, but I well maybe I can. Just give me a sec. Is it here? No, I can't find it. I'll I'll send it to you later, Alison, and maybe you can forward it to people if they're interested in in it. Um, um, one thing Jim Willis said, it's in his workbooks. He says, uh, you need a clear head for this process. Whatever the addiction is, whether it's food or sex or alcohol or whatever, it need you need to be abstinent to have a clear head. And he says a chilling line. We know of no program, so people who are still using, we know of no program that can help such people. So if I've got someone that's just all over the place because they're still fully in another addiction, there's, there's often nothing you can do. You just have to go to 100,000 meetings and hope that something gives that graces you abstinence or with the desire to be abstinent. But no, I wouldn't take someone through that is is committing to taking um, drugs. Medication is maybe a different question. It is a different question, but not an entirely straightforward one either. But we haven't got time for that today. Tim Alcoholic. Um, so with, with, we're going to be talking about step two. Um, there are three ways round step two. There's the shortest way round. There's the short way round. Then there's the long way round. Now, we can't get away from the fact that we've got the big book. There it is. It's there. It's published. It's too late. If we were going to object, if you or I were going to object to it being published, we'd have to go back to 1938. 1939 object, object to it then but we can't do that so we're stuck with it so that's what we got uh that's the long way round. so we agnostics is a long chapter it may not be the longest chapter but it's a bit like february is the longest month or at least it feels like it we agnostics feels like the longest chapter to me um and Honestly, with a lot of sponsees, you try and take them through we agnostics. By the time you got to the end, they're 87 times as confused as they were when they started. So what I'm going to present is like the super short way round and then a short way round. Then we're going to go through the chapter and say how I use the chapter. So the shortest way round. I'm going to use a word kippered. Uh, it's what, well, my father would have said, if you're effed, you see, I'm not, I don't want to say the word effed in its full form, so I'm going to say kippered instead. Um, so if you, you say to the, the, the newcomer or the person that's in trouble, you're kippered. <laughs> Step one says you're kippered. You're kippered when it comes to alcohol. You're kippered when it comes to everything else. Look around your home group. Look at Susan and Clive and Bobby and and Albert. Well, they used to be kippered and now they're not. If you do if you do what they did, you'll get what they got, which is they were unkippered by the program. So look, they're sober and they're having a nice time. Do you want to be sober? Yes. Do you want to have a nice time? Yes. Well, you do what Susan, Clive, and Bobby did. And that's basically all that um, step two boils down to in essence. It completely bypasses all of that sort of nonsense about the, the higher power. And all you need, uh, my first step two was very much like that. Uh, all Doug said to me was, uh, the only thing you need to know about the higher power is you're not it. 
which means you submit to the process and everything else takes care of itself. What am I praying to? You don't need to know. You just need to do it. What's prayer? You say the words and mean them. God, please help me do this. And then you'll get given direction. You'll get given strength. How do you know you get given direction? A useful thought comes into your mind, like call your sponsor, go to work, go to a meeting, keep your mouth shut, you know, useful things like that. Direction does not come in the form of a fax from God Say, hey, this is from God. It comes in the form of inspiration, intuitive thought or a decision. It looks like your own thinking, but if, if you... Uh, if you look at the clothes label on it, you will actually discover that it's, it, you know, it's, it's coming from a higher place. So that's the that's the quickest way around. And if someone is not really taking on board much information, um, then that's a really good way of doing it. Don't be um, wrong footed by sponsees who are sober for several decades or have postgraduate degrees, or other signs of external, you know, worldly competence. Um, some people scrub up really, really well, but in practice, uh, they can no, no, no more take on board information than a completely rattled newcomer who's two days off the drink. Um, if someone is very unwell, they're very unwell, and that affects everything. So sometimes this shortest way around, you'd think it would be reserved for the people who are still basically coming off DTs. Sometimes you have to reserve it for the people who are, as my friend Tom says, educated beyond their intelligence level. And as Don Pritz said to Joe Hawke, um, you know enough about recovery to kill yourself and others. Uh, too much information can be as much of a problem as too little. So that's why the, the, the short way round is super helpful. Now, a slightly longer way round. This is so this is the, that was the shortest way round. I'm going to do the short way round now, which is um, which, which basically covers the ideas in we agnostics, but in a broken down form and without all the long words, without the prosaic steel girders. Um, and other choice quotations. Um, so this is how, if I have to present step two um, uh, in a little more depth, but without going through the chapter, this is how I'll do it. My mind is broken. It sometimes wants to drink. Drinking is a bad idea. If I obey my mind, I'm in trouble, so I need to obey something else. Let's call that thing God. Um, and that's where you bring other people in. You know, is, it, is that going to work? Well, Sue does what her higher power wants, and Sue's sober. Clive does what his higher power wants, and he's sober. Um, and this is where you bring in other, other people's experience. Um, you say, have you heard, you know, these people share at the home group and you know the sponsor says yes and do you agree that sue and bobby and everyone else were completely powerless over alcohol when they were drinking they had no choice but to drink and when they drank they had no choice but to drink buckets yeah yeah the, that's definitely the case D the way you drink is it like the way they drink yeah 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 i drink like them i drink like them OK, so we just established you are like Sue and Clive and Bobby and Albert. Great. We've established that you've got the same condition. Are they sober now? I think so. No, no, no. We can't be mushy about this. Are they sober? Yeah, they're sober now. So they have acquired power that they didn't have. And that's what a higher power means. It's a power greater than your best efforts. So they've acquired, they've got a higher power. Now, don't worry about God. They've got a higher power. They've got a power. They, they've got access to a power they didn't have access to before. Now, this power. Let's see. Let's put you in the ring with this power. Can you keep Susan and Bobby and Albert and Clive sober? No. Well, in that case, that power is more powerful than you are. It can keep them sober. 
you can't keep Sue sober, but it can keep Sue sober. Therefore, it's not just a power greater than them, it's a power greater than you. And you've just tricked the person into admitting that there is a power greater than themselves in admitting that there is a power greater than Sue and that they are not greater than the power greater than Sue. That power is greater than them. You don't have to invoke any arguments about the higher power being a doorknob or um, the number nine bus. My friend Melody had whales as her higher power. We thought genuinely that it was the principality just to the west of England, and it wasn't. It was actually the the, the, the aquatic mammal, the whale. She she liked she just had tapes of whale music or something, and I think there's a lot in that. But anyway, um, uh, th what's the point? The point is you don't have to define what the power is. You have to look at the effect of the power. Like you can't see the wind, but you can see the effect of the wind on leaves on trees. And that's the bit that's relevant. So when people try to get all, all sort of scientific, well, I'm scientific, so I can't believe in God. Well, if you're really scientific, what, whatever, God is whatever is keeping them sober. That's the scientific approach. Something is keeping them sober. God is that which is keeping them sober. Tom tells a very good story about a woman who couldn't get her handle on the higher power. So uh, she stayed sober. She went to her meeting. She got a sponsor. She did some steps. And at the end of the year, she was hoovering. End of her first year, she was hoovering. And she was hoovering around this green chair in her living room. And that green chair was the green chair she sat in to drink. She drank in that chair for years, watching the television. Uh, and she realised in the year she'd been sober, she'd not sat in the green chair. And so she concluded, my higher power is that which keeps me out of the green chair. It needn't be any fancier than that. The higher power is what keeps me out of the green chair. Um, and then you universalize it. You say, what? well, if this power can keep everyone else sober, you have to presume it's going to work for everyone. If 10 people switch a kettle on and it boils, if you switch the kettle on, do you think it's going to boil? Or do you think the kettle is going to respond differently to you switching it on? Because you've got like special magic fingers or something. No, you have to presume it's going to work for everyone and prove otherwise rather. Oh, I don't know if it'll work for me. Logic would say, no, if it works for a gazillion people, it'll work for a gazillion plus one. And that's enough to get someone through um, step two without having to touch the chapter we agnostics. I'm going to run through we agnostics um with some quotations on what i do with them um so first of all it it defines this is on page 44 it defines alcoholism it says if when you honestly want to you find you cannot quit entirely or if when drinking you have little control over the amount you take you're probably alcoholic if that be the case you may be suffering from an illness which only a spiritual experience will conquer and the conclusion there is you and i O sponsee and I have a problem with no solution within ourselves. How do we know? Well, we've done step one. We've established that we can't stay sober on our own. Next bit. Uh, uh, to be doomed to an alcoholic death or to live life on a spiritual basis are not always easy alternatives to face. Uh, now, what the book is saying here is there are two options. You either basically die of alcoholism or die without die with our active alcoholism or you throw yourself fully into the program now this is an important point here which is there is no third way a lot of people think they can mess around for months or years safely by doing like you know 47 percent of what aa has to offer and somehow remain safe but that's just not true so you've got to get clear those are the only two the only safe option other than alcoholic drinking is full throttle AA. Next 
passage. There's a passage which starts off, if a mere code of morals or a better philosophy of life were sufficient to overcome alcoholism, many of us would have recovered long ago. And then it goes on. The point of that paragraph that I make is, so we've got a problem, we've got a solution. Um, the problem is not lack of information. You've got the information that a drink is a, is a really, really bad idea and that you can never drink safely. But that information is not enough to keep you sober. If that were enough to keep you sober, we'd all only need one AA meeting ever and then we'd be fixed. Um, if information, if lack of information is not the problem, what is the what is the problem? And then the book tells us that this chapter is actually very well structured, but it can take a bit of work to pull the structure out of it. So the next quotation is a passage which starts lack of power. That was our dilemma. So if so information is necessary, but you need power. And the image that I use with this is. If you want to make a soup, it's no good tipping the ingredients into a saucepan. You need heat to cook the ingredients. So that's like information and power. And so the, the information doesn't actually really do anything without the power behind it. What is power? The ability to implement an idea. Let's say the idea is, I wouldn't bother worrying about that. If you can't do anything about it, there's no point in worrying about it. That information is not enough to get rid of all of your anxiety forever. You now have all the information you need to stop worrying for the rest of your life. But you'll probably discover you need a little bit of power to actually implement that. Um, so we've decided we've got a problem. Uh, we don't have a solution. The problem is not lack of information. The problem is lack of power. This at this point. Um, the sponsee says, but I don't believe in God or I don't like God or I'm a recovering Catholic or just, you know, the usual the usual things. Um, the book's argument at this point is very clever. It says um, it's a matter of willingness. So it sidesteps all of the arguments. And so we have to understand what is what is willingness. It's the it's willingness is the state of mind which immediately precedes action. So if you're willing, what you have to be willing to do is to give this experiment a go, which means to act as if there is a higher power that can keep you sober and you take the action first. And that will convince you in a way that no argument can. There's a little trick I get from A Course in Miracles to help someone that's super resistant. Um, and it goes like this. Stage one. Uh, this is when I'm resistant. This is what I do. I don't like how I feel now. Now, I may still be super resistant to an actual solution, but I, at least I can admit how I feel right now sucks. Great. Next, so that's point number one. I don't like how I feel now. Point number two, so I hope I've been wrong. I hope I'm wrong. If I'm not wrong, I'm really kippered because I'm going to be unhappy forever. So I hope I've been wrong. What flows from that is number three. So I don't like how I feel, number one. Number two, I hope I've been wrong. Number three, I would like a different way to look at this. It doesn't say that there is one. But if I hope I've been wrong, just the notion I might be wrong implies, well, there is a right. So I hope there is a different way to look at this. Four, maybe there is a different way to look at this. I go from hope to speculation. Maybe there is a different way of looking at this. Fifth, what can I lose by asking? So I don't like how I feel now. I hope I've been wrong. I would like a different way to look at this. Maybe there is a different way to look at this. What can I lose by asking? And that can just crack the door open um the next point so uh it's hard to proceed with willingness with the action without any notion of a higher power so this is where the book says much to our relief we discover we didn't need to consider another's conception of god now that's a very clever line because what that means is whatever 
god you decide you don't believe in maybe you know some version of the god you think you were taught about as a child or whatever or what some what society is telling you god is you can totally disregard that you don't need to argue against those conceptions of god you can just throw them out and then you start with a blank piece of paper so my higher power is whatever is keeping my sponsor sober Let's start with that. Whatever is keeping people in my home group sober, whatever power of goodness flows through the universe. I mean, there are a hundred ways of doing it. But you start with a blank sheet or you rip up everything you think you know and start with a blank sheet of paper and go with one idea that you can work with. And there, as I said, there are lots of different ideas. And at the very least, I don't think it's a good idea to have a person as a higher power, even a dead person or indeed the AA group, and he's mu- because the thing is you don't have access to the AA group 24 hours a day, but you, d- you do have access, whatever is keeping the people in your home group sober, how about have that? And then you, you've, it's a, just a very subtle distinction, but then you've got something that you can rely on 24 hours a day. Um, the next question in the big book, again, I think this is very clever. It says, do I now believe or am I even willing to believe that there is a power greater than myself? Note, it doesn't ask you to believe in. It asks you to believe that there is one. Like you can believe that the Conservative Party exists without believing in the Conservative Party. These are two entirely different questions. So is there a power greater than myself uh, is simply answered. Well. There is a power keeping other people sober and that power is doing something I couldn't do to those people. I can't keep them sober, but it's keeping them sober. So it's more powerful than me. So you've now demonstrated that there is a power greater than yourself. And that's how the chapter breaks down. It separates out the question of is there a power from could that power help me? Uh, Next, there's a whole passage about. Uh, being handicapped by obstinacy, sensitiveness, and unreasoning prejudice. And it's a long passage. I'm not going to read out all of these passages, but I'm doing them in order. Um, Basically, what the book is saying is alcohol is a great persuader, which means you don't have to persuade them. Often it will require a slip or seven slips before someone is willing to basically discard everything they think they know and just try it on a new idea for sight. Uh, the next difficult bit, uh, or the next part of this process, is uh, uh, why should we uh, believe uh, that this power exists? Um, And it it gives the example, it's what we've already talked about, the other people in AA. And there's a whole long passage about this. Um, What does it say? Um, Here are thousands of men and women, worldly indeed. They flatly declare that since they have come to believe in a power greater than themselves, to take a certain attitude towards that power and to do certain simple things, there has been a revolutionary change in their way of living and thinking so you take the example of people in AA as demonstration that there is a power um there's next in the book there's this appeal to open-mindedness and it talks about and it's a very long section but about how open-minded people are about new ideas with technology and if you're if an old piece of technology doesn't work then how ready people are to try a new piece of technology in the hope that it's going to work better. And then it says, well, look how messed up you are, the bedevilment section. And 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 there's a line which is very misunderstood. Was not a basic solution of these bedevilments more important than whether we should see newsreels of lunar flight? Of course it was. Now, this is just... It's very rarely talked about that line, but I think what it's saying is, look, if you're willing to be super open minded about the new Bluetooth headset and you're willing to pay 30 quid for a new type of headset you've never tried before, which may fail because you hope that your phone calls will be clearer when you buy it. 
that you've got the capacity for open mindedness. This is a matter far more important than your Bluetooth headset. So how about you show the same open mindedness with spiritual matters that you're that you show with material things? That's what that passage is about. Um, and there's a little summary line where, which basically pulls together everything we've done so far on the chapter. And it says, when we saw others solve their problems by simple reliance upon the spirit of the universe. So Sue's in a good mood this week after she's been praying. Uh, we had to stop doubting the power of God. Our ideas did not work. In other words, you're jiggered. Um, but the God idea did. Look, Sue's in a good mood. Sue's doing better than you. She believes in God. Um, next, it talks about the role of logic. And I think this is important. People sometimes think in step two that they're being asked to believe something or do something which runs against logic. And the book is saying the absolute opposite. And it's completely reasonable to think that if a gazillion people take certain actions and their lives are transformed, that it will work for you too. That doesn't require some leap of faith. That requires accurate observation and trusting people's stories about what happened to them. Um, but there's one um, element where faith is required. And it's this, it's, it, and this is the difficult shift. Uh, you can speculate that what works for Susie and Bobby will work for me. I can speculate that, but I can't prove it in advance because I haven't, if I haven't taken the action yet, it's unproven. And faith is the courage to take the actions based on that logic and speculation. So again, it's like uh, if you uh, jumping off a diving board, a hundred people jump off a diving board into a pool below and they're all fine. Now, you stand on the diving board and it looks rather different. Um, I don't like water very much. Um, I don't like my head going underwater and I don't like heights. This is because I'm a coward. Very happy to admit that. Um, and I'm weak minded. Um, now, there's no there's no absolute guarantee that you're going to be OK. Even if a thousand people jump off the diving board there's no guarantee that you're going to be okay but it's a reasonable assumption it uses that phrase in the chapter a reasonable assumption faith is jumping off the diving diving board it's taking the action based on the on the logic the speculation the reasonable assumption um so the the logic will get you 99 percent of the word way there but you need that tiny leap of faith which is the faith to take the action it also talks about the universality of the higher power either god is or he isn't either there is a power which affects people's lives or there is not uh, either there is a people are getting sober randomly or there is some system involved if there is a system involved it's a universal system you go to any group for long enough and you'll see people of different intelligence levels, different education levels, different people who are smart in different ways. There are lots of different ways of being smart. Everyone's smart in a different way. And it, it, it's not like the program only works for one type of person. If you listen carefully, you'll hear all sorts of different people getting it. You'll hear people you don't like very much getting sober and getting well. You'll hear people you disagree with on everything getting sober and the people you agree with on everything getting sober so it's universal god is either everything or god is nothing it talks about then the book talks about the capacity for faith uh, so if faith is uh, being willing to take an action despite there being no guarantees uh, i look at the faith it it asks you to look at the faith in your own reason and if you've ever um well, if you're like me, you've made lots of mistakes in your life based on your own assessment of situations. Yet, do you not go to your own mind for answers again and again and again, even though your mind has failed you before? So the ability to put faith in something, to take, to take an action, to take a step without a guarantee of success, 
um, uh, you know, uh, as a drinker, certainly towards the end, it was like Russian roulette. Sometimes it was great. Sometimes it was ghastly. But I had the faith to take the action of having the first drink, trusting that it might be OK this time. That is faith. So you can pretty much demonstrate um, if you manage to carry on drinking in the face in the face of uh, um, the dwindling pleasure of it, the increasing side effects, then you have the capacity for faith. This is simply pointing an existing faculty, this capacity for faith in a new direction, which is at the program. See, this is what you want to demonstrate to people that you already have the capacity for faith. You just need to point it in the direction of AA. And then it, um, it now it talks about the inherent nature of God consciousness. It says uh, deep down in every man, woman and child is the fundamental idea of God. Um, some people will connect to that. Honestly, a lot of people won't. And if you if they don't connect to the idea of God being deep down inside them, then you, you can't you can't argue it. There are lots of there, there are lots of passages in this chapter that I have to I skip over quite lightly because they just don't work for a lot of people. There are um, bits of step one. There are certainly bits, you know, all of step three through to twelve. I, I wouldn't take the risk of arguing with any of it. There's lots of what's in this chapter. And this is important, I think. So if people rebel against lots of bits of this chapter, let them. It's fine. If they rebel against step three or step four, there's not a lot you can do because you're 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 fooling with essential parts of the engine. With step two, if you can get them through the chat, great. If they hate the chapter, I hated the chapter for the first 15 years of being sober. So I have sympathy for people that hate the chapter. I got around it another way, which is why I gave you the two the two other methods at the beginning. Um, uh, at the end of the chapter, there's a little summary, and this covers the whole of the chapter, really. Uh, circumstances made him willing to believe. He humbly offered himself to his maker. Then he knew. So that's the order in which this takes place. The reason I'm willing to throw myself at the mercy of a power grace for myself is because I literally have no other choice. And then you take the action. And when you take the action, you discover that uh, it works and here's there's a great promise when we drew near to him he disclosed himself to us and uh, I started praying in around August 1993 because I literally had no other choice um, I kept wanting to drink and for a few months in AA people and meetings were sufficient to talk me out of it. By the time we got to August 1993, I was finally a month sober. Everyone's arguments failed. Like whatever it was inside me had grown to such an extent that it was impervious to the arguments of other people, even the great grandees of my home group, uh, and certainly impervious to the meetings themselves. And so I needed to, pr I tried prayer as I literally had no other, there was no other card to play. And I prayed and the damn thing worked. The desire to drink at that moment just left me. Um, the, it wasn't even a prayer for sobriety. I opened the Bible and there was a line, be still and know that I am God. Um, now, I'm lucky because it could have opened at a page about the smiting of the Amalekites or some Paul talking about how long people's hair should be. But no, it opened on the page about be still and know that I'm God. But it did. I, I think honestly, it wouldn't have mattered where it opened. Uh, the fact I took the action, I opened the book and read the line. And that was enough to open the channel and something in me clicked. And I thought, I don't need to drink. Damn, that means I never need to drink again. I now have something that can be relied on. Damn, I'm going to have to be sober now. I was really disappointed and relieved at the same time. So circumstances made me willing to believe. I humbly offered myself to the higher power and then something happened. And it says he knew. 
knowledge is something which you can't argue with perception you can but knowledge is deeper and that's the point people start to take action and they have knowledge which can't be dislodged by arguments all the arguments they've had for decades that are thrown out of window then so anyway that's everything i know about everything so i'm gonna stop there and uh alice did you want to field field some questions uh thanks thanks a lot tim um yeah, the meeting is now open for questions for Tim, which can be done by the raised hand function in Zoom, or you can message me through the chat function and I will ask Tim directly, or I will send you the message, Tim, is save me asking the question, then you having to repeat it for the tape. Um, or if all else fails, just wave violently at the uh, camera and I will, <laughs> I will try and get to you. And that, I'll uh, open it up for questions. Uh, John, you waving? Yep. Yeah, I've got a question at the risk of sounding really dumb. <laughs> so in the book, where does step two start? At we agnostics or just before it? Okay, so the question, as I said earlier, I'm going to be repeating the questions Ooh. for the sake of the, the backup tape. So where does step two start? It's not a dumb question because the 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 table of contents in the book are uh, does not reveal where each of the steps are. I don't know if that's on purpose to make you read it so that you can't like skip to a particular step, but it's, um, so at the beginning, it doesn't say where step one starts, um, but it does say, oh, well, this is step one. Like in the middle of step one, it says, this is the first step in recovery. Um, once you start getting to the higher steps, it says we're now at step three, we're now at step four, we're now at step five. Um, so we agnostics is basically your chapter for step two. Um, but I'd say uh, the, this is the reason why it's not a silly question at all. The first paragraph of we agnostics is actually uh, the summing up of step one. So step one leaks over into the first paragraph of we agnostics, and then that forms the basis for step two. Um, uh, and then also that itself leaks over into um uh so between page 58 and 60 there's like a little pause where it, it sums up where we've been and tells us where we're going and it re basically it checks one more time are you sure you've got step two so there's some step two stuff um between page 58 and 60 as well but you can I kind of cover that once I get there. So maybe if, if this happens next week, I'll be covering the beginning of um, how it works and then all the way through to, to step three. What people might want to consider are situations with sponsees in the past where things have got really complicated or sticky in step two. Because that might form the basis for good, good questions. Another question, Tim. <laughs> so, do, based on what you just said there, so you know, you know, like how it works and the actor and all that, because that's all written before it says we were now at step three, doesn't it? But that would be step three. That's just explaining about it, is it? Well, I okay. So, a little question about the what, how does the actor stuff fit in? Um, one one of our difficulties with the steps is. The steps on the wall uh, or on page 59 or on the wall scrolls that we hang up in meetings don't fully match what's in the book. So like step 10 on the wall, we continue to take personal inventory. It looks like we keep doing step fours on, on things. And then you look at the instructions in the book and it's about maintaining awareness throughout the day. It's like completely not what you'd expect. And step three is actually like that as well. So there are... Um, by the time you get to the ABCs, um, let me just get the book down. I don't have the book memorized. You need to know that. Uh, Saskia always says, um, I'm so glad they wrote this down. And I think she's right. Uh, so it says on page 60 that three personal ideas that we were alcoholic and could not manage our own lives, that probably no human power could have relieved our alcoholism, that God could and would if he was sought. Now, at this point, your sponsee is supposed to be like totally up 
for turning their will and life over to God, you'd think that the next thing in the book would be, right, though, this is how you take step three. And say, ah, 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 wait a minute. If you're going to be turning your will and your life over to a power greater than yourself, um, like you're down with the idea that with regard to alcohol, that's a really good idea. But the sponsee may not yet be totally sold on the idea that everything else is a little bit of a problem as well. So in like in the AA fellowship, the fact that everything else is a mess is brought into step one. So, so people try and squeeze all of that stuff into the unmanageability in step one. The big book doesn't say anything about that. Um, it hints at it in we agnostics and then it goes full force in step three on since you're already going to be turning your will and life over to god wouldn't it wouldn't it just be easier for everyone if you were down with the idea if you didn't have any like emotional resistance to it so you then that's when you've got the two pages on the actor hopefully to persuade someone to take step three on the basis that um uh, it's it's good for them as well. It's not just for the drink. It, it will improve everything else as well. So it's not, these are good questions because it, the book isn't terribly straightforward with these early steps. It kind of jumps back and forth. Okay. And things are not in the place you expect them to be either. Mm -hmm. All right, thanks. What we could do, Alistair, uh, is if we've got, uh, oh, we've got a question from Claire. Thank you. Thanks, Tim. That's fantastic. Um, and this, there are so many questions about step two, but one thing that comes to mind is uh, in the past, I've made the mistake of, of getting a little bit muddled about, about when I see a new person and so they, they get sober and then, and then they have the new boyfriend, the new job, the dramatic change of appearance um, and, and, you know, doing a lot of fellowship I've made the mistake of believing oh, uh, these these things in the material world ha have become the higher power for the individual, and it's, it's all that they're doing. And and I think at, at what point? So so if I have a, a sponsee, at what point do you just just leave that alone and allow it, um, and 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 not judge too quickly that in the place of a higher power, you're choosing the boyfriend, you're choosing the job, because. Um, it seems that when when there's a the shift away from alcohol, the energy is invested then into into the things around them, and and I sometimes feel like it's a bit quick quick for me to say don't stop doing that or, or try to look at that. Does does that make sense it, as a question? <laughs> yeah. So I think what this speaks to is how you um, sponsor, how you can help people, and thereby yourself. You know. Uh, so whenever I'm helping someone else, it, it's only ever really to it, it helps me as much as it helps them. So whatever I need to say to someone else or I feel I need to say to someone else is what my higher power wants me to be saying to me. Um, this is the, the question of um, step two with the rest of your life, like later on in recovery or people who are two, five, 10, 15, 20, 30, 30 years sober. What does step two mean in those situations? Um, when you talk about making external things your higher power, a very good def a very good definition of pride is the putting of self in the place of God as the center or main objective of one's life. Now, uh, if you're focused on establishing a good romantic relationship and uh, maintaining a, a desirable household and pursuing a uh, uh, an impressive career this doesn't look as though you're engaged in self because it well it doesn't look as though it's about you it looks as though it's about external things but those external things are totally tied up in my identity my, my identity my value my purpose who I am what I'm worth and why I'm here and what step three is asking me to do is to have my uh who I am, child of God, whatever that means, my value stemming from that, 
So I'm of infinite value because I exist. And what is my purpose to be a channel for God to do whatever God wants to do through my life in the universe? As opposed to uh, those those things, those external things being the center and main objective of my life. Um, a very, might I say, vanishingly small percentage of AAs in my experience totally buy the idea uh, that the solution to alcoholism lies in complete abandonment of self. Um, uh, at least uh, the first time round, I think to stay permanently sober, the idea has got to be bought at some point. My experience, and frankly, the experience of most people, is that what, what you need to do, uh, this is the, the, your basic pattern. You get sober, you discover after a few uh, months, weeks, days, or minutes that just going to meetings is not enough. So you get a sponsor and you get the idea. It seems very clear that if you clear up your past and if you submit to the good orderly direction of AA and sensible people around you and you achieve emotional balance, you're frankly going to do a lot better in your relationship, in your household, in your job. Uh, so it's not that it's not true that those things will improve, but those are byproducts of the process. They're not the purpose of the process. Um, but that's very bewitching. As you, I'm sure if you go to meetings, I hear it as well. People say, God has been very good to me because, and then they list all of the external things they bought or achieved in the world. Um, a uh, friend of mine says, sometimes we say, if, if you have, if you want what we have, and then everyone looks out to the parking lot outside to see what cars people have got. Um, I think Bob D talks about this notion, if we have what you want. Well, my sponsor, he said, my sponsor looked at my wife and said, oh, I'll have that. And he did. Um, you know, <laughs> this, if you want what we have can be taken to a, a absurd extremes. So what happens is you work the program well and everything gets better and you think, aha, that's the point of it. And then you hear someone say that blessed phrase, a bridge to normal living. Uh, now, that's got to, if you want to know where that comes from, um, it comes from uh, an extraordinarily good pamphlet called A Member's Eye View of Alcoholics Anonymous. It was a transcript of notes for a talk done by an AA member at an external organization. And this, the image of a bridge to normal living is actually a very complex image, which can only be understood in the, con in the context of that pamphlet. It, and it's not really generally applicable. It's not a very tight metaphor. But the way it gets used by people is to say, well, of course, you know, the first few years of AA, you have to, um, you know, go to lots of meetings and do the steps, but really you don't want to turn AA into another crutch. And surely the whole point of AA is to get reintegrated back into society. So you need to, you know, uh, we we'll leave the little ones to do, to do the service. You know, I've done my stint. I don't need to do anymore. That's what most people do. And I'm not blaming them. I did it because it's what everyone is doing. A lot of people are doing. Then what happens somewhere between seven and 10 years, it's usually around there. Some people hit it early. Some people hit it later, but it's generally between seven and 10. You develop a tiny little problem with gambling or massage parlors or toxic relationships or sugar or exercise, or you discover yourself so high powered in your job that you're way out of your depth and you have no idea how to get out of it. And then everything collapses and people either drink and never come back, or they hopefully, if they catch it in time, there'll be the so-called second surrender when you really adopt the program as it's set out and you actually buy it uh, you do service rather than lip service, but it, it's just like the first the time you do step two. The first time you do step two is largely about drinking. Well, it's essentially about drinking. Uh, the second time you do it, uh, it's, a mu it's a much harder sell, actually, because you look around AA and e basically everyone is sober. I mean, some people, 
look kind of funky because of some medication they're on, but at least they're sober and they're not taking, you know, heroin or something. So, you know, there's a spectrum there, but basically people are sober. Whereas if you're eight years sober and you want to look around your room for your AA room for how many people around you are, let's say, over 10 years sober and don't need to be arrested this week. It's not that many people. There aren't that many examples of people who are doing super well, who are sober a long time. So step two, can God really? And also people's drinking problems look really similar. You know, I drink a bottle of vodka a day. So do I. So do I. As everyone echoes around the room, whereas people's problems at seven to ten years sober look weirdly specific. <laughs> uh, and so people look, they say, well, I, I don't know anyone that's overcome this particular problem in their intimate relationship with whoever. Or I don't know anyone that's been the finance director of a dot com. I, I your problems look super specific. And this is where if you're trying to get someone through that, you look at the common, the commonality of the seven areas of self pride. Are you consumed with pride? What other people think about you, self esteem, what you think about yourself, um, personal and sex relations, how other people treat you, ambitions, what you want, security, what you need, and pocketbooks your money are you obsessed with those things oh yes so it's not about the specific form that these are taking it's about the content which is yeah full of self as i was um and then you have you kind of have to introduce often you have to introduce people to other people you know from other groups on other other areas who've got through this and come out the other side scott peck whom i haven't read but apparently wrote a book called The Road Less Travelled. It's a great title. <laughs> and I understand people talk about, you know, the, the path being the road less travelled. I think that's your, your, you, that's your cell the second time round. Now, if you've got someone, to go specifically to your question, Claire, of if you've got someone who's like one, two, three years sober and all the focus is going on external things, um, you can try and tell people, but as Maureen once said to me, um, she said, trying to give people advice in AA or guidance that they haven't asked for, uh, or even when they ask for guidance, that's the weird thing. You'd think if people ask for guidance, they'd listen to it, but generally they either resist it or they agree with it so quickly that it bounces off and doesn't actually go in. And then that, like they're happy because they got a solution, but they've agreed with it so quickly that they haven't got a chance to implement it. And then, you know, three weeks later, same question. Uh, but she said, trying to give people advice or guidance, it's like shouting at a 14 year old who is skateboarding next to the edge of a cliff wearing headphones. It's a great image. If you want to find her, she goes to meetings in Rains Park. <laughs> good old, good old Maureen. Um, she's very, very funny. Uh, <laughs> She was the one, I hope I'm not out saying anything out of turn and saying this. Uh, I had a very tricky sponsee a number of years ago that took a I, I, that took objection to a lot of what I was offering. And she said, what you need to do is say to this individual, um, I don't think I'm the right person to sponsor you. And as you send her off into the night and walk away in the other direction, do not mutter under your breath. And I can't imagine who would be the right person. Um, you, if Maureen said, we should have a session called Maureen said, that could be a whole hour. Maureen said, if they want the solution, you can't say anything uh, uh, wrong. If they don't want it, you can't say anything right. So you can kind of, you're doing your job by saying, honey, you might want to watch that, like the 80 hour weeks and the Netflix binging and the like half a meeting. You might want to watch that, but they won't listen. So don't nag because it doesn't work and you haven't got time. What you can do, uh, 
you don't necessarily need to wait for them to get to seven to 10 years because although at seven to 10 years, the wheels come off, the wheels are going to start squeaking pretty soon. And what you can do if, if the if the basic text bit of the big book is not working, what you can do, the exercise is to get them to go through the pioneers stories at the back of the book. One a day and pull out every general. So those stories have got a problem section and a solution section like before I got to AA after I got to AA, you get them to pull out quote by quote each line which establishes a general principle of how AA works. And then to say, how can you apply this in your life? And people find that completely revelatory. There's a lot of stuff in there which deepens and humanizes and personalizes the very dry principles, say, between 60 and 62. So that's a very good exercise which can soften people up. Um, the other thing as well is if you, if they sponsor other people, they'll see their insanity reflected in other people. And that will that's the only thing which keeps me sane. It's not like fancy Course in Miracles stuff, although I do do that as well. It's um, having like a gazillion sponsee calls a day and thinking, oh, my God, this person's completely mad and just like me. And then the next one, oh my God, this one's completely mad and just like me. Um, you know, it's not they're completely mad and I'm sensational. It's complete. It, they show me what is wrong with me and I go, uh oh, I'm in trouble. So um, I think that's, that's, how, that's the only way you can help people. But if people are on the way out, you can't stop them. So don't feel guilty or responsible for that. You, you put out the little little saucer of water for the hedgehog but you don't stand over trying to force the hedgehog to drink it because it doesn't work and that's all i've got on that on that thanks tim um alistair alcoholic can i uh, jump in with a question if, uh, um uh you're working with a sponsor you work through step one uh, you've worked step two you're getting to that point of um of how it works and getting into step three and relapse occurs. Um, they may or may not have fixed ideas. Invariably they do have pretty fixed ideas about uh, what their higher power is. They come back and say, Oh, I've relapsed, but um, you know, I, I, you know, I think my step two is in place. You know, I have my higher power, et cetera, et cetera, but I've relapsed. What do you do? What do you do in that situation? Okay, so maybe relapse might be a whole session, like how you deal with relapsing sponsees. Could we, but the short answer is this. Um, I think it always, I don't think it really, it very, very rarely boils down to step two or step three relapse. It almost always boils down to step one. It's basically, um, the, there's going to be a reservation about some aspect of alcoholism. So maybe the person isn't done drinking. There's still part of them that genuinely buys the idea that a drinking life would be better. Um, so th there can be reservations. So that's like a step zero thing. Are you really done? Uh, then you can have, a, the, people can have a reservation about the physical craving. So maybe there is a way of controlling the amount they can have a reservation about the mental obsession, which is um, now I've got the information. That's enough to keep me sober. I don't need a spiritual awakening. My mind isn't fundamentally broken. It's fundamentally sound. I've just put the missing jigsaw puzzle piece in and now I'm fine. Um, even if people believe that they're, they're, they're doomed by their alcoholic mind to drink and once they drink, they're doomed to drink buckets. A lot of people will calculate the cost of a slip and conclude that it's somehow worth it because if it gets bad enough I can come back but that's a fallacy just because you've come back a dozen times doesn't mean the next time is going to be different because when Doc Dr Jekyll turns into Mr Hyde Mr Hyde doesn't turn back into Dr Jekyll as an act of the will just the potion wears off it, uh, Mr Hyde does not want to become Dr Jekyll again and one day the potion ain't going to wear off. 
So that's why there's no such thing as a safe slip. 19 out of 20 cases, I think, with sponsees who slip, it's because there's a reservation. They think they can get away with a bit more drinking before they buckle down. Once you know your, that if you really believe that your mind is so nuts, it could induce you to have a drink and that you might literally never come back and suffer horrible pain for the next 30 or 40 years. If you, um, if you genuinely believe that, then step two stops being a problem and step three stops being a problem. I think it's all down to, it's all down to step one. It's, that's the short answer, although there are, there's lots of vari there are lots of variations on that theme. Hi. Thanks, Tim. Thanks, everybody. Um, I don't know if you can answer this in short, but how do I get to a place where I really, really believe that God is everything or God is nothing? It's like, and nothing in between? I, 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 so the question is, how do you get to a point where you believe that God is everything, not nothing, and that there's nothing in between? Um, the question is very abstract, so it needs to be made concrete to be answered. Um, Chuck Chamberlain does this very well in A New Pair of Glasses, which is available if you can't find it from which is a website where they sell AA stuff. I think it's called something like that. If you look it up on there, you're about to get it for like $5 or something, plus like $47 postage to whatever country you live in. Um, what he says in there is, if I have one problem that can't be solved, then I might as well just jump off a bridge now. If there is one problem that can't be solved or accepted, it's going to sit there like a pain inside me for the rest of my life. Um, so I would make it very concrete. So believing that God is everything means that there is no problem which cannot be solved practically or accepted cheerfully and gracefully. So there are some things I've got a couple of physical things wrong with me which can't be fixed. And I've I've accepted them and I shouldn't be able to, but I have. Uh, and so that's that's how you do it. You look at the practical level. Why do I think God can't? provide me with a practical or spiritual solution to this and it's very hard to argue against the universality of god then because if you go to enough meetings you'll find someone who's had that problem or i mean especially if you go to old timers meetings you'll you'll see every year a number of people who are sober 20 30 40 years who have cancer and sometimes die of cancer and remain full of grace throughout the whole thing it's like you know what is commonly cited as like the worst thing that can happen is something you see people living through or the death of, of, of close relatives, which is something I, I've lived through as well. So I think that's the art. That's how I come at that question myself. Uh, to set the tone for this meeting, I will read an extract from chapter eight to wives uh, from page 120. Uh, we never Never try to arrange a man's life so as to shield him from temptation. The slightest disposition on your part to guide his appointments or his affairs so he will not be tempted will be noticed. Make him feel absolutely free to come and go as he likes. This is important. If he gets drunk, don't blame yourself. God has either removed your husband's liquor problem or he has not. If not, it had better be found out right away. Then you and your husband can get right down to fundamentals. If a repetition is to be prevented, place the problem, along with everything else, in God's hands. And the topic of tonight's meeting is working step three with a sponsee. And Tim will share for anything between 30 and 45 minutes on the topic. After which, the floor will be opened for questions rather than the normal sharing. And with that, I will now hand over to Tim. Thanks, my name's Tim. I'm an alcoholic. So there's a little bit of, I shouldn't really call it filler, but there's a bit of filler between the end of step two and the start of step three. Um, I, I think the book often does this. It sort of recaps where we've got to just to make sure that we're all on the same page before it goes any further. And there's quite a lot of this stuff, actually, between 58 and 60 that I want to make sure that little sponsees understood 
some uh, really basic points. One of the points that comes through loud and clear in these two pages is it's a package deal. You have to do the whole thing. You have to do it thoroughly and you have to do it promptly. So those three things, it has to be complete, it has to be prompt and it has to be thorough. Um, and there are some things which people miss sometimes. So let's put together some different lines. Rarely have we seen a person fail who has thoroughly followed our path. Um, and it's going to say further down, we beg of you to be fearless and thorough from the very start. Um, it says, where does it say about half measures? It says about half measures somewhere. Half measures availed us nothing. There we go. Half measures availed us nothing. We stood at the turning point. So that's all pretty unequivocal. And then, you know what people often say back to you? They say, yeah, but it's progress, not perfection. And now it's absolutely right. But um, my understanding of this is that what I shoot for is to do everything as well as possible. That, but even when I shoot for doing everything as well as possible, it doesn't mean that the result is going to be perfect. Um, what I find dangerous is to discount at the level of the effort, because then you're, you're doubly shooting yourself in the foot. We shoot, if I don't make full effort, I'm, let's say, coming down from 100% to 80%, and then because I'm not a saint, I'll get 60% results, and I'm starting to get into a danger territory there. So you, you aim, for, aim for perfection, um, but recognize that even if you do everything right, you're still going to be messy in all sorts of material ways. The a couple of other points that people always pick up on when I get them to read this, or usually pick up on, um, there are usually questions about these people who cannot give themselves to this simple program, usually men and women who are constitutionally incapable of being honest with themselves. And so people ask about that and they ask about uh and then, the, the, well, I mean, it further elaborates. They're naturally incapable of grasping and developing a manner of living which demands rigorous honesty. And it then talks about the people with grave emotional and mental disorders. And I've thought a lot about this. He doesn't, Bill doesn't elaborate about what this means. Um, and I, I honestly, I do find people in AA, even the ones who are, who are, perennial slippers i've sponsored a number of perennial slippers over the years i found them generally honest in terms of um uh, admitting what they're doing people are quite good in AA, i think about being candid so i you know i've wondered over the years what this means when something doesn't work now i look at my own experience and this is what i share with sponsees is that uh the, I think the honesty that I needed to get sober and then the honesty I needed to get over some of the problems that I had was the honesty. Number one, I have a problem. And number two, I don't have a solution. Now, that sounds pretty obvious, except have you ever been talking to someone? You say, have you got a problem? They say, oh, yes, I've got a terrible problem with drinking or with their career or their relationship. And I say, have you got a solution? Say, no, I don't have a solution. And then you say, would you like a solution? They say, oh, I'd love a solution. And then you say, right, a solution is this. And you tell them the solution. And then they say, oh, I don't like that at all. <laughs> and so, you know, about 18 seconds after saying I have a problem and I have no solution, suddenly you see that there's this holding on to the, the the safety blanket, and the safety blanket is it, it's like playing the Joker, um, and the Joker is whatever you throw at me, I reserve the right to override you. If I don't like your idea, well, f you then. <laughs> and that kept me trapped. Uh, I was in sort of work horrors for years, and. It looked like I wanted a solution, but what I couldn't be honest about was the fact that my thinking was inadequate to the problem, and therefore I was to pay no further attention to my thinking. That's the bit that I wouldn't admit. Even though I was in the most terrible mess, I mean, w this is true with the drinking, but it was true later on with the work stuff in particular and with the relationship stuff. 
Um, uh, I, what I couldn't admit was that my opinion and view was irrelevant, that it meant nothing, that my assessment and analysis of the situation were useless. Uh, uh, they were useless with the drinking. They were useless with this. And I think that that's the honesty that's required. And there's a sandy, wonderful Sandy Beach story about this, where he's talking about something to his sponsor, and he says to the sponsor, um, you might be right. And the sponsor says, you mean to say you're wrong? And Sandy says, no, 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 I, I think you might be right. And the sponsor says, I want you to hear, I want to hear you say I am wrong. <laughs> and he almost couldn't say it. He could admit the sponsor was right, but he couldn't admit he was wrong. Um, and... I think that's the that's the key point here. Uh, it's that honesty which opens all of the doors. And without that, I don't think anything can be achieved. I think I mentioned in a previous week with the chronic slippers, one of the, the, the uh, with alcohol, one of the continual refrains is, but my head keeps telling me. Uh, now, w when, I've, when I'm in a good space, my head still tells me all the same things. I just don't believe those things. And that's the key difference, that, that those things cease to be relevant to me. Um, let's have a look. This is the, this is the other line which I, I always talk a lot about uh, to people. Some of us have tried on to our, hold on to our old ideas and the result was nil until we let go absolutely. And that's really an echo of what I've already been saying, that I have to be willing to listen with an entirely open mind. Um, and uh, the habit I've got into with my sponsor, we have very strange phone calls sometimes where I say about eight words, then he speaks at me for about 20 minutes. I take notes and then I say, thank you very much. <laughs> and I think about it later. I don't react um, because I want I want to be applying this. I want to say, well, if I'm calling him about a situation, it's because I don't want any of my old ideas. If I'm if I'm unhappy, I must have decided wrong. So I don't want that decision anymore. Um, what else do I go through? So I run through the steps with them and we've already talked about the, um, we are not saints. So we claim spiritual progress rather than spiritual perfection. And the ABCs really sum up everything we've done so far that I'm going to die of alcoholism unless something significant happens that, uh, and no human power can relieve my alcoholism. It doesn't mean that there isn't human power used by God to help me. Um, and God could and would if he was sought. And at this point, I just double check that people are down with those ideas and people always, always are. Now, how down they are with those ideas, really, really, uh, uh, you, dis you discover that at the bottom of page 63 to see if the step four gets started or not. But that's another question. At this point, people are usually very willing. And I talked about this a bit last week, but I'm, I, I'll obviously go into it in, in proper detail now. Being convinced we were at step three, which is that we decided to turn our will and our life over to God as we understood him. Just what do we mean by that? And just what do we do? And it before it answers that question it goes on um uh one of bill w's wonderful digressions two-page digression which so it's just like with step four later on it's going to say we're going to do a moral inventory but before it does that it bangs on about resentment for three pages which has got nothing to do with our moral inventory it's there for a reason but it's not it's not what we think it is and it's a bit like that here we've already decided we're going to we're going to take step three and so the next two pages sets out a philosophical position, um, which means that when we're turning, if we've already decided we're going to turn, turn our wills and our lives over, the question is, how are we going to become really uh, comfortable with that idea? And the, the proposition here is, well, you running your life is a disaster, not just in relation to alcohol, but in relation to everything. So if you can see that, that you're a disaster in every other area too, that, that sweetens the pill. So hopefully 
when you turn your will and your life over to God, it isn't going to be a tug of war where you're still holding on to it. You're going to be get it off me, get it off me, because you're so done with you being in charge of your life. Um, now, these these two pages um, have got, some, as I say, some philosophical points, which I try and um, I try and convey to people. But honestly, most people don't buy them. There'll, there'll, there'll be some lip service usually, but people don't fully buy them. And I'll explain what I mean by that. The first requirement is that we be convinced that any life run on self-will can hardly be a success. And uh, it, it isn't immediately evident what that means, any life run on self-will. Um, my understanding of it is that uh, I organize my life based on what I want. And what do I want? Well, it's all the things which I think will make me happy. So the proposition here is, uh, if you live life based on what you want, uh, you'll, you won't be happy. It'll be a disaster. And it, it goes on to explain why. And it gives a little description here of what running the world around you starts to look like. Um, and the problem is, uh, and it says you might be nice doing it or you might be mean doing it, but the show doesn't come off very well. And so the basic idea is, if you go through life with a blueprint, you'll probably find that the world does not play ball. Uh, as Earl Purdy um, says, uh, if ever you're upset by something, it means you have a plan and the plan has been thwarted. If you're upset a lot, it means you have a lot of plans and the plans are being thwarted. So the reason I'm unhappy is not because of the world. It's because I'm going into the world with a plan. Um, and if you've got more than one person in the world, each of whom has their own plan the plans are going to conflict unless by some miracle all the plans happen to be exactly the same but because I'm over here I have my plan because you're over there you have your plan and here is the key line is he not a victim of the delusion that he can wrest happiness and satisfaction out of this world if he only manages well and that's like a um a sort of two-stage punch. So firstly, it's recognizing that, oh yeah, okay, so I'm operating on the basis that if only I function well, I, I'll be happy. And then the second part of which is worrying, then the second part of it is the fact it's a delusion. So I'm wrong in that. I'm wrong in that. Um, and the basic idea in these two pages is therefore this. So running life on, on self-will, in other words, based on what I want. First of all, it's almost impossible to um, get the world in its entirety to play ball. There will always be something which is problematical. But my own experience, and, and if you're sober a few years, you may well have experienced this as well. Uh, that you do the program, you do it very well. This gets rid of lots of your character defects. You discover yourself much more effective at work. You discover yourself more effective at home. People are suing you far less than they used to. Your relations generally are more cordial. And you think, well, this is all right. And then you wake up at five years or seven years or 10 years sober, having a panic attack in at four o'clock in the morning because your life is never going to be fixed and you don't know why because all of your ducks are in a row and they are quacking, but it hasn't fixed the underlying problem. So the point is that um, uh, it, it's almost worse. When you don't get your own way, you can still hold on to the delusion, if only I got my own way, everything will be all right. So you keep peddling in, or you, you're still, you're, you carry on being the hamster in the wheel. If only you can pedal fast enough or, or, or run fast enough in the wheel get the wheel to go fast enough you'll be all right but you can never get it to go fast enough on those rare occasions where you do manage to get exactly 
you know, it's like the dog that catches its tail. What does it do with the tail once it's caught it? There's nothing it can do with the tail. It is no further ahead. It's now tired and it has its own tail in its mouth. And I think this is a perfect image of most people somewhere between seven and 10 years sober when everything comes right at last. Not, it's not there's anything wrong with those things, but they don't fix the problem. They don't fix the thing they were supposed to fix. And if this is all, if this is the case, then there has to be, this is the great line which gave rise to A Course in Miracles. There must be a different way. Um, and the way I, I get people to try and see this, um, uh, if, if, you know, obviously through my experience and their experience, but you look at society and you look at, um, most people have read glossy magazines or, or the sort of gossip pages of the Daily Telegraph or something. Um, and it's pretty self-evident that just because you're rich, you won't be happy. Just because you're pretty, you won't be happy. Just because you're fated and lauded and loved does not mean you'll be happy. All the famous people who've committed suicide when their lives were absolutely gilded. Um, you walk around Kensington, you go to AA meetings in Kensington. Are people cheerful and relaxed there? No, but they've got everything that you think will make you happy. And it hasn't made them happy, but you still want it. So the whole, the idea is the whole system is insane. There must be a different system. People describe this as being the, um, the about alcoholics. And here's the interesting thing. It's not. This is why this isn't unmanageability, the second half of step one, because um, uh, our examples, our actor is self-centered, egocentric, as people like to call it nowadays. He is like the retired businessman who lolls in the Florida sunshine in the winter, complaining of the sad state of the nation. And there are, there are several other examples. So um, what is being described here is not alcoholics. It's describing human beings. So if you identify with this, you're not identifying with your, your alcoholism, you're identifying yourself as a human being. And the proposition, which is pretty radical in these two pages, is the entire world has got it wrong. That's the proposition here. Do you want to sign up to that before taking step three? Um, and it, it has an alcoholic as the last example, not the first. And then it goes in, and then this last little bit um, before we get on to the actual step three. Uh, what we're looking at here is um, what is going on inside uh, selfishness, self centeredness. So having yourself as the center of the universe, making endless lists of things you think will make you happy, running after them and trying to manipulate the universe into giving them to you. Now, as soon as you want something, you'll have fear. If you're self, if a person is self-centered, when I'm self-centered, I'm the center of the universe, it distorts the entire perspective. So if you're self-centered, you think that the sun is revolving around the earth rather than the other way around. It changes it that self-centeredness itself creates a massive delusion um i often talk to people who whenever they share in meetings the person that shares after after them they always think the person sharing after them is sharing about them or i don't know if you've ever had a situation where someone is very rude to you or unpleasant to you and you take it personally as though they were like pl placid and pleasant and lovely before you walked into the room and you are so powerful you can actually change their personalities and turn them into assholes no this person is 47 they've been an asshole for 47 years and then you walked into the room and then they were just themselves this has got nothing to do with you pumpkin um so, so self-centeredness gives rise to self-delusion and the more self-centered I am, the more fearful I am, um, the more distorted my perceptions are, yet the more right I think I am. The more upset I am, the more right I think I am, the more certain I am about everything. And the whole thing is corrupted. Um, 
sometimes they hurt us seemingly without provocation, but we invariably find that sometime in the past we've made decisions based on self, which later placed us in a position to be hurt. Now, this is tricky. I think this is true as an adult. Obviously, children are placed in situations um, uh, which they did not choose. Uh, and uh, sometimes uh, in, in, in societal situations where there are massive power imbalances, this can be the case as well. But I look at my own, all of the pe- most of the people on my step four, out of all the people I met, those were the ones that I chose to be in some kind of work relationship or romantic relationship with. I picked them. Even if they were assholes, I picked them. And so, so now this all sounds very rough to trust on someone but the way I explain it to people is if you're right and you're a victim and everyone else is wicked and you're just misunderstood I've got really bad news for you um you're going to carry on being mistreated for the rest of your life you're going to carry on being unhappy if however it turns out you are the prime mover in your own unhappiness uh, there's hope because you can change you so what would you rather what would you rather be would you be would you rather be the one that has the power in the situation to make different decisions and people usually buy that um so our troubles we think are basically of our own making and again uh, uh it's this idea that even if the situation is not my making my trouble for this statement to be true it has to be true under all circumstances uh, certainly as an adult carving out children as a separate question but as an adult even if there is a situation which i didn't give rise to um my trouble is my disturbance about it and the disturbance about it is coming from self-will is in other words is coming from wanting they talk i understand from my buddhist friends of whom i have very few um but they tell me that the problem is wanting that that's where all of the problems start. And that's another way of talking about self-will being at the root of the troubles. And we have to get rid of this. And uh, we aren't going to think our way out of it. Um, and we can't do it on our own. Uh, now, exactly what that means is difficult to explain. The way I put it is this. Um, Whilst I still think I have, I'm the one to figure everything out, for some reason, I block all possible solutions. As soon as I say I don't know and I'm willing to listen, I'm open to influences from the outside. And people often don't believe in God, which is fair enough. But the question is, can the individual trust other people on the basis that those other people are doing better than them? Um, so the idea here is it, the information isn't good enough. There needs to be a surrender, which, as I said, is a recognition that uh, I don't have the answers and I'm going to have to take action. This is the wonderful Clancy line, taking actions I don't believe in because the person who is suggesting them is doing better than me taking actions I don't believe in because the person who's suggesting them is doing better than me. Now we get on to the good bit. Um, And there's there's one last philosophical point, which I think is worth making. Uh, We decided we had to quit playing God. It didn't work. Next, we decided that hereafter in this drama of life, God was going to be our director. Now the point here, uh, the Indian Jesuit, um, Father Paul Coutinho uh, says that material reality is about 1% of the whole show. So this drama of life, um, what I've been encouraged to do is to consider it, the material world and everything that goes on it is like a play going on on a stage where in a particular scene, I'm playing a part. But in the same way that the actor is distinct from the part that they're playing. I am distinct from the role that I'm playing. And the role is just the role that I'm playing. My reality is unaffected by the part, by the character and what happens to the character. So the actor that plays Duncan or Macduff um, 
is not affected by anything that happens to Duncan or Macduff on the stage. Uh, you know, at the end of Mac but well, by the end of Macbeth, I hope I'm not spoiling anything here. There's a little bit of blood spattered around. Yet all the actors sit on the bus on the way back to Neasden, having a lovely old time together afterwards. They're fine. So this gives me an entirely different philosophical way to look at the world. I can look at it one stage removed and not be sucked into everything. I have to play each role diligently as though it's real. I have to inhabit the role. But I am safe, which changes everything. And I have a life and an existence outside the material plane, which changes everything. So we've got um, several different images here for the relationship between us and God. The first one is director and actor, um, which is a pretty straightforward image. The second one is principal and agent. Now, if you don't have a commercial background, that won't necessarily mean very much. But it's a very useful one. The um, uh, image that I convey with this is if you imagine a ship owner who's got these ocean going container ships and the uh, the ships call in at various different ports. And in each port, there is a shipping agent. So the ship owner is the principal uh, and the agent in each port has to attend to the business of dealing with the longshoremen and the customs authorities and the railway authorities and the bunkering the vessel and provisioning the vessel and all of the other things that you have to do when a ship comes into port but it ain't the agent's ship and it ain't the agent's cargo he's just got a job to do he and he's paid directly by the ship owner so it kind of doesn't matter what is going on he has to do his job well but his job is to do things well it doesn't matter to him personally what is going on with the ship with the cargo father and children um i don't have my experience of um parents and children is maybe not ideal so this i think this is so brilliant here this is so helpful for sponsees is you've got um, dire a director and actor, principal and agent, father and children, and then employer and employee. And most people can connect with one of those. They've got a positive experience, at least in principle, of one of those. And the employer-employee one is one that works for an awful lot of people. A lot of people can't deal with the idea of God being the father because they've got bad experiences of parents. Um, but they can they've had benevolent employers before where they just have to show up, ask the employer what to do, get on with it and they get given money and go home. Um, the actual taking of step three, uh, the first point is to uh, understand what the contract is and then to adopt that position and the position the, the contract is very simple. He provided what we needed if we kept close to him and performed his work well. So I need to do two things. Stay close to God in steps 10 and 11, perform his work well in step 12, and obviously do four through nine to place myself in that position. And those are the only two things I need to concern myself with is staying close to God and the next right action, staying close to God and the next right action. And that's the contract. And I adopt the position of God being the employer. In my case, it's the employer employee one that I connect with the most. I mentally adopt that position in the same way that when you get given a job offer and you mentally assent to it, the job is already yours. You're going to have to sign on the dotted line. But essentially, conceptually, you've already signed up to it. Um, the sign, the, the signing up to it, the actual Signing on the dotted line, I think, is saying the step three prayer. So you've got two things now. You adopt the position mentally. Um, uh, you sign by saying the step three prayer and then you get on with a couple of things. And the two things you get on with are um, uh steps four through nine as a discrete exercise, maybe an hour or two a day until it's done. And then 10, 11, 12 instantly as a way of life. Um, sometimes people say it's, the steps are in an order for a reason. 
And there is some truth to that, although it has to be understood that the original six steps, although exactly what those steps, six steps were, there's some contention about that, were in a different order. So the AA program, as it was acquired by the early AA members, was in a different order. The idea was not that you move in a sort of stately manner from one to another. It's that you adopt the whole way of life all at once in a very short time and then spend the rest of your life living it. Um, so the notion, for instance, that you don't start step 10 until you've completed step nine is, 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 is silly, really. Um, because if uh, sort of 10 or 20 years, you need to be um, directing your attention to doing the right thing, how much more so if you're new? And the same with 11, the same with, with 12. Um, you know, I, I, I got put on to service really from day one. So the, the, the program, I think, has got three parts. There's one to three, which is your preparation, four through nine, which runs along one track, which takes a few weeks or months to complete, usually, um, and then 10 through 12, which is a daily cycle. Um, one of the things it says here, which I get people to do, most people are fine with the step three prayer. If they don't like this, they can reword it as long as it doesn't say something completely mad. The NA step three is amazingly good. There is a, a little step three prayer in the NA book, uh, which is in sort of plain English as opposed to King James. Um, one last thing, a couple of last things with this. Um, I get people to consider overnight, by the time we're about to take step three, I get them to consider whether they're willing to go at steps four through nine, um, go through those like a dose of the salts, or whether there's any reservation to doing that, because there's nothing worse than getting halfway through and discovering you've run out of steam because you've got the handbrake on for some reason. So, and, and very often, very major reservations come out of that like 24 hour consideration period before they take step three. Sometimes I get people to take it over the phone with me. Um, I haven't really done it in person with people much. I don't see any correlation between whether or not people take step three with me over the phone or in person, and whether they get through the remaining steps. I think it's entirely an internal thing. I've had people where it's been terribly moving, do a wonderfully moving step three, and you literally never hear from them again. So I don't know what that was about. And other people, it all seems very perfunctory and business-like, but they get through the steps in a few weeks. So you can never tell from the outside by the sort of external manifestation of religious or spiritual sentiment, whether there's any depth to it. Um, you only tell if you um, uh, give them the, the first instruction of step four and uh, see if they get on with it or not. So I'm going to pause there. I, I'm going to suggest, uh, Alistair, that we see if there are any questions on that. And uh, if we have if, if there are no, if there aren't many questions, and we've got some spare time. Maybe I could start the step four this evening. What do you think? Sure. Okay, Tim. Thanks. Um, yeah. So uh, at this meeting, as I mentioned at the beginning, we um, it's more of a workshop, and uh, the floor is now open for questions. Uh, um, if you have any, and this can be done by the raised hand option or just waving your hand <laughs> at the at the at your camera, um, or, or you can send me one on the chat. I do have that open uh, as well. So, Sarah Rivka. Hi, thank you so much. I do have a question. Um, I've often had the experience of working with a sponsee who says to me, I have a very strong belief in God, but I think that God hates me and is punishing me. I mean, maybe this technically comes under step two, but the problem is when it comes to step three, they're reticent to turn their will and their life over to this you know, person, well, not a person, I'm sorry, but a being who hasn't been, in their opinion, had, has not been fair with them. Uh, do you, you have get, any suggestions you, for that? Absolutely. But can you say a little bit more for us, Arifka, about, give, give an example of, of what their 
characterizing as God hating them or God punishing them? Um, it's like God hates me. He never gives me what he wants. You know, my life is horrible. And of course, in my opinion, this person has a perfectly fine life. Um, but they're looking at it as I'm not getting what I want when I want it because God hates me. And perhaps that's a punishment. Um, maybe I'm being punished for some reason, because if I, if God was so loving and kind, why don't I have what I want? That's, that's the, the gist of it. Right. That's a really good question. You've actually, there are actually seven or eight individual questions buried in that one question. And with your permission, I'll go through uh, what those are. I'll take little notes to make sure I get through all of them. Um, because they cover basically the full range of, of issues you have. Uh, it's much easier dealing with atheists and agnostics because they are sophisticated enough <laughs> to have thought it through. It's often religious people are the hardest because they've been thinking about it for the last 40 years. So there's a lot more deconstruction before you can get to step three. Um, but sometimes, you know, even without much religious background, people can build up a real animus against God. Um, OK, so the first thing, the, the, the first problem is where you've people's image uh, of God is Santa Claus or some kind of personal servant or skivvy where the relationship should be you snap your fingers and God does what you want. And the, I think that the way you I don't have a huge amount of patience with that one because it, it, it rather sort of it, that, that should be a fairly easy bubble to pop, at least intellectually that um, the purpose of God is not to serve you. The, the purpose should be the other way around. Uh, what, what's much harder, what's much harder, you've got a, a, a second situation. So the Santa Claus one, um, uh, I find people, if that's the only thing they've got going on, that's a fairly easy obstacle to overcome. Most people are good intentioned, well-intentioned enough to realise that there's selfishness inside that. Um, the second situation um, is where you've got um, basically a complicated, messy life um, where it's just like regular messy. So, you know, lots of entanglements and, you know, you're surrounded. There are lots of, of difficult, schmucky people around you and it you feel very much victimised by it. So it's it's not that you know, God hasn't given me a Rolls Royce and unicorns and lollipops. It's that everything is a mess and God's doing it to me. Um, if people are genuinely open minded that you can usually have a conversation. You take a couple of worked examples of uh, the situation on page 62 where it says we made a decision based on self, which later placed us in a position to be hurt. And you can help people see, and I'll do it with my own experience, but it's a particular story that I tell, um, to help people see that their fingerprints are all over the scene of the crime. So it ain't God that's doing this. It couldn't have happened without their full participation. And some of you have heard this, so I apologise. French novel, um, um, where this kid... His best friend, over the course of the summer, disappears with the family. They go and move somewhere else. He has no idea where the family has gone. So he goes and sees this old Russian emigre photographer um, who's his confidant, who's 40 years, 50 years his senior. And he goes to see him, and the man is fiddling with his cameras, and he the, the, the kid tells the old man, the older man, his story wanting sympathy wanting sympathy from the old man about how to and, and, and basically an ally against this terrible boy Nicolas who has deserted him and the old man uh he says I'm afraid it's your fault he said this 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 boy Nicolas has behaved very badly is that right and he, the boy says yes he has and he says and you say he was your best friend. Yes, he was my best friend. He said, well, 
best friends do not behave like that towards each other. Therefore, he was not your best friend. He was not a friend at all. Your problem is that you believed he was a friend. You're lousy at picking friends. You need to pay a lot more attention about who you decide to be your friend. And uh, he says with something like with affairs of the heart and friendship is an affair of the heart, wishful thinking will often take the place of rational thinking. Um, and usually it doesn't take long to find a few situations. And the, the, the most obvious one is, is, you know, with marriage. Well, who said yes at the altar? <laughs> Um, with terrible jobs, who said yes when they offered you the job? Did anyone force you to take that job as opposed to another job? Usually, you know, there are choices there. Um, so, so that's like sort of regular, regular messy life. Um, the third type of problem um, is basically the way the world is created. Um, which is that we, first of all, and C.S. Lewis talks about this. So the book that people want to read is The Problem of Pain. If you're not Christian, it, it works just as well with a tiny bit of adjustment. There isn't much Jesus-y stuff, I don't think, in Problem of Pain. There is a little bit more Jesus-y stuff in their Christianity, for instance, but, but even there, it's transferable in many ways. But anyway, in The Problem of Pain, he talks about the material world, about the creation of the material world. So um, if you think about human suffering, uh, all form, uh, if you think about bad events that happen, everything from sort of hurricanes to diseases to pandemics to, uh, you know, your neighbor spitting on you when they walk past you on the street, everything is some combination of natural events in which are simply a function of the material universe, plus the exercise of human will. Um, now, I'm, I'm not going to go into the full philosophy of, of why God would allow a physical world where bad stuff happens. But one of the ways out of that is what we were talking about earlier with material reality being only a fragment of the bigger picture. So the fact that bad stuff happens materially is only part of the picture. There is a bigger purpose behind the whole thing. Uh, but more specifically, most of the wrongs that people are worried about actually boil down to other people behaving badly. And if you can help people see that they are exercising free will in their lives, other people are exercising free will in their lives. Other, God is not taking people over like zombies temporarily to make them act badly towards you know you're, you're just encountering human beings operating with whatever software they have loaded um so it's the setup of the world is not uh, i think the sort of deterministic uh the deterministic approach which is literally everything is determined by god implies that we have no free will in which case why are we even talking why why have a conversation why go and have a cup of tea if it's all um i think the premise behind this whole thing is that we have will if we don't then there's we shouldn't even be looking at a program as soon as you've got the concession that people are exercising will it's difficult to blame god for those for, for those things the fourth situation um and this is uh, this is a tougher one. Some people have genuinely had um, uh, extraordinarily difficult uh, circumstances. I'm thinking of uh, parents who've lost young children, that kind of thing. And I've had sponsees here in that position um, who blame God directly for those. And uh, now, I'm not about to get, get in there and try and re rewire someone on a subject like that. I think the closest you can get is suspending disbelief, as it were, and saying, are you willing to set aside the question of why that happened and whether there was a direction behind it, whether there was a purpose behind it? Are you willing to set aside that question for now and return to it later once you've done the steps? 
and maybe you'll be in a better position to figure out what was going on there then. And most people, if the the flames of that alcoholism or that alanonism are licking sufficiently at their heels, that will be sufficient motivation to set aside that. So um, sometimes there are, um, uh, sometimes you can actually resolve these once and for all. Sometimes you can't resolve them once and for all, but what you can do is have these questions, have these questions set aside. And the last point I'm gonna make on this particular question is, um, uh, I think it may be different in Israel. Well, I know it's different in Israel, but I know in this country, when you ask people what religious training they've got or what religious instruction they've had, like the last thing they remember was, you know, Sister Sister Mary Magdalene hitting them over the, the knuckles with a wooden ruler at the age of seven in, in, in you know, uh, St. Eugenia's Catholic Primary School in Huddersfield. And they've literally had no religious instruction since then. And yet, and yet, you know, people are pronouncing on, you know, the causes of the universe and, and the music of the spheres. And, well, it's all very well, but it is coming from a position of absolute ignorance. So uh, you've got to get, you've got to get the ignorance out on the table. So you're asking really important, valid interesting questions but how about you do the steps first and then sign up to a theology course to actually investigate those under proper instruction later on because you would no more try and figure out physics or dare I say virology on your own by just looking at YouTube clips why are you doing it with theology theology is no different than anything else it requires direction and instruction and and, and proper you it's not something you can make up as you go along. And most people are act will actually buy that idea. The difficulty is when you've got people who've got a lot of religious instruction and they're, I'm afraid, I, I, I don't even go there. I just say, how about we set that aside and look at the more basic thing that you can't stop doing X, Y, and Z. Uh, you're shooting above your weight here by trying to tackle those big theological problems. Just look at the fact that five people in your home group just this week have made progress in the area you're currently stuck in. How about you just keep your relationship with God as simple as trying to do the steps? And, and so you just have to bypass the question at that point. I hope that's helped, Sarah Rivka. Tim, thank you for doing this. Alistair, thanks for um, hosting this. Um, so the passages that we read, um, it's sort of, to me, it seems like learning objectives. Like when you take a class and like at the top of the sheet, it's like, what are the objectives for this course? It's like, what are the objectives for doing the inventory? It's to have this awareness, right? Or, or, or that's how I see it. Like, I'm just wondering as a sponsor, do you feel it's our responsibility to circle back with sponsees to go over these uh, mistaken ideas and beliefs and make sure like through the work that it's, that like they're on board with, with seeing that they're mistaken ideas and beliefs. Does that do make you mean, sense? Do you mean specifically about the relationship with God or the higher power, or do you mean more generally about the philosophy of the way the world operates? I, I think both, like, like, like in the sense, like to make sure that it's clear that, like, that they, that they're clear when they're operating from the delusion, they can wrest satisfaction and happiness out of this world if they only manage well. Um, OK, so th I think there are levels of understanding. Now, when people are I, I, I find people who are genuinely open mind, who are genuinely defeated and genuinely open minded can usually get on board with those ideas. Let's say the page 60 to 62 ideas, they can get on board with them in a few days in principle. Now, um, the notion that a life run on self-will can hardly be a success, um, the worked example is going to be your step four. So that's an example of you discover, or, you know, in the third column of the resentment inventory, 
you discover that the reason you're unhappy is because you've gone into the world with a blueprint. You've gone into the world with self-will, a whole shopping list of things that you want to happen, things that you will for yourself, and that that is the problem. So the worked example comes later, and that's when it comes through with full in full Technicolor, and then it comes through even more strongly in step nine, and then you know, the, the final nails in the coffin get banged into the coffin in step 12 when, when you have other people coming to you with their self-will and you can see it from the outside much more clearly than you can see it within yourself. So I think there's a gradual progression. The important thing, um, what the I find, so, I mean, spiritual growth doesn't stop. So you're always going to be, uh, I think to be spiritually growing means you have to be challenging yourself. And I'm better at it now only because of, of, of the pain of, of doing it wrong. I'm much better now at when I'm present, presented with a new idea. I treat the new idea as true and use it as a working hypothesis and let my subsequent experience demonstrate that it's true. And I find honestly I find people in AA and who are or other fellowships who are, as I say, defeated and willing, actually very, very able to do that. Um, now, it won't go all the way in, but you can hear in people's voice when they want to understand it. It's amazing what does go in, even if it's just at the level of principle, even if it's just at the level of little flashes, like recognizing that, you know, what are the top five things you think will make you happy? For instance, you give them an exercise. What are the top five things that will make you happy? And then you say, do you know anyone that has those things who is unhappy? And just sit with that. Sit with the fact you're pinning your happiness on things which haven't made your friends happy. And people can see it, even if it's just a flash. And the, the important bit is the flash. There's a, um, a medieval commentator called Maimonides who says something to the effect of I'm sure Evan will correct me here. Something to the effect of it's like um, uh, seeing a landscape at night lit up with lightning, uh, just a flash for a couple of seconds. And then you spend the rest of your life trying to reconstruct what you saw in that moment of clarity. So if people in this process are open, I think they get those little flashes of clarity and that takes the rest of their recovery to fill in the details and make that a permanently burnt image onto their retina. Does that make sense, Mara? But you, there's, a, there's a, a, a line in Peanuts where someone, uh, where Lu, I think Lucy um, says... To someone how many times does four go into three and they say four doesn't go into three and she says it does if you push now with sponsees it doesn't if you push it doesn't like you know when you're trying to feed a baby and they don't want the food to go in and it just ends up all over their face that's what's going to happen or they'll throw it on the floor and you have to clean it up so if people are not if people don't want the new idea there is no way you can explain it carefully enough to make it go in so don't sweat it because it was written to be plain and it might need a bit of filling in but basically it's meant to be relatively plain i'm gonna jump in with a quick one if i may tim uh i said i've got it um I don't, if you've had this experience where you, um, you mentioned you, are, you ask a, a sponsee to go away for 24 hours and ask the higher power if they're ready, really. Um, uh, I've had an experience recently of a couple coming back and saying, um, yeah, I kind of understand that selfishness and self-centeredness is the root of my problem, but I think I'm going to fix that uh, before I go to God on my own power kind of thing. Um, and then I find myself trying to convince them that they can't and I'm, that they need to be convinced, not me. I don't know if you've had a situation like that, with how you dealt with that. There we go. I've literally got a quotation about this. Um, this is from Charles Haddon Spurgeon, the 19th century uh, preacher who wrote, I don't know. 
100 billion sermons, each of which is 14 hours long, and someone wrote them down. I just, it's a miracle. Um, and they're, I mean, they're very, very Christian, but there's some good stuff in them, the stuff I find really useful in them. Um, he says this, if thou hast made some difficulties for thyself, if thou art such a fool as to be tying knots and wanting to get them untied before thou wilt be believing God, then I have nothing to say to thee, except it were, beware, so I'm going to try and put this into ordinary English, um, beware in case you tie a knot that's going to destroy your soul. Uh, if you're troubled with an honest objection, I tell you now, in God's name, just ask of God. You do not need to wait till you get home. You do not need to, st to, to stay till you have left that seat. But now silently in your soul, breathe the prayer. God, teach me, save my soul this day. End the doubtful strife. Answer these questions. Bring me as a humble servant to lie before thy mercy and to receive pardon. Let him ask. That is all. Let him ask. So. The short version of that is um, the reason you're going to God is because you've tied yourself up in knots. You do not need to untie the knots first. How is that going to be quicker? How is that going to help? You might as well. Uh, yeah, you're being you're, there, there's something available to help you untie the knots for free. So just just like, don't look a gift horse in the mouth. That's what I'd say in that situation. Uh, to set the tone for the meeting, I will read an extract from chapter 7, uh, page 89, Working with Others. Um, working with Others. Practical experience shows that nothing will so much ensure immunity from drinking as intensive work with other alcoholics. It works when other activities fail. This is our 12th suggestion. Carry this message to other alcoholics. You can help when no one else can. You can secure their confidence when others fail. Remember, they are very ill. Life will take on new meaning to watch people recover, to see them help others, to watch loneliness vanish, to see a fellowship grow up about you, to have a host of friends. This is an experience you must not miss. We know you will not want to miss it. Frequent contact with newcomers and with each other is the bright spot of our lives. Uh, the topic of tonight's meeting is working step four with a sponsee. And Tim will share anything between 30 and 45 minutes on the topic. And at, after which the floor will be open for questions rather than the typical sharing. And with that, I will now hand over to Tim. Thank you. My name is Tim. I'm an alcoholic. Let me just, oh, what am I trying to, I'm trying to share the screen. It looks different than usual. Here we go. Let's see if that seems to have worked. There we go. There we go. Can you see the big book now? Yeah, good. OK, so I, there are a couple of you I'm not sure I know. So just so you know what this is about. Uh, Tim Alcoholic got sober 24th of July 1993. Uh, I don't know if I'm a good sponsor, but I've, I'm a busy sponsor. So um, that that bit certainly true. I've done a lot of it. Um, it's rather like with addiction, just because you've done a lot of it doesn't mean you're good at it. Just But you do have some experience back there. So um, this is just my personal experience. I don't speak on behalf of AA. If it's helpful, great. If, it, if it's not, then don't come back and tell everyone how awful I am. That's just fine with me. So um, next, we launched out on a course of vigorous action. So, so I mean, you, you, you will already have said this to the sponsee that they need to, when taking step three, be prepared for concerted action until it's done, until steps four through nine are done. And I would liken it to taking a trip through a, a, a sort of dark medieval German forest. As long as you stick, has to be German, doesn't it? Uh, it you need the menace. Without it being German, there's no, no French forest, you know, that's a pleasant in some, but a German forest. You get the idea. Dangers on every side. You want to stick to the path and get through it as quickly as possible. The path is torchlit. So you're fine. 
like the wolves won't get you as long as you stay on the path. But if you dawdle, you're going to start looking into the darkness and then the darkness will start to look back at you and then you'll start to exchange with the darkness. So you want to just get on with it. Uh, and what they usually say on big book things is you can't launch slowly. You know, it's got to slip down the, the, the slip way into the sea. If it, if it stops, it's really stuck then. Um, the first step of which is a personal house cleaning, which many of us had never attempted. Though our decision, step three, was a vital and crucial step, it could have little permanent effect unless at once another indication about the urgency, followed by a strenuous effort to face. Um, strenuous. Uh, what does that mean in practice? If someone is working or has children or has other intense obligations, I think an hour a day on non-working days and two hours a day at weekend is pretty reasonable. Get it out of the way first thing in the morning and then you spend the whole day smugly telling people, I've done my step work already. If you leave it till the evening, you spend all day wondering if you're even going to get it done. And then one day builds up when you haven't done it. And then two days and then three days, then you can't call your sponsor and you can't go to meetings because you now hate everyone because you hate yourself, but you're now in denial about hating yourself so you have to hate everyone else as a diversionary tactic to avoid facing the truth so rather than that just get them to do it you know get get up at 6 30 get it done and then spend the rest of the day smug um if someone's not working like knock yourself out the the, the one thing i would say um uh uh, there can there is such thing as too much step work sometimes it gets too intense and you just need to go and do something nice instead so i tell people to bookend the step work with a little prayer to start with a little prayer at the end and maybe if especially if it's really intense some people's histories are really intense uh to book something nice afterwards to you know take the sort of bitterness away and to, to come back into the room strenuous effort uh, we're not interested in results here. We're interested in effort, and that's important. This is our first attempt to look at this properly, and it's not going to be perfect. So sometimes people spend years doing their first step for, and I don't think I don't think that's the most helpful thing to do. Uh, you want to get it done. Uh, as my old sponsor, Brian, said about his amends, about some of his amends, I think it was his amends or something. He said, I did them. I wouldn't give you tuppence for how I did them, but I did them. And I think it's like that with the first step four or even the second step. But maybe the first five step fours are a complete disaster. But at least you're getting the material out as best you can. Uh, Kevin used to say, you, you're only interested in the hold luggage. You can come back for the hand luggage later. And I think that's I think that's right. A strenuous effort to face and be rid of. So sometimes people talk about, you know, managing anxiety and depression and all of these other things. And uh, that just makes me want to jump off a bridge. Um, uh, now, my anxiety, my depression, my this, my that did not go straight away. Um, but I want a solution which is going to get rid of it, and not just help me somehow live in hell. That's not the purpose. The purpose is to be rid of this crap. Um, the advice I give to sponsees as well about uh, Don Pritz would say that in step four, what you want to do, it's like you're sending a kid to a room to clean up the room by taking a big bin bag and putting all the stuff they don't want and that is broken and doesn't work and they're tired of and, and they've outgrown. Put it in the bin bag and then we'll take it to the tip and then we'll buy you some new stuff. And that's the image here. Everything we find, we get to get rid of. So we're not finding who we are. This is not about us. It doesn't say we find who we are. We, we find the things in ourselves which have been blocking us. Now, if you get rid of what's blocking you, you find who you are. But the step four is not about us. It's about the things which don't work. What things? Beliefs, 
thinking behavior. I didn't come up with my own beliefs, thinking and behavior. They were taught to me by society and by my family and the people around me. And so step four is about finding the things that I borrowed from other people which don't work so I can get rid of them. And then I will, I will, who I am is what's left over when everything from step four is gotten rid of. So that's why there's nothing to be frightened of here because you're not writing about yourself. You're writing about the beliefs, the thinking, the behavior which have messed you up and you're not responsible for installing the bad software in yourself in the first place. So you, you say to the sponsor, you're, you're, I'm sending you to your room to take all the stuff that doesn't work so we can get rid of it so you don't have to look at it again, okay? It's totally different than thinking that you're having to sort of... Um, uh, do a catalogue of the hell that you live in so that at least you now understand that the, the hell that you live in. There's no point in that. Um, I don't know if any of you are old enough to remember. I'm not going to name names. I think I can see a couple. But there was a show that I remember from the 1970s um, uh, and early 80s called The Generation Game where the prize round, a conveyor belt would come past with all of the prizes. And you got to concentrate very hard on the conveyor belt. And then afterwards, after the two minutes were up, anything that you could recall as having been on the conveyor belt, you got to keep and take home as the prize. And step four is like that, but in reverse. Anything you get to find, you get to get rid of. So you want to find stuff. You don't want to conceal stuff because it's the stuff that's killing you. Um, our liquor was but a symptom, so we had to get down to causes and conditions. Therefore, we started upon a personal inventory. This was step four. A business which takes no regular inventory usually goes broke. Taking a commercial inventory is a fact-finding and a fact-facing process. And so again, here, we're interested in peeling back the layers of self-justifying, blame-throwing narratives and stories which have coated these tiny little grains of reality uh, until we can find out what really happened, what really went on. Uh, it's about finding the truth, getting past the story, peeling it back and getting to the truth. Um, also, it's about facts, not judgments. So when I discover, I give you an example, and because people are very frightened that it, uh, although it's a moral inventory, it's not a moralistic inventory. So um, what's a moral inventory? It's an inventory where, for instance, I discover that I am self-centered. Now, that's not with a wagging the finger at me. That's a moral question. Am I self-centered or am I other-centered? It's, it's definitely a question within the domain of morality. That's where it resides. So it's a moral question. But we're not judging. We're saying, what is going on? And do we, uh, what results are we getting from that? I'll give you an example. Um, uh, I was uh, often told as a child, oh, you're so selfish. Selfish, selfish, selfish. And I never liked, I never liked that. Um, but when someone said to me, well, let's look at this notion that you might be self-centered. For one day, every half hour, at the end of the half hour, you write down what you've been predominantly thinking about for the previous half hour. And come back to me the next day and we'll do a little summary. What have you been thinking about? And it turns out, I've been thinking about myself in some aspect for each of those half hours. I've been thinking about these seven areas of self, which we're going to come to. Uh, what, I, uh, what, uh, what I thought others thought of me, pride. What I thought about myself, self-esteem. How others were treating me, personal and sex relations. About my financial position, um, pocketbooks. About my security, the things that I need. Um, and the and ambitions, the things that I want. Me being self-centered was simply an objective description of what my thought life was centered on, namely me. So it's not a it's not a finger wagging thing. It's simply look at the fact, and then you say to yourself, "How much fun am I having thinking about me all day long? How pleasant is that?" Well, it's horrible. 
well, OK, I want to get rid of it then. So it's no different than if you've got a radio and it doesn't work. It's, the, it's not a bad radio. It's not a naughty radio. It's a radio which doesn't work. And it's the same with all of the beliefs, the thinking and the behavior. What's a character defect? It's a belief, a thinking pattern or a behavior pattern, which does not work. It talks in the big book also about our willingness to throw away the gadget, which doesn't work in favor of the new one, which does. Um, let's have a look. Uh, uh, resentment. Now, the reason we're starting with resentment, the whole a uh, phenomenon of resentment is one in which it's basically a great big narrative where I'm the innocent princess in a world full of ghouls and monsters and ogres and threats and perils and wicked stepmothers and wicked witches and and I'm the one being fed the poisoned apples so woe is woe is me and it, it's Basically, a f I won't go into too many details because I don't want to veer into Course in Miracles territory. Um, but basically, that's what resentment is about. It's about establishing an existential position where I am innocent and the bony finger of retribution is pointed at you, not at me, because I'm trying to get rid of my own guilt and fear. Right. OK, so resentment, um, it's this huge diversionary tactic. If I'm going to have a hope in hell's chance of getting to that moral inventory bit of step four, I've got to get rid of resentment. To get rid of resentment, I've got to be willing to get rid of resentment. To be willing to get rid of resentment, I need to do this analysis in the first three columns to, to understand the insanity of it. Because it's only by looking at the insanity of it that I'm willing to let go of it in the same way it was only when I looked at the insanity of the drinking and the other neat behaviours, um, the, the compulsive addictions. It was only by looking at the insanity of it that I recognised that I didn't want the insanity anymore. So the, the, the step four, um, here's the boss level tip. Step four, the moral inventory does not start until page 67. The first question in which I identify a moral failing of myself is what were my mistakes on page 67? So what the hell is this stuff about resentment? I'm not going to look at me whilst I think there's something wrong with you. Whilst your wrongs are filling my entire universe and consciousness, I cannot look at myself. So we've got to get rid of this stuff first. Um, uh, another very important point about getting rid of resentment. Um, uh, all resentment is the same. And it boils down to this. If this had been different, I would be OK. If this were different, I would be OK. So whether you've got whether I've got one resentment or 10,000, the underlying structure is the same. What this means is I don't need to analyze every single resentment in my life. I need a good range to understand its pervasive impact and to really ram home what is going on. But once the lesson has been learned, I do not need to write. I, I saw a girl once in a meeting. I felt so sorry for it. She had four lever arch files full of papers on resentments. And she'd been writing it for two years. She'd fallen out with her sponsor. She was looking for someone to read it to. People were running and hiding. Um, and it t I tried to talk to her, but she was very she didn't want it. She didn't want to summarize it. No, 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 no. She wanted to read out every damn thing. Um, we get very attached to these narratives. So it's very important. I ex always explain this to sponsees. You must never treat step four as a socially acceptable form of self-absorption. We're here to get a job done and get it jo done effectively and efficiently so we can move past it. Um, so the first three columns, um, first of all, what is resentment? Uh, now, resentment, 
we think of resentment in it's one of those words just like craving in physical craving or obsession in mental obsession where the the meaning of it in the big book is different than the meaning of it in the language generally it's related but it's not exactly the same so resentment in the language generally means a sort of uh, uh, an ongoing um self-righteous grievance but it's very interesting when you look at the language in the big book by the way footnote what is written here was not what the first hundred did you need to know that but if you do what bill wrote down in 1939 you'll discover it a thousand times more effective than what the first hundred did so it's some weird miracle which shouldn't work but it does anyway that's another question um when it talks about resentment it then talks about we asked ourselves why we were angry and then it talks about being hurt or threatened being sore being burned up and then it talks about our injuries um and being interfered with where, where these things have been interfered with so really this is going to be a catalog not just of grumbling grievances but basically any situation where i'm either persistently or uh recurrently upset where i'm out of whack it doesn't matter what flavor the out of whackness is it can be rage it can be it can be hurt or threatened it can be self pity it can be basically anything which bothers me because to do the inventory i've got to be unbothered sometimes when people have a crisis when sponsees have a crisis the first thing that they want to do is do the inventory and you can't because you're still upset you need to get unupset to do the inventory because you're crazy if you're crazy you won't see it straight so you've got to get unupset first so with this um i get people and i do this myself of course i get people to write about anything which upsets them it doesn't matter if it feels like the word resentment just anything which upsets you or bothers you at any level and first of all you want people to do a full catalog of names of people places situations uh ideas so when it says principles treat that as being abstract ideas so i've had problems with um literally the second law of thermodynamics i'm not going to go into detail but that that took up a couple of years back there um it says it's possible to have resentments against super abstract things uh it doesn't matter what it doesn't matter the the point is to get something down in the first column now the po- one of the points of that is if you can get a comprehensive first column of all the things which have basically persistently or recurrently bothered you in your life and it's you you're not writing in detail but you've got a full list the purpose of this is twofold first of all it gives you a starting point for the rest of the step 4 but secondly you now know the scope of everything that is wrong with you everything that is wrong with you is sitting behind those situations i used to go to psychotherapy and it did it, it was wonderful in some ways but every time i went it was like cutting the head off the hydra and two more heads grew back so it didn't matter what we resolved we see i seemed to come away from each session with twice as many problems as i started with this it's the opposite process where if you can i i mean i remember looking at a piece of paper with all the names on and saying my god my whole life problem can actually be summarized on one page if i can get past these disturbances i'll be fine which i indeed was once they've got the uh list of names and it could be the most someone had was 670 um if people have fewer than 20 i don't believe them i just don't believe people that have fewer than 20 so that's a whole other discussion um but most people come up with, with between you know 20 50 60 70 1 what i then get people to do is narrow down the top 20 to cover a whole range of areas in their lives um 
on the basis that once you've analyzed 20, you're not going to learn anything new. It's everything is just the same thing wearing a different hat. And then we get to the second column and look at this. Look how concise it is. Mr. Brown, I'm resentful of Mr. Brown. His attention to my wife told my wife of my mistress. Brown may get my job at the office. Um, you'll notice uh, one, two, three, five words. One, two, three, uh, six words. One, two, three, four, five, eight words, but no more than that. So I get people to write up to five charges per person to try to be as factual as possible and not to tell a great big story. We want to get the nub of it in the second column. Um, and to do that for, for somewhere around 20 people, and that can be done in like 40 minutes. Um, some people need some real hand-holding to go from the abstract story in their minds to the actual truth of what is going on. Um, my favorite example, my friend Ivana, for Anish doesn't mind me telling the story. Um, she had a problem with, uh, some, let's, let's say, uh, Carol. Um, and she, second column, Carol is always putting me down. And I start to, and you want to examine this with them, say, always, what you mean, like, literally every time you encounter Carol, she puts you down. No, 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 no. So how often? Well, it turns out once a week. What do you mean by putting you down? That's a bit abstract. That could mean anything. She said she criticizes my ideas. OK, that's great. That's now concrete. I can understand that. She criticizes my ideas. Give me a bit of background here. Who is she? Oh, she's my boss. She's 20 years my senior. What's the context in which this is happening? Um, it's work meetings where we get to throw out ideas and then everyone comments on everyone else's ideas. So the truth in the second column was, uh, so we changed the first column from Carol to my line manager. And in the second column, we got it down to <laughs> occasionally disagrees with me in work meetings. Now, can you see how Carol always puts me down is totally different than my line manager occasionally disagrees with me in work meetings? Um, we, in getting the facts down in the second column, we're already doing a huge amount to strip away the the um the narrative often the narrative sounds like you know when they're telling you what's going to happen on a soap opera this evening that's what people's first draft of the second column sounds like and i always work very carefully on the second column to strip back the all the fluff get back down to the facts because that's just such an important tool for the rest of your life that when you go off the deep end to have the ability to immediately start discounting the ego's narratives and just look at something plainly and factually. Now, the effects my, um, what it says here is effect my, and then it's got these seven areas, um, which we talked about earlier. Pride, what you think about me. Self-esteem, what I think about me. Um, um, personal relations, how you treat me. Sex relations, how you treat me in the bedroom. Um, or in related areas. Pocketbooks is to do with money, security, what I need, ambitions, what I want. Now, I used to uh, do this the very traditional way and just people would write, I would write, this affects my personal relations, sex relations, self-esteem. And I don't know if you've ever heard of step five, where that's all someone does for the third column. First of all, within five minutes of it starting, you want to start sticking pins in your eyes or their eyes because it's so boring and painful. And you're like, why? What are you learning from this? I don't know. And that's the problem. It doesn't really tell you anything unless here again, boss level tip. Um, page 67. It says. Uh, an interesting thing. Where had we been self-seeking? Where had we been self-seeking? Now, when I apply this little trick, 
which as I took this question, where, where, where had I been self-seeking? And I applied it back to these seven areas of self, all the lights went on. And this is the key to getting out of resentment. Um, the reason I'm resentful is because I am self-seeking. In other words, I have a plan, a scheme, a plot, a design, a set of expectations, a blueprint for how I want my life to look. And you're messing with it. Your behavior is not in accordance with my blueprint. Now, whilst my upset is your fault, I'm going to stay unhappy forever. If I'm upset, not because of your behavior, but because of my blueprint, we have a way out here because I can get rid of the blueprint and then I'm going to be OK. So to get rid of resentment, you either eliminate the person as you can't change them. So you have to eliminate them, you know, wait till they're standing at the top of some stairs, one little push and it's in God's good hands. Uh, you can either eliminate them or you can eliminate self. You get to pick eliminating other people. And I can tell you, it takes a long time. There's a long list of people to get through. Eliminating self, you eliminate self and you solve the problem universally. Rumi, Sufi poet, uh, would say that it is easier to wear slippers than to carpet the whole world. So what we want to do with this third column is use this to demonstrate case by case by case that the reason I'm resentful is because I have a plan. Now, how do you get to the plan? If you say to someone, how are you self-seeking here? They're going to say, I don't know. And they won't because the ego is desperate to cover its tracks. So what we've got to do uh, the way I do it now, I've done it differently in the past. The way I do it now is I start with personal relations and sex relations. Personal relations and sex relations are about I've got a script for how I want you to behave. If it's in the sexual domain, it's sex relations. If it's everything else, it's personal relations. And I say, how do, how do we want you to behave? So let's take the example of the line manager. Personal relations. And you, you, you go to town, you're giving the ego a voice in order to write down what it says and look at it objectively. So the line manager. Uh, what's my script for the line manager? Agree with everything I say in work meetings. <laughs> there we go. That's the script. Um, now, the reason why I want someone to behave in a certain way is because I have a plan for what my life should look like. And the plan breaks down into all the financial stuff, which is pocketbooks, into all the needs. A need is something that everyone needs. If it's just you, it's not a need, it's a want. So need is about basic stuff, which is common to all humanity. That's security. Ambitions is about what I want. So we, so I say, you know, to the now imaginary sponsee, uh, right, so. Carol, your boss, if she if she would uh, always agree with you in work meetings, what would that deliver to you in terms of outcomes? She'd say, well, uh, I'm going to get to keep my job. I put that on security. I keep my job. Um, pocketbooks. Well, that affects my income. Uh, that bounces back onto security i'll have somewhere to live somewhere to to uh um uh some some funds to pay for my daily necessities because if she criticizes me what i'm frightened of is she's going to sack me. and then ambitions i want a smooth progression up the career chain so we've now got a picture of the blueprint for this person's life and then that's the outside. So, so you've got scripts, personal and sex relations. Uh, you've got uh, the uh, ambition, security and pocketbooks, which is the outcomes. And then you've got the internal crap. So uh, why am I bothered that my line manager 
criticizes me in work meetings because I'm frightened that my colleagues think this is pride, think I'm incompetent. Incompetent. There we go. It's no more complicated than that. Com incompetent and foolish. I want them to think of me as smart, innovative, accomplished. And then self-esteem might be the same thing. So what I get, what I get people to write and what I write myself under pride, how do I want them to see me? How do I think they see me? Self-esteem. How do I, uh, how would I like to see myself? How do I, how do I actually see myself? And sometimes those feed into each other. So if, if people think I'm crap, I think I'm crap. If I think I'm crap, I'll project that out onto other people they're not always the same though sometimes you know you've done an amazing job you just can't get the buggers to see it sometimes you think you're terrible even though everyone's saying oh we love you so much and you have so much to live for but you're like no I'm the most terrible person in the world you just won't believe anyone so sometimes it's just self-esteem sometimes it's just pride normally it's both so what you get from this I get people to summarize the third column across the whole of the step four and say right you've now summarized on one page your ego's blueprint for your life if only this blueprint would be established and maintained in reality if we could build the building designed by this blueprint we'd be okay and you get them to read it out and they're normally laughing by about a third of the way through because number one it's full of contradictions number two it's pie in the sky because it's so improbable. I want everyone to love me and adore me and respect me and validate me and praise me and give me lots of money the whole time with no exceptions. It's just unrealistic. And thirdly, what happens when the plan comes off? Well, I just make up another plan, which is what happens. You're fine for like eight minutes and then the cold wind starts to blow and you're back at square one again. It's like peeing yourself in public. There is a moment of relief, but there is no long-term benefit. Um, and what this whole exercise does, it does two things. First of all, it, it loosens the individual's allegiance to their ego's narrative about what is going on because it's so clearly insane that you have to get it. Uh, when it's in my head, it seems completely rational. When it's out on paper and then communicated to someone else, it looks totally different. Once we've got that, we look at the um, uh, page 66. And page 66 is all about motivations for getting rid of resentment. Let's whiz through these. Um, a, it is plain that a life which includes deep resentment leads only to futility and unhappiness. So I get people to identify where this is the case. Have you noticed that just because you're upset about your financial situation does not make money fly through your letterbox? It does not achieve what it's meant to achieve. Unhappiness it, is self-evident. Also, the, there's the displacement. Uh, to the precise extent that we permit these, permit, interesting verb, do we squander the hours that might have been worthwhile? Uh, but then the ultimate reason is if I stay resentful, I'm going to drink. If I drink, I'm going to die. Um, also, there's a bit down here which started to get, get to me recently. Uh, a few years ago, we began to see that the world and its people really dominated us. In that state, the wrongdoing of others, fancied or real, had power to actually kill. And what I get to see uh, when I'm taking someone else through this as well is I I'll ask this direct question. Have you noticed that because of this setup with the blueprints, with the scripts, the outcomes, the image, that you want to hold of yourself, that what you're doing is you're giving other people the right to, to determine how you feel. You've become their glove puppet. In fact, the people that you respect the least in the world have the most sway on how you feel. How do you like that? Do you want, do you want to be like that? Do you want to be someone that is constantly triggered and set off by ordinary everyday events, or do you want to be free? And honestly, that's the one that gets most people. 
people often don't care if they drink or not, but they don't like the idea of other people being in charge of how they feel. And that's true for me. Honestly, emotionally, that's that's the one that I connect to. Um, and now the purpose of all of that, the purpose of all of that is to start to look at the actual solution and one of the big things which happens in recovery is people get really good at writing but not very good at changing so the purpose of getting this far is to literally change which means i've got to cut off the resentment at the ankles um now uh, people's step fours vary sometimes you have step fours where the everyone on there is clearly like borderline evil and that happens particularly people that get sober really young um one of the reasons they get sober really young is because there are a lot of really bad people when they're growing up some other people it's pretty clear that like people were just people and they were just in my way so this notion of of um people who wronged us were perhaps spiritually sick yet sometimes or maybe they were just getting on with their lives and they were in my way and so they were a target um but basically uh the the, the simple insight i need to convey at this point with a sponsor is this if people behave badly it is because they are driven by emotions that are more powerful than them exactly the same as on page 62 about ourselves so we take the insight from page 62 and apply it here and to deliberately look at these other people and say why might they have behaved badly what might be motivating them can i identify with those motivations even though the manifestation is different can i identify with them and that starts to break down the barrier between me and other people and then to diligently over a period of a couple of weeks uh, apply this prayer this is a sick man how can i be helpful to him god save me from being angry thy will be done every single time the person pops into your head um again and again and again and it's amazing it works um it you can turn other things here into prayers um god will show us how to take a kindly and tolerant view of each and every one and so i turned into a prayer and, and say god show me how to take a kindly and tolerant view of each and every one and a good way of doing that the, the trick i give people is ask god to show you what the world looks like through their eyes and it's 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 not fun that one but it's helpful and within eight seconds i realize, oh my god i'm a complete monster <laughs> or i've been behaving like a complete monster i'm a perfect child of god but i've been been behaving like a monster there we go um once and i also send people a bunch of readings and things to watch about resentment and forgiveness and all of that so you can go to town on that forgiveness stuff and that forgiveness journey then carries on forever on its own track you're never done with forgiveness it's we're as people say we're in forgiveness school here that's what the planet is it's forgiveness school um and the lessons don't stop coming and then finally finally we're doing an inventory and i'm going to finish in three minutes uh, alistair um there are um eight questions here i see eight questions people disagree people people can't you know people can't agree on how to count things in aa <laughs> is it twofold or is it threefold well i don't know let's count the folds um they keep moving though don't they uh but i see eight questions here uh, putting out of our minds the the wrongs others had done that's what the whole last three pages are about we resolutely look for our own mistakes with mistakes i'm looking at where is my where is my perception of this situation being wrong what did i do that i shouldn't have done what did i not do that i should have done but the perception has to be altered and i get a bit kind of rottweiler vulcan 
cross-examining barrister with this stuff about the perceptions. If you're not that sort of person, get them to talk to a friend in AA who is a bit like that. You want, uh, I need from the people around me absolute brutality about deconstructing my little fanciful narratives about things and challenging my perception of things. If my perception doesn't change, I am screwed. You want people to challenge you. So the first question, what are my mistakes? Where is my perception distorted? What is the true story here? What is the sane way of looking at this? And then these questions are now super straightforward. The hard bit we've done, which is getting behind the resentment. This is the easy bit. Where was I selfish? That's where I put my interests ahead of yours. What are your interests that I've disregarded? Dishonesty. That straightforward lying, misrepresentation, concealment, or delusion. Um, self-seeking. We've already basically covered self-seeking by those extra questions about the third column. What was I frightened of? Brainstorm bullet points. Where were we to blame? That's where I'm looking at the situation. What specific contribution did I make to that situation, which made a bad situation, which either created the bad situation or made a bad situation worse? Uh, we saw our faults. The seventh question is faults, character defects. I give people a list of character defects. Some people like a list of 20. Other people want the list with like 300, like whatever suits the person's personality. Give them the range, let them pick. But I don't write more than three faults per, pers per personal situation because otherwise you're just there forever. You want to pick the main items. And then finally, we admitted our wrongs. That's the behavior of mine that harmed other people. So the seventh question, faults, prepares me for step seven. The eighth question, wrongs, prepares me for step eight. Now, what do I write these questions about? Number one, I write them about the 20 people that I did the detailed analysis of in the third column, plus any other area of my life. So often food, finance, um, uh, long, uh, um, uh, looking after your home. There are lots of areas which won't necessarily come up in the resentment inventory, but this is a moral inventory of my whole life. And I tell you, I've had people where the resentments cover like one tenth of their life, but the real problems are over there. There's a gambling problem. There's a food problem. There's a diet problem. There's an exercise problem. There's a caffeine problem. There's an energy drink problem. There's a someone going to psychics and spending 400 pounds a month with like those those like sky psychics um, phone lines. All sorts of weird stuff that will not come out of the woodwork unless you say, honey, you want to look at your whole life, not just the people you resent, because that's where the inventory lies. Um, we'll cover fear and sex, both distasteful subjects next week, but I'm going to stop there for now and, and ask Alistair if you would to, to open it up for questions. Thank you, Tim. Um... Thank you very much. That was very helpful. Um, uh, the meeting is now open for questions for Tim, uh, which can be done by raised hand function in Zoom, or you can message me through the chat function and I will ask Tim directly. Uh, if all else fails, just wave at me violently uh, on the screen and I'll, uh, I'll, I'll uh, uh, yeah, I'll hand it over to you to ask your question. And uh, we'll, we'll try and close on the hour. Well, I'm, uh, we might be a little bit longer. Anyway, anyway, any questions? Uh, Amara, you have a question. And then, uh, Karen. Okay, thank, okay, thank you. Um, Tim, I was wondering, for the fear part in the fourth column, do you encourage your um, the people you're working with to go back to the third column and to connect all the fears that arise out of the like demands from the seven areas of self? Uh, that's, a, that's a good question. Um, I, I don't find people have a problem with that question usually. I, I think it, it usually works out in a very straightforward way. So um, 
what I get people to look at, well, first of all, there are two sources of, of the fear question. First of all, it's those relationships. Um, uh, secondly, um, it's, it's those, the, the areas of life not covered by resentment. And I just get people to, I, I, and this is all I do myself, is to imagine myself in that situation and say, well, what, what, are the, what, what fears are floating around in my mind when I consider that situation? I find pe it, things just float to the surface pretty naturally. It's not an analytical exercise. It's, I think it's, a, it's a being sensitive to what is going on inside. It, it's little fears which are like crawling around under the carpet. It's lifting up the carpet, but you can kind of see where they are. So I think it's you don't get there by analysis. You get there by sensing the bits that you're you just simply by sensing the fear, which is why you have to be emotionally connected to do the step four, because fear, because the emotions are the way in. Which is why anything, any addictive process which is active will put the kibosh on the whole thing because it stops you from being connected to the emotions which are the way into the information. Does, does that answer your question, Amara? Well, um, yeah, I, I, was also, I was kind of thinking about how um, fear is in parentheses in the third column. Yeah. You know, like, and, and do you draw the person who you're working with their attention to that at any point, you know, during it? Or you, is it just like, whatever's not covered will be covered in the actual fear inventory and you don't make too big of a deal? I no, I don't. I don't make. I don't make too big a, a deal of it. Um, I, I honestly, I don't think I've ever had anyone struggle to come up with the fears. I, I maybe people who who sponsor a lot of of very sort of mask straight men may have different experiences, but I mean, I'm you know mostly sponsoring the you know the ladies and the pansies, so we're we're all. Oh! about everything anyway <laughs> and the sensitive men you know like the ones who are going to have trouble getting in touch with their fear like i am that the, boy are they going to avoid me so uh, i i'm not the best person to ask about how to wheedle fears out of people because no no they're in a different room talking about something else Thanks, Tim. Uh, Karen, you want to say something? Thank you. And thank you, Alistair, for, for hosting this meeting. Tim, I don't have a question right now, but I have a comment and a great big thank you. Uh, someone that I am uh, relatively close to, uh, who is always on my fourth step list, that should have been the first clue. Um, you, you brought something to mind and made it so huge for me. And, and I just have to give you oodles of gratitude for that. It was like, I've been seeing it like as a small ad in a, in a paperback and it's, it's been blinking. And what you did is, is you made it this flashing billboard that really got my attention. And, and I was able to just absolutely through the way you discussed this and, and took us through it was able to see exactly what's going on so clearly that I hadn't been able to see before because I was so involved in the in the in the little print so thank you very much I'm very grateful for that thanks Karen uh, Angus you had a question then Sarah if go after Angus yeah thanks uh, I hope you can hear me um, how would you get? How do you set up the second part of the, the 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 bit after the resentment you talked about? So, like, say I've got a problem, I can't clean my bathroom, or my house is in disarray, and that's what I need to do a moral inventory on. How would you set that up? I'm a bit a bit unclear of what what you'd put down, and then you'd how you'd begin to analyze that. Right. So, so, so with the with the other areas, first of all, I get people to write a list of areas of your life categories of relationship like sponsees colleagues family members neighbors whatever uh and then activities uh and some there may be nothing there it may be tickety-boo but others 
I think those eight questions are amazing because basically if you answered what are my mistakes entirely accurately, that would be your entire inventory. But that question doesn't always elicit everything it's intended to, which is why you've got seven more questions to catch it. It's like seven nets to catch the sort of falling debris. So those eight questions, they all come at the same thing from different angles. And I, I mean, let, let's take the area. If I just take the area of, of food, what are my mistakes? Um, I, I don't know about you, but I know straight away. If you ask me, what are my mistakes around food? I know. <laughs> what am I frightened of? I know. I'm frightened of being fat and weird looking and ugly. And what am I frightened of? Not having enough. I'm frightened of that, that, that if I don't enjoy the food now, there won't be any more later or I'll spend the rest of the evening unable to concentrate because I won't be full. And I mean, I mean, I'm just not I'm not quite right around food, as you can tell. But you scratch you, you. It's not deep below the surface, this stuff. Um, but so so but those eight questions, I just you get people to answer them. Uh, as honestly as they can, I think. But I think there's an important thing. There's an important thing here. Um, uh, the uh, it says somewhere in step four that nothing, nothing counted but honesty and thoroughness, which means I get to ask the questions that are there. Those eight questions about each area of my life. I get to ask those questions, and then honesty is admitting to myself when something pops into my mind and then writing it down. Sometimes you ask a question and you don't get much in the way of an answer, but whatever you get is enough to be going on with and you've got the rest of your life to sort out the detail. All you need from this step four is an, a basically a general overview of what is going wrong and enough things to work on for the next five years. And I bet if any of us now got a piece of paper and said to our higher powers, what are the 10 things in my life that needed to need to change in beliefs, thinking or behavior? I bet within five minutes we would have enough material to work on for the next 10 years. So there's never any fear about not uncovering enough material to work on. That's not the problem here. Uh, and you, I just trust the questions because I think the questions do the business here. Thanks, Tim. Uh, Sarah Rivka. Um, hi, thanks, Tim. And um, yeah, I have, uh, okay, a comment and a question. So my comment is that um, we resolutely looked for our own mistakes I have heard that that's a rhetorical question because then the, it's answered. My mistakes were that I was selfish, dishonest, self-seeking, and frightened. Okay, so that's a comment. And then my question is, I've, I've, I've experienced two different approaches in terms of sponsorship um, with the fear. One approach is that the person writes down, I have a fear of spiders. And you say, okay, and you let that go. And then when they get to the fear inventory, um, they figure that out. And the other approach is to ask why. Why are you afraid of spiders? Well, they might bite me. And then why? But what's the problem with that? Well, then I might die. Because most things um, boil down to a fear of death or a fear of, of being alone or, or some abandonment or whatever. Anyway, so I was just wondering if you let people just write, you know, the spider, or if you make them like take that to the logical conclusion? That's, that's a good point and a good question. On, on the first point, um, if you go to 10 different big book studies or 10 different big book groups, each one will do it differently and think that it's got the right way. It's like, you know, all of these weird churches in New England in the 17th century, each one of which thinks it's going to found the New Jerusalem and, and the the same thing seems to happen in AA. So uh, I think it, exactly how people construe the book is entirely down to them. I don't think there's a right way or a wrong way. There's the way I'm currently doing things and that's it. But I think the differences don't make 
any difference in terms of outcome. I think what makes the difference in terms of outcome is sincerity and speed. Uh, if you're sincere and you do it fairly quickly, um, like my part of it is 1%, 99% of it is God. So, you know, if the 1% isn't quite right, I think God can handle the rest. Um, on the fear thing, um, yeah, with the, we asked that the, I don't get them to analyze the fears in the fourth column because we've got the fear inventory to do that whole thing. But you've, you've hit the nail on the head. We asked ourselves why we had them. And there are, there are, I, I don't want to sort of preempt too much, but basically the two ways of doing that, because you brought it up, I'm going to mention it. The two ways of doing that is my friend Eamon says, we asked ourselves why we had them. What in my childhood established that as a fearful thing in the first place? That's a very interesting question. Or if this happens, what would happen next? If that happens, what would happen next? So you imagine it like a line of dominoes, the things that you're frightened of on the surface of the first domino, if that first domino falls, what other dominoes fall? And the last domino to fall is the core fear. Um, but honestly, again, uh, ultimately with resentment, it doesn't matter how you get, how you analyze it. At some point, you've got to forgive the buggers and get on with your day. And with fear, However you analyze it, at some point, you've got to let go. You can either analyze it for 20 years and then let go. You can let go now. Uh, but the letting go is the same either way. So um, although I like to do this thoroughly and carefully, I'm always bearing in mind it's really, um, it's really ultimately because this whole process opens a door to God who then floods through your life and clears, clears out all the crap in ways that you couldn't have analyzed your way towards. I don't know if that makes any sense or helps, but there it is. Thanks, Tim. We are running a little bit over time. I hope, is that okay, Tim? Yep. Uh, Claire, you have a question. Yeah, thank you, Tim. Uh, actually, just a quick comment and then a question. I, I think I was just thinking now, I've never had a sponsee who could accurately pin down what was a fear, but just the very process of asking that question again and again to, to show that their resentment has to do with fear has, has almost been enough. But um, just my question is, in if in the second column there is five charges um, and they seem to be somewhat unrelated to one another, when I'm going through then with the third column, and it's it's asking those questions. What is the demand um, and the outcomes? I sometimes get muddled about which uh, charge these subsequent questions are addressing. And OK, wonder... that's a that's a good point. OK, so sometimes, particularly when it's close relationships like spouses and, and so on or, or co work colleagues or flatmates, then there's just there's a whole well, pardon my French, a shit show in the second column. Um, if you've got five unrelated scenarios, then you want to look at the third column questions, which of the seven areas were affected and how individually for each one. You don't bundle them together because it makes no sense. Sometimes, um, uh, particularly with, with intimate relationships, um, Although that's a that's a sort of bad term because the so-called intimate relationships are usually the relationships in which there is the least intimacy. There's warfare, but there's no actual intimacy. Anyway, intimate relationships. The second column, sometimes uh, the best way to come at it is to look at the relationship as a whole. And this is actually true with spouses, with siblings, with parents, um, the it's not about the surface situation it's about this ideal for what the relationship should look like in general so if it if you if you're looking at lots of different practical scenarios you you look at the third column separately for each one if you're looking at a kind of complex entangled intense relationship and what you got in the second column is just four out of five thousand examples of general kind of crap personal interactions you really want to leap past that and do the whole third column just on the relationship you know ideally how would i like my mother to behave if my mother behaved in a certain way how would that affect my finances how what do i think my mother thinks of me how would i like my mother to think of me just go straight to the nub of it does that make sense claire thanks tim um i uh, ask a quick question um 
have you had a situation with the sponsee where uh, the sponsor is convinced that the resentment itself or the, the, the you know, column one is at a, at a situation rather than the, uh, you mentioned situations and the people involved in that situation. The, the, well, he seems convinced that this, these, the resentment is at the situation rather than the people. Yeah, it, it can happen. I don't worry. I, I don't get too technical about that. Um, um, I mean, I, I had a, a, a kind of a funky week last week uh, in various ways. And my um, uh, I had eight resentments. Um, and as I counted them, I had eight resentments and eight, none of them were against individual people four were against categories of people in society i'm not going to name names but we all know who they are four were against categories of people in society the other four were against trends and practices in the industry i work in so it can't really be like the first column i can't really pin it down there isn't like george or susan or clive who's doing this thing it's what matters is i think the second column getting it clear what is the what what is going on in the actual material world which is bothering me let's try and reduce that to a few words who's behind that in the first column who knows could be forces of nature. It could be, it could be all sorts of things. But it's getting cl- what we're interested in is making a distinction in the second column. What are the events, situations, words, actions in the material world? Third column is all of my internal stuff. And to learn for the first time in your life that there is a distinction between these two things. That that they're not all rolled up into one ball. That you can take any emotional upset and divide it into a the external trigger, and B, my response. So as long as you can accurately describe the situation that is happening out there, even if it's like a group of people or an, the way an industry operates, that's sufficient. It doesn't need to be boiled down to a name. Uh, I don't think there's any more questions. So we'll, um, um, I will start closing up the meeting, actually. Um, Um, to set the tone for this uh, meeting, I, um, I actually haven't picked a reading for today, but I'd like to um, suggest we open with the uh, serenity prayer in the uh, we form, if you would like to join me. God, grant us the serenity to accept, to accept the things we, we can't change, courage, courage to change the things we can, and the wisdom to, wisdom to know the difference. difference. Thank you. Uh, The topic of tonight's meeting is Working Step 4 with a Sponsee Part 2, and we're on to uh, Fear and Sex Part Inventory. And Tim will share anything between 30 and 45 minutes on the topic, after which the floor will be open for questions rather than the typical sharing. Uh, And with that, I will now hand over to Tim. Right, so I'm just going to share the screen, or a screen. There we go. Hopefully the big book has appeared in front of you. And we're on page 67. So I think we've we've finished the resentment inventory, haven't we, Alistair? Yeah, okay. So the the fear inventory, I'm not going to read out all of this, um, but look at the practical side of things. So we review our fears thoroughly. So what we do here, um, we've already listed a whole bunch of fears in uh, one of the answers, uh, in the answers to one of the page 67 questions. So you can take the fears from there and just transfer them onto a new sheet of paper and then brainstorm. In other words, say, what am I frightened of? And I, I find when I do this, so I suggest this to other people. In half an hour, you can really come up with everything. If you really scour your mind and something doesn't come up in the first half hour, it's not important. Um, One of the important things, and this is a a good point with uh, 
step four generally. I think uh, a lot of people in AA, I think, have got obsessive compulsive disorder and express that in how they work the program. And so there's this, this notion that it has to be sort of thoroughly exhaustive. The point here, we're going to be getting rid of fear completely or, or at least starting to grow out of it. Uh, and so all of the tiny minutiae are not are neither here nor there. What we all we want to get a sense of here is the fact there is a whole load of fears, and people normally don't have much trouble getting a handle on uh, the fact there is a whole load of fears there. Um, so you you've got a list from your page 67 questions, you brainstorm to complete it. Then there's a simple question. We asked ourselves why we had them. Now, the great thing about this instruction is that we don't need to uh, uh, really come up with an answer ourselves because he gives us the answer in the next time. Wasn't it because self-reliance failed us? Now, you could just let it go at that. Uh, and, and start to examine, as I will do in a moment, what it means to say that self-reliance failed us. But what I found useful in unpacking my own fears, so I help sponsees do this, is to, to when you're frightened of something, it's very rarely the thing itself you're actually frightened of. It is uh, what lies behind it. In other words, uh, uh, the, if you tip a if you flick a domino over in a line of dominoes, one by one, all of the other dominoes topple until the last domino falls and then the domino toppling ceases. And we're after what the final domino is. Um, and the, the, I sort of hate to give you a spoiler here, but I think the spoiler, it, it, it almost always boils down to feeling bad, basically feeling bad because you're lonely, feeling bad because you're worthless, feeling bad because you've wasted your life. Uh, the, the fact of emotional pain itself, the fact of um, physical pain, the fact of death, there's not really a great number of these and everything boils down to one of those. So if you're frightened of being criticised at work, why? Because I might lose my job. Well, so what? Well, I wouldn't have any money. So what? Well, I'd I wouldn't have enough to live. So what? I'd be I'd have physical pain. I'd have inconvenience. Um, uh, what else? I, I would be thought of as a failure by others. Therefore, I'd think of myself as a failure. And if, as soon as you get to the thing which is bad in itself, you found the last one. And people normally come up with a list of somewhere between four and uh, ten of these. Um, the point of that exercise I explain to people is that you want to see that although it looks as though you're scared of 47,000 things, if you can, uh, uh, if you can capture the idea, capture lots and lots of different fears in single ideas, like I'm frightened of being a failure, I'm frightened of physical pain, I'm frightened of emotional pain, you discover you don't have 47,000 fears, you've got seven or four and that's suddenly immediately easier to deal with because well first of all you know the nature of the beast when you're frightened of 47,000 different things in your life it feels like your your it, it it it's like helm's deep being overrun in the two towers it's it's it, you know the orcs are everywhere and there are more coming whereas if you've got if you if you manage to corner the four you know, the, the four main culprits or the five main culprits, you've got a chance of doing something about it. And I mentioned this, wasn't it because self-reliance failed us? Now, this is a terribly important line. Um, Bill doesn't um, put this line up for discussion or debate. He states it as a fact in the form of a rhetorical question to which the only acceptable answer is, yes, of course it is, Bill. <laughs> That's the only possible reason. And so I think one has to proceed as one does in contract law on the basis of good faith. You, you, you proceed assuming that Bill is writing in good faith and that what he says is true. Um, uh, so 
we've got to find an understanding of, wasn't it because self-reliance failed us, which is true for all fears and not just some of them. Otherwise, it's no good. It's no good having an explanation for some of them. Now, um, very clearly, if you've got a person that refused, as I did when I was younger, I refused to accept help. Because if you helped me do something, the resultant achievement was not attributable to me. It was attributable in part to your help. And the only reason for doing anything was to be impressive. So I mustn't be helped by anyone or I'm defeating the purpose, which is to be impressive through my own efforts. Uh, and of course, if you refuse to be helped, your results will be terrible because you're having to reinvent things which other people are succeeding at because they're willing to be helped and guided. And it's pretty clear if you, if you try and make all of your decisions in your life without any guidance, you're going to make some pretty crappy decisions. Terrible things will happen and you're going to be frightened because you're not so stupid as to believe that the same things are not going to continue happening. If you, if you keep having catastrophe after catastrophe, it makes sense that you're going to continue having catastrophes. So fear is an obvious consequence of relying on yourself in the sense of not, um, uh, not accepting help or guidance from others. But, but there are all sorts of situations where you, you're a good boy or a good girl and you keep your nose clean and you do everything right and you manage your affairs in an accomplished, effective, efficient, harmonious way. And yet still the world can get you. Disease can strike tragedy can strike all sorts of things can happen and one I, I certainly most of my fears are around security they're not around ambition they used to be around ambition and pride uh, now that they're, they're if I have them they're about security and there is no way you can be effective enough to secure yourself against any possible event in the world as my as my best friend reminds me on a regular basis if the sun decides to emit a major gamma ray burst then we're all toast anyway in a matter of seconds um you, you can't stop the fact that universe is expanding and is at some point going to reach absolute uh, something near to absolute zero spread with everything spread out at, 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 at infinite distances from everything else before the whole thing collapses uh, there's a Woody Allen film where a kid, seven-year-old kid, refuses to do his homework because he discovers that the universe is endlessly expanding. And he finds it such a depressing notion that he, uh, his, his whole life is, is, is rendered impossible. So being, being a comp and, and, and this is, I think, the big mistake that people make. I certainly made it. And most people, I think, make it in the first few years in AA of using the program to become competent and effective and accomplished in order to keep the wolves at bay like if if i handle life successfully enough i will get rid of fear of course it it doesn't work i uh, i mean i've been and i've met people who are you know married and comfortable and have a good income and you know you make a whole list and still you wake up in the morning frightened so it's very clear that sorting your life out doesn't get rid of fear. However well you're relying, even if you're relying on God and other people, there is something else going on here. And I, I alluded, I may have covered it briefly last week, but I'll reiterate, reiterate it because I think it's important. What is self? Well, this my sponsor talks about self with a capital S, which is who we really are which is extensions of spirit. So if God is the source, we are the extensions of that. And, and being spirit, we are non-corporeal. Uh, we are consciousness. Uh, we are love. We cannot be hurt in the material realm, but we happen to be inhabiting physical bodies for the time being uh, with a role to perform, which is given to us by the higher power, not which we have derived ourselves. What is self? The book on page ooh, 61 equates the word self with ego. Now, I'm not going to I don't think we want to talk about ego in the Freudian sense, because that's different. But ego in the spiritual sense, uh, either Eckhart Tolle, Eckhart Tolle, uh, I think it's he who describes it thus. Uh, ego is false mind made images of self, false 
mind made images of self. So there's any concept of me which is something other than spirit. Now, what could that be? It could be a, a identification with, so it's basically self, which is the problem, is when I identify myself with my physical form, the circumstances of my life, my virtues or defects, my accomplishments and failures, my popularity or lack thereof, who I construe myself to be as I discern it in other people's reaction to me. Uh, I'm in a hundred things outside of myself. A friend of mine made amends to a girl for pouring vinegar on her sofa and then drinking her champagne, which she kept for a special occasion. Um, and the girl said with regard to the vinegar on the sofa and with regard to the champagne, I can't believe you did that to me. And what really struck me, it's a perfectly ordinary turn of phrase, I can't believe you did that to me. Whereas what's very illustrative is that those actions were not done to her, they were done to her sofa and to her bottle of champagne. So in order to say you did that to me, you've got to have confused yourself. You've literally confused yourself with a sofa. You see the sofa, you think it's you. So if someone comes along and does something to the sofa, they've done something to you. This is a state of profound confusion. Yet which of us, when we get some sort of splash of spaghetti sauce on our white shirt, doesn't feel embarrassed? Or what a fool that we look. People are looking at us. No, they're not looking at you. They're looking at the splatter on your shirt and you think it's you. Or if the splatter is further down, it's even more embarrassing. Um, so the, the, the problem, if I rely for my identity, my value and my purpose on anything outside myself, in other words, anything in the world, I'm going to be frightened because the world is volatile and unpredictable and mercurial and dangerous. So the only way to be rid of fear is to be rid of self, in other words, to be rid of this false mind made image of self which means i still get to have all of those things i still get to have a job and a inverticom's career and a house and family and people and so on but i cease to be identified with those so although i would prefer not to lose them if anything is lost so be it i'm fine like if you lose your mobile phone your ability to communicate is not diminished by that. It's just inconvenienced. And there's a big difference between the two. Um, so that, that's how I take people through the, the, the fear inventory. It, the, the, about 5% of the benefit comes from writing it. And about 95% comes from trying to understand that line. Wasn't it because self-reliance failed us? Uh, now to the fear solution. And just with the... As with resentment, when we looked at resentment, we use that as a springboard for the solution. So it's terribly important. A lot of people in AA write about resentment. So often you, you, you know, someone will phone you, Clive will phone you up and, and so oh, I've got a terrible resentment. And you say, well, what are you doing about it? So, well, I've written about it as though the mere fact of writing about it is supposed to eliminate it. And of course it doesn't. It, it, it may go some way, but it's the spiritual actions on the top of page 67 which eliminate the resentment and it's the same with fear and uh, it's got some ideas here which pretty much speak for themselves but we've got an instruction here um uh they trust their god that's an instruction uh what does that mean that means uh i trust uh, uh, in the the notions that I spoke about before, which is that if I'm an extension of spirit, I'm perfectly safe. I'm, I'm kept safe by God. We ask him to remove our fear and direct our attention to what he would have us be. And what I get people to do, well, which is what I do myself, is simply to uh, take the thing that I'm frightened of in the world or the situation, usually a situation, it's best to do this on situations and say, right, God, what would you have me do in this situation? What would you have? What would you have my attitude be? What would you have my actions be? And as soon as I flip to consciously, deliberately adopting and reinforcing 
the corrective attitude and I throw myself wholeheartedly into the corrective behavior, my experience is the fear starts to go. Um, I'm sure you've had sponsees who are, oh, I don't know, uh, one, two, five, 10, 15, 20 or 30 years sober who phone you up very plaintively saying, well, I'm full of resentment and I'm full of fear. As though, as though the individual is a sort of great big vase or, 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 a, or a, a punch bowl into which some unkind soul has, has poured this sort of viscous liquid of resentment and fear such that one is now full of it. I'm now full of it. The truth is, I'm the one that's doing it. The, the actual AA programme we get to practice in terms of solutions, starts on page 63. By page 68, middle of page 68, which is, uh, what, four and a half pages in, it has given us a total and adequate and sufficient solution, both to resentment and to fear. So from this point onwards, I'm now given back a choice as to whether I let resentment and fear into my life. Resent the temptation to think resentful thoughts, to think fearful thoughts, to engage in either. The temptation will keep coming because the ego is pre-installed. It's factory installed software. You can't get rid of it off the hard drive. Uh, it's going to it's like McAfee. It throws up, you know, those. Have you done this? Have you done that? What about doing it? You know, it, it's going to send you suggestions the whole time. But it's, I'm the one that's responsible for whether or not I pick up on that. So it's, it's very important not to, I think, not to view oneself as a victim of, of resentment and fear, um, not letting them in and then expelling them if one accidentally lets them in. Uh, of course, that happens like vampires. You know, we, we you uh vampire knocks on the door they seem so charming and within a few minutes you know they've been let in they're biting your neck someone went to a therapist and told them about a situation that the therapist said didn't you see the red flags and the person says oh yes i did i thought it was a carnival so there are times when one accidentally um uh, gives in to the temptation to either resent or fear of course i still do it so the question is not, oh, my God, I've got a new resentment. I have a new fear. I don't know what to do. It's the same resentment and fear as before. It's just wearing a new hat and it's, it's got different wonky makeup. That's all that's going on. It's the same solution. My job is simply to practice it. So what I want to impress on people at this point in the program is they now have a solution to resentment. They now have a solution to fear. It's simply a matter of getting muscular in implementing these solutions uh now about sex um uh, i'll get to the end of the sort of presentation -y stuff um and then uh we'll do the, the questions on the remainder of step four um so this is obviously the most distasteful of the three <laughs> inventories so far um uh I, and i said but actually i think it's the most straightforward of the three um uh we've reviewed our own conduct so we're not interested in internal narrative or or, or analysis or anything like that we're interested in behavior only from a practical point of view i get people to write a list of people they've had relationships with um at STD clinics, sometimes they have a form for you to fill out. It's how many partners have you had since your last visit? And it's like naught, one, two, three to five, six to ten, eleven to a hundred, a hundred and one to a thousand, more than a thousand. <laughs> so sometimes people have, have got um, a lot of time on their hands and get up to a lot of mischief. Now, People obviously very um, uh, alarmed at this point that they're going to have to rehash the gory details of, of, of endless um, ex escapades. Uh, now, of, of course, the major relationships need to be looked at individually, although the you know, boss level hack is they're probably all the same. 
in terms of conduct. People's playbook usually doesn't vary very much unless you're extending over a very long period of time. But then, you know, to, to, to bundle together the one night stands, to bundle together the colleagues you've uh, mistakenly flirted with, uh, the people whose sexual advances you have rebuffed, um, how you behave in terms of how you look at people in public. You can, you can group uh, the behavior under categories so that there aren't that many things to write about. And this is simply, this is a, a good straightforward in inventory. Where have we been selfish? That's where I put my interests ahead of someone else's. Dishonest. That's outright uh, uh, deceit, telling lies, misrepresentation, omission or delusion or inconsiderate, a, a outright failure to consider someone else's interests. Who would we hurt? Um, did we unjustifiably arouse jealousy, suspicion, or bitterness? That's interesting. The reason it's unjustifiably is because uh, there are times when innocent action will arouse jealousy, suspicion, and bitterness in people who, before we met them, were already jealous, suspicious, and bitter, and are and and so the, the, a typical thing is when someone you know goes to AA meetings and their other half comes back sort of um, sniffing their collars to see who they've been uh, cavorting with at the AA meeting. So we're interested in unjustifiable arousing of those things. Where were we at fault? What should we have done instead? If you don't know what you should have done instead, wait till you finish the step four, deal with that in the step five. So if people can't figure it out, that's fine. Most people can't. So if the po an important point with step four, nothing counter but honesty and thoroughness, which means, you know, accuracy and lots of other wonderful qualities. Well, if you can make it accurate, great. But if you if 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 it's the best you can come up with, that's OK, too which I think is an interesting take. My job is to systematically ask myself a bunch of questions and having asked the questions and listened quietly to the answers that my own mind gives me, writing them down. If you ask the questions, you sit quietly, you listen for the answers, you write them down, you've done a good job. Even if it's a dog, even if it's actually a dog's dinner, you've done your part. Yeah, you can spend the rest of your life getting it kind of accurate and neat and tidy and categorized and alphabetized and the Harvard outline. You don't need to do that at this point. The main job here is to be thorough and accurate. Now, the next bit is the uh, uh, we're really hitting gold here. In this way, we try to shape a sane and sound ideal for our future sex life. We subjected each relation to this test. Was it selfish or not? And, and here's the key. We asked God to mold our ideals for what attitudes and actions or beliefs, thinking and actions. Sometimes attitudes and actions, AA, is the simplest way of doing it. Um, uh, we asked God to mold our ideals and help us live up to them. We remembered always that our sex powers were God given and therefore good, neither to be used lightly or selfishly, nor to be despised or loathed. Um, and then it talks about a very interesting, a couple of interesting points. Um, whatever our ideal turns out to be, we must be willing to go toward it. And then in treating, in other words, we treat sex as we would any other problem. Now, it hasn't told you in the book so far, this is how you handle a problem. But now it tells you how to handle sex. Is it, oh, by the way, in other words, we treat sex as we would any other problem. In other words, you can reverse engineer this and say, oh, oh, so this is how I handle a problem. I go to God. I ask God, what is my ideal here? What attitude should I adopt? What action should I take? I'm not going to get it right straight away, but I'm willing to grow towards it. And so uh, we're now, what are we, page 69. We're now six pages into the program and we have an adequate, sufficient and complete solution. A, to resentment. B, to fear. Three, to problems. We're six pages in and there is never any need to ever really have a resentment, a persistent resentment, fear or problem again. Six pages in. 
it's 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 not hiding this anywhere and it's impo- uh, the reason I, I'm harping on about that is because uh, the ego casts a sort of spell of amnesia. I don't know if you've ever been in a conversation with a sponsee where you explain something very carefully and then 30 seconds later they say something and they understand it. They totally get it. 30 seconds later they sh- they say something to indicate that the, de- the, the information has already been deleted. Just gone. It's just gone. And you're like, oh, my God, you've totally circled back to the original problem. And it's like nothing has been said. So whilst you're like building structures, the ego is on the other side of the structure. Whilst you're putting bricks and mortar, the ego is on the other side with this little team of of munchkins. Um, No disrespect to small people. I'm pretty small myself. The, the The ego's munchkins are on the other side, hacking away at the mortar, removing the bricks. And so unless you're working really hard at this, your ego is just going to delete everything that you're learning. You've really got to work hard to keep the structures that are being built in place. And now I was like this at many years, sober, not just basically forgetting I already have a solution to resentment. I already have a solution to fear. I literally already have a solution to problems. Now, exactly what the ideal is in a situation, that's different. That can be complex sometimes. But the basic structure is there. Write this down somewhere useful. A, fr- a, a, a friend of mine in AA used to write everything on post-it notes, and they were around his whole flat in the bathroom, in the kitchen, just reminding him to do basic things because of the ego's perpetual deletion mechanism. Um, What else is it important to um, talk about here? I I, I mean, one could talk endlessly about those. I think those are the basic instructions I give people for the step step four. Uh, The last thing I'd say um, is, uh, this is a very important line, on 71. If you have already made a decision and an inventory of your grosser handicaps, whatever they are, you have made a good, <laughs> some are grosser than others, you have made a good beginning. And I think this is really good evidence that they didn't want you to take four years doing this and to have ring binders full of material. You want to get a basic handle on what the problem is so you can get it out in step five. Um, and Step five is going to be the next topic. I've got a couple of corkers, but I'm going to I'm going to leave them for then. So I'm going to stop there on the presentation side of things. Um, Alistair, would you like to field some questions? I'll now open the meeting up for questions, which can be done by raised hand function in Zoom, or you can message me through the chat function. And I will ask Tim directly. If all else fails, please uh, wave your hand um, at the camera, and I will try to come to you. And um, yeah, with that, oh, there's, yeah. James has a question already. Thanks, Alistair. Thank you, Tim, uh, for that presentation. It was great uh, to hear you. And the thing that struck me when you were talking about uh, at the beginning um, of of the meeting, when you were explaining this idea that we are spirit, we are not physical beings, uh, we have we, we are not our body, but we um begin to realize that uh we have a body but we're not a body that we're not uh that our identity has been in the physical world in the material world and what the book is beginning to or is explaining to us is that actually we are spiritual beings and my question is this i've had experiences why i've gone through the process with um with a person and they maybe will look at this and I'll try to discuss this with them. And I kind of, they just don't understand what I'm talking, or they just look at me blankly, or they'll say yes, and then just change the subject. And we'll go back to it. And I think the reason I'm asking this is because for for me, and for probably, I think for quite a lot of people, it's quite a revolutionary concept. It's a pretty different way of looking at reality from when we're drinking. And my question is, do you think it's useful to suggest things like Eckhart Tolle or to uh, or other spiritual literature to help people 
begin to realise this? Or do you think it's best to just keep going through the process? And, re- and like you said later on in, the, in your presentation, we need to remind ourselves of these things because the ego just will just, will just forget them. That's it. Those are, there are lots of questions in there. <laughs> so I'll deal with them systematically if I can. So first of all, to see things differently, you've got to want to see things differently. If you don't want to see things differently, you're not going to, you're going to resist. Why would someone, and so the question is, uh, with the willingness side of things to see things differently, um, there's a there's a little basic set of corrective measures you can apply. Um, so you, you say to the person, do you like how you feel? Well, no, I don't like how I feel. Okay, good. We've got that one sorted. So you don't like how you feel. Is it safe to say that how you feel is coming from how you view the world? Because, well, other people see the same world in a different way and feel differently. So, so yes, it's it's um, people can usually are usually down with that. They 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 can usually come up with some examples of situations where different people look at the same situation in a different way and have a different experience of it um you know you know when you go to a a hotel and you have a lovely time and then you read the hotel reviews afterwards and you wouldn't recognize the hotel from the description or the other way around you have a terrible experience and all these wonderful reviews so if you can establish that uh, the way the person feels, the way I feel is to do with the way I'm looking at things, you don't go, well, look at it like this instead. No, you have to go there bit by bit. You say, first of all, wouldn't it be to your advantage to look at things differently? Wouldn't you want to look at I, I'm not saying you're willing to look at things differently, but don't you kind of hope you could look at this differently? I mean, because you might be happier then. <laughs> Do you want to be happy? Do you remember you said you wanted to be happy? Do you still want to be happy? So you gradually edge towards it. And then you say, well, do you think maybe there is a different way of looking at this? And then maybe you do want to have that. Do you actually want that different way of looking at things? And then what can you hurt? What could it hurt to ask? how to look at this differently. And then when it's presented, well, how about you just try it for a while? Try looking at things differently for a while and see what results you get. So you don't, with these ideas, you don't analyze them. As as Earl Purdy says, analyze is anal lies. You you don't want to, I know, sorry about that. I don't know if you've had your tea yet. Uh, But you don't want to analyze the ideas. You want to see if the ideas are understood in principle. Because often these spiritual ideas, although they're radical, they're actually remarkably simple. Uh, They're just unwelcome. Make a distinction between that which is not understood and that which is not welcome. Now, To move from having this sort of theoretical understanding to lived experience, you've got to then do it. If you described um, France to someone who has never been to France, there is no way you could adequately describe it. You've actually got to go to France to experience what Parisians are like, to actually, (laughs) if ever you've been to or lived in Paris, you'll know what I mean by that. Um, I say that having a Parisian side of the family, uh, needless to say. Um, But the point is, you can describe something to your heart's content, but the person won't understand it until they experience it. So trying to get it fully understood before they apply is not going to work. Do you understand the idea? Uh, There are ways into this idea that you are not your body. um, That you are you, you go in via the notion of consciousness. So you look at the fact that you get someone, for instance, to sit for a few minutes and just ob- observe their thoughts from the outside, the thoughts that their mind throws at them from the outside. And so, so 
you say, okay, so you, you're now describing the thoughts that you've just had and the experience you had of having those thoughts. So who is the you that is observing the thoughts? It can't be the thought. There's something else going on here. You look at the fact that, uh, and this, the, the triple notion of identity, value, and purpose. Who are you? How much are you worth? Uh, and what's your purpose? Um, the value thing is a good way. Uh, that's usually the most, the, the simplest way in is it's very common for people to, to report having low self-worth uh, or, or to report their, their opinion that other people are of inferior worth one way or another. And then you get, and this example always works. You give them an example, you know, when you're out and about and you see a little, little class of primary school children being sort of led and shepherded on some sort of expedition somewhere with their little jerkins all holding hands. And that it's always completely delightful up to a certain age, of course, after that age, it becomes obnoxious. But so, so yeah, up to this is why I say primary school to children, not 15 year olds. So, you know, when they're four, five, six, seven. And you say to the person, well, do you think those children each have a different worth? Or do you think they're all of infinite worth? Do you think they're all infinitely valuable? And everyone, I've never met anyone that has a problem with that idea that all of those little children are of infinite worth, that to lose one of them would be an appalling tragedy and that you couldn't choose between them. They're all, they're all extraordinary, wonderful creatures. Um, and you say, well, so you know the truth already. You just don't want to apply it universally. You're fine to apply it to, to, to children and maybe kittens or puppies or, or, or what are those South American capybaras. But you're just not you're not happy to do that with people that vote differently than you. OK, so so that what we've established is you already know the truth. You're just applying it inconsistently. As for getting different angles, you have to remember in early AA, they said um, they didn't have the big book in the first four years uh, and even after that yes they used the big book but boy did they use a whole load of other spiritual resources it was basically you're buying up uh you're you're, you're buying in to uh a way of living which is number one spirit as it says in the doctor's opinion spiritual and altruistic now you can't impose someone's spirituality on them but you can you can legitimately say you need to do some exploring buster you, you know, if you're a novice in this area, you need to put some time in, read some stuff, listen to some stuff, read some, uh, 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 watch some stuff, see what, investigate, you know, if you've got a, a little bit of religion in the past, maybe investigate that religion, investigate another religion, go to the local Buddhist center. Uh, and most people, if they start down that path, pretty soon, it, the, 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 these ideas the notion of alien ideas which are actually helpful becomes acceptable pretty quickly. But it's, it all goes back to that original willingness. If people are willing to look at things differently, then frankly, they'll swallow anything. <laughs> um, so there we go. Does that answer your question, James? Yes, thank you. Hey everyone, I'm Harry, I'm an alcoholic. Thanks, Tim, and thanks, James, for that question. Is it maybe some, this is kind of a counterpoint to what James just said, or extension. Um, so the, the, the most, I've taken a few people through step four now, and the most persistently difficult thing about guiding someone through it for me is most of the people, most of the people I've taken through have some level of like, let's call it sophistication, right? So, and you said before, the, the difficulty with going through step four is not only are you doing the step four, you're also usually learning the step four while you're doing it. This makes it hard. One of the hardest things about... So I'm trying to get this under a concise question. My observation is that the difficulty in learning the technique is because people try to apply lots of pop psychology or psychology and therapy talk as we start to get into it. So the, the idea will come in that we need to be starting to peel away... They need to be starting to peel away layers of the onion... There'll also be other things about how we can't, this idea that we're selfish actually isn't very helpful at all because I've got such low self-esteem that we need, you know, I, we can't be doing this. So 
I think actually my, the core of my question is I'm, I'm always reluctant to try and persuade or convince people of things. Yeah. And so, but we, when I get into this part of the program, I'm like, they get stuck because they want to do it their way. <laughs> and um, I think there's enough questions. You're going to pick out some questions from that, Tim. Is that... <laughs> yeah. Nightmare. Okay. So one thing, okay, therapy. <laughs> let i don't know if we should turn off the recording for this maybe not um i hope i'm not going to say anything too controversial um the best the best advice i've ever heard given uh, as to what you say to a sponsee that is about to do therapy great go and do it and what we will do all the things you learn Bring them back here and we'll use them as information to plug into your step four and your step eight. So you're integrating the two, you're integrating the two things. Um, that covers most things, actually. So we'll take what you learn from therapy and we'll work the steps on it. How about that? Um, but where you have, you do have an occasional collision, and the low self worth one is a good example. Uh, uh, and this can take, a, I, I suppose there are two ways of coming at this. One way of coming at this, and sometimes you have to do this. You say, "Look, you're trying to, you're trying to adopt two systems for so, solving your whole life at once, and that's not going to work. You might want to pick one for now." So this the doing the steps for you know, six months just which is it takes if you do just do the steps and you really put your back into it you get up early on saturday and sunday you get up at 6 a.m you spend a few hours on step work you're done by 10 a.m you literally still have the whole day left but you've done four hours of step work you can get through it in three months that's not a huge sacrifice to put a pause on some other process frankly like you've been fucked up for 40 years another three months is not gonna another three months delay oh you're worried about that now or well, why didn't you go into therapy 30 years ago i mean, seriously now it's urgent um you can wait three months while you're doing this process and hopefully not die of alcoholism in the meantime or maybe go and do therapy and if it doesn't work come back here fine it's there's I, i'm not you know do whatever you want but try and do one thing. Don't try and ride two horses at once. If, if therapy is treated as a now one, a friend of mine, then this I thought was super valid. The way into the inventories is through emotion, resentment, fear, and the sex imagery, guilt and shame. If you can't feel anything because you've so successfully dissociated for a decade or two you know the last thing you can remember feeling was in the middle of the first gulf war that kind of thing then therapy can be super helpful in getting you in touch with your feelings so that you can even start to do the inventories in the first place um if you want, sometimes people go to therapy for a very, very specific detailed purpose about a particular event or situation. And that can be integrated very, very easily. I think the difficulty with therapy, and it's not because the therapy is wrong or bad, uh, quite, quite the reverse. But where the therapy is attempting to inculcate a worldview and belief system, that's where you have a problem because you're going to have a, because you're trying to adopt a new worldview and belief system with the program. You can't do two at once unless they, unless they're sort of interlocking like sort of, uh, Meccano pieces or something. And, and sometimes they are. Some, sometimes people go to a therapist who's like super spiritual, super 12 step people go to therapists who are course in miracles practitioners people go to therapists who are christian or, or rabbis who are therapists there are all sorts of things that people will do where it totally interlocks but sometimes people go to therapy and i've had friends who've been told this 
all the people in your life that upset you, you need to tell them what they're doing wrong to upset you. Now, that's a, that's a legitimate approach, except what results are you getting from doing that? How's that going down? Is that working out well for you? Is that improving your relationships? Maybe it does. Some people report that literally helps, but that's not been my experience. Um, with the, sometimes you have to resolve the collision. A good example is the selfishness and the low self-worth thing. Um, uh, with the with your Al, if if any of you are in Al Anon, I'm not going to out anyone. But if if any of you are uh, are in Al Anon and you have Al Anon sponsees, one of the big Al Anon brokennesses is, is, oh, don't. I mean, my mother is a good example. You know, how many how many French mothers does it take to change a light bulb? Oh, don't worry, you go out enjoy yourself with your friends. I'll sit here in the dark. Um, uh, the martyrdom. Like, uh, so not n not taking responsibility for yourself, neglecting yourself. And part of the solution is this dreaded word self-care. So actually doing, as a, so learning to say no to bullshit requests from crazy manipulative narcissists is a really helpful tool of recovery. But that's not selfishness. That's common sense. That's being a grown-up and not being a crazy, unrecovered Alan on Marta. Um, selfishness, this is where you have to define the terms. Selfishness is illegitimately putting my interests ahead of other people's. Legitimately putting your interests ahead of other people's, totally fine. So sometimes people in AA say, you can call me any time, day or night. Not me. When the phone goes off, it stays off. If you want someone to, if you have crises at two in the morning, you're going to have to find someone who's up at two in the morning because I'm not. I'm not. So um, sometimes it's the, the reason you get a conflict is not because there's a conflict, but because the same terms are being used with different definitions. So, uh, secondly, and this is a very common uh, this is a very common objection to doing step four. Um, it may come from therapy. It may come from somewhere else that you're being like super hard on yourself by doing this. Now, a couple of points. Um, first of all, we're not being hard on ourselves. What we're being hard on is the software that was loaded into us or was programmed by the family the society the power structures we grew up in what we're inventorying is not us we're inventorying the bullshit method of living which has not worked so if we feel bad about the things that we're finding on there we've mistaken ourselves for it's like a, we, you've mistaken yourself for your program you, programming you are not your programming so you're being hard on the on the bad wisdom, Suzanne Vega line. You're being what we're being hard on is the bad wisdom that was passed down on us. We're, we're learning to look at that and saying, OK, these values that I was given, like I, I'll give you one. When I was like 12 or something, I came first in something and my mother said, ah, now you've come first in this. That means you can do it. That means you must come first every single time and if you don't it is because you did not try hard enough <laughs> that was literally this is not subliminal this was not covertly telegraphed this was explicitly set out as the principle i should live by my job is to beat everyone else at everything the whole time and if i fail it's my fault because i'm lazy lazy um, uh, by the way, in my family, you can always tell who the alcoholics are. They're the people that my mother describes or other people describe as lazy. If they're described as lazy, they probably drink a little more than is strictly good for them. Anyway, but the point is, we're not being hard. On, first of all, we're not being hard on ourselves because we're, we're, it, it's like getting, like if you got the plumber in to examine and fix your plumbing, you wouldn't say, oh, don't get the plumber in. He's going to criticize your plumbing. And you, your self-worth is bad enough already. You don't want just live with the bad. It makes no sense. And it makes no more sense here either. 
Secondly, the purpose is to get past this crap. The crap is there already. And we're supposed to, we're, we're not analyzing, we're, we're setting forth the stuff which is super apparent. Um, the, 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 the one line you have to pull sometimes is um, on page 58. Um, and you do this with, I, I, I've had sponsees, I'm not going to name names. I've had sponsees who, whenever you say something, they say, yeah, but you said last week, or yeah, but at, at, at Hines Street, they say, or at Joys of Recovery, they say, or my last sponsor said that, or Eckhart Tolle says that, or and they, they come back with something else. And it's suddenly your job to reconcile you, what you have just said with the aggregate of some weird hodgepodge of completely inconsistent ideas and belief systems that they've collected like a magnet that's been dragged through the junkyard of life for the last 50 years. And suddenly it's your job to reconcile the new idea with this whole kind of massive structure, like an explosion has gone off in, in, a, in a shipyard. No, 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 no. What you want to do is say, page 58, we had to let go of our old ideas. All of them. So whatever you've learned before, put it on the shelf, sister. If anything you've learned before is valuable, then over time you'll figure out how, if and how it's consistent. Let's not try and reconcile it now. We're trying to set forth a new way of looking at things and we need a blank sheet of paper to do it. If you pour something into a cup which is full of something already, you can't pour anything in. You can't, there's an important principle from Course in Miracles. You don't take truth to error. You take error to, and you place it in a bath of truth to wash it and to give an image for that if you've got a, a uh, um if you've got uh dirty water and you add clean water to it you don't it doesn't clean the water you just end up with more dirty water so you've got you've uh, especially if people have got a lot of recovery behind them it's always a nightmare sponsoring people who've been in aa for 20 years or 30 years because it's almost impossible to get the whole system set aside that you have to do that otherwise it ain't going to go in so that's that's what i've got on those 18 questions thanks tim um if nobody else has got a question i'd like to oh philip and over to you. Oh, hi, and um, thanks so much, Tim. Just quickly then. Um, so are you essentially saying that the, the spiritual awakening offered in step 12, it says we're going to have one as the result of doing the steps, um, is a change of mind about who I think I am? You're not. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Absolutely. The what, what one lot, I mean, it, I quote A Course in Miracles a lot because I happen to be reading it a lot. Like five years, I was reading something else and the same ideas would be pouring forth just in a different idiom. So whatever you read is just going to be the channel through which the ideas come. So this is not Course in Miracles specific. It just happens to contain some useful ideas which are found in all religions. Just a little legal disclaimer there. But what it talks about in A Course in Miracles is if you're on the battlefield, if you know, if you've ever felt in your life you're like you're in a battlefield, um, if you're on the battlefield, you can't fix the battlefield. You need to be lifted above the battlefield. And first of all, two things happen. Once you're lifted above the battlefield, you can't be hurt by anything going on on the battlefield. Secondly, if you use your imagination a bit, you imagine the difference between being inside a battlefield and being above a battlefield. You know, it, to mention the Lord of the Rings again, the, the films, the scenes which are shot from within a battle, it's impossible to figure out what's going on. The scenes which are shot, shot from above the battlefield, you can totally see the strategies playing out. And it's exactly the same with our lives and with well, just the phenomenon of the material universe. If you're above the battlefield, suddenly you see what's going on. Or like in London, where you, you can't figure out how all the different tube stations relate to each other until you see a map and then it becomes clear. So I think the job of the 12 steps is to lift us above the battlefield so we can see things clearly. And then we can visit back 
in kind of non-corporeal form in the battlefield to get shit done, but without being hurt by it. That's the difference. So it's not that we don't, we don't separate ourselves from the material world. The material world is the place where the games get played out, the purpose is fulfilled, but it's from a recognition that our real home is elsewhere and we're just visiting back here. And that, that's a, there's Anne Lamott, Anne Lamott, L A M O T T. Uh, Anne Lamott is very, very good on on the on the philosophy of all of this, in a very, very easy to read way. She she refers to death as a fairly major change of address. Not even the most made, yeah, a fairly major change of address. So that that's what I've got on that. Alistair, I think you had a question. Uh, I did. Thank you. Um, was. Uh, regarding the sane and sound sex ideal, do you, um, with a, if you're uh, working with a sponsee, do you tend, do you go through that with them? Um, I've got a strong stomach, yes. Uh, although what what I tend to do, I've got some notes which I've compiled over the years from basically all the useful things I've ever been told by people who are in successful long term relationships. So I, rather than getting people to come up with something themselves, I say, here, look at this, pick half a dozen things you might be useful from the list, and then let's just go with that. Uh, and then you end up with something pretty reasonable. And what you might want is, like, if they're single, ideals for dating, if they're, if they're in a relationship. The, so the, the sane and sound ideals have to be tailored to the situation the person is in. But if you give them stuff to pick from and stuff to read, I mean, um, there are people who are very good on relationships. Um, Rabbi Harold Kushner, uh, Manus Friedman. There are all sorts of other spiritual writers who write about relationships to get to read some stuff, to listen to some stuff and to get ideas from the outside, not to try to figure it out themselves. Otherwise, they'll do what Mark Houston refers to as recreating yourself in your own image, just with this like spiritual glow about you but essentially you're still doing the same thing so that's where you'll be careful of with the same and sound ideals thank you i will just drop into the uh chat is a uh, link to um harry can i come in with just one specific one so in the 12 and 12 is it under step four or under steps 10 11 is a specific suggestion to put assets along with defects and i'm wondering if you've had if that if you've ever found that helpful to do that sort of thing I'll try and cover this quickly. Uh, the answer is no. <laughs> That's quick. Uh, but the reason why is because as soon as you are down with the notion that what you're... It's like when you clean a flat, you don't inventory the things which are already clean. You find what is dirty and you clean what is dirty. The notion that the 12 and 12, I think, is spiritually off in all sorts of ways. I, my personal view is that the notion of original sin runs through the whole thing. And I personally, I find that a little bit poisonous. And the idea that your, your value is somehow a balance sheet of assets and liabilities and you are this horrible mixture of it's just awful. It's awful. The, a much better vision is that we're of infinite value, but we just get stuff wrong a lot. We just make some mistakes. We make some really big mistakes, but that's only because, you know, we can be a bit dumb and we can be misled and frightened and so on. Uh, that's, it's a totally different, the, the spiritual model is totally different between the 12 and 12 and the big book, and you cannot reconcile the two. There are bits which are useful in the 12 and 12, but the underlying philosophy is hardcore Catholic philosophy, which came from Father Ed Dowling. It's, it's strictly denominational. One tiny thing on low self-worth. There is such a thing as low self-worth. Uh, uh, and you get it in people who are treated very badly and believe they deserve it. That's low self-worth in almost every, and I've sponsored people who are like that, and that requires a huge amount of encouragement and nurturing and building the ability to withstand attack and the ability to set boundaries of all sorts of different natures. But what you largely get in alcoholics is it, it feels like low self-worth, but it's the it's the 
Uh, someone said about Americans that no American believes that he or she is actually poor. They consider themselves to be temporarily embarrassed millionaires. That the right, the rightful place, and this isn't the 12 and 12, which American boy doesn't want to be the president? The idea is, is, is a very common one, that what feels like low self-worth is a feeling of guilt, shame, and embarrassment because I haven't managed to outdo everyone else, which is my true place. Um, so Clancy describes this perfectly. Uh, he says, if you treat me special, I feel OK. If you treat me OK, I feel terrible. And the way to test whether it's low self-worth or hurt pride for a failure to live up to your ambitions to dominate the entire world is to say, OK, do you find the following statement a threat or a comfort? You are perfectly average. You are perfectly ordinary. You do not stand out in any way. You are one of the crowd. You are simply one of seven billion people on the planet uh, with the usual mix of, of you know, uh, joys and problems. Uh, neither pati not particularly remarkable, neither for great virtues or great defects. In other words, you are simply an ordinary human being. Someone who's got low self-worth is that's going to be a, that's going to be healing ointment. Someone that's got hurt pride will be that you know, the sneer which will creep across their face when you try that one on. Then you find out the nature of the beast, what's really going on. I'll ask if you uh, if you could close the meeting with the uh, serenity. So we're looking at. Step five tonight, and there's a line here. I'm not going to read the whole thing. There's a line here that um, causes some problems. But they had not learnt enough of humility, fearlessness, and honesty in the sense we find it necessary until they told someone else all their life story. And I used to go to a meeting in Islington on a Sunday evening and um, there are a bunch of people there that would do these step fives that would take, they go to their sponsor's house and they'd go to their sponsor's house every Sunday for a few hours. And then within a year or so, <laughs> they made good progress. They were done. So it took about a year, every Sunday for a year. I... I uh, had a sponsee once that, that did, uh, I don't know if you ever had one that is obsessed with doing inventory. Every time they call you, they say, how oh, can I read some inventory? And your heart sinks. Um, and they're always remembering more and more things that they've said or done or thought or felt. And the thing is, it's like some little porridge pot. Um, obviously, the purpose here is not to recount in step five every single thing you've ever thought, felt, or done, because that would take as long to recount as it took to do it. So if you've lived for 50 years, it would take another 50 years to recount all the things. And often, actually, it takes longer to recount something than the thing took to actually experience. So very clearly, this doesn't mean everything you've ever thought, felt, or done, although that's the meaning it, it, it's given sometimes. Um, it's it, it's the, the, there's also a little habit. I will get to the point in a minute. Um, there is a habit in in AA. I don't know, maybe you've noticed this habit in particular in big book circles, um, in particular on in online discussion forums about the big book, where the great virtue is to take things literally um, uh, and then to ignore things like context and why it was written, who it was written by, who it was written for, what they might have meant by it. I mean, they want any of that. You just want to read what it says. That's all very well, but uh, in the Swiss law of obligations, as in AA, we don't just look at the wording, we look at the context. And when you read about early AA, I think they would have, I don't know what they would have said about the idea of step five taking a year of Sundays. 
that I can, I, I think I can imagine the looks on their faces. Um, when Dr. Bob took his sponsees through the, 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 the formal bit of the programme, so once you've got the preliminaries out of the way and you just you do the formal bit of the programme, steps four, five, six, seven and eight, before you get out there to make amends and get out there to do 10, 11 and 12, you're doing about four hours. Now, one could do that today. My observation, I've seen very, very quick goes at the steps, but they, they, they do they invariably need to be done again if they're done in, in the space of a few hours or a weekend. So I think the happy medium is to do it quickly enough that you get through it, but thoroughly enough that you don't immediately need to redo the steps. And my experience with willing sponsees, six weeks to three months from soup to nuts, as they say, is pretty standard. And that's not too long. And you're good for it. You're good for a couple of years then, at least. Now, how this relates to step five. Well, how do you follow this sense of all their life story without taking it literally? Uh, I think the idea is this. Um, what you want is the step five to contain all of the main highlights so that the person you're sharing with has got a sense of what your life has been. But that can be conveyed, I think that can be conveyed very quickly. Uh, Tom W. talks about uh, a friend of his who describes her childhood incredibly vividly and in a way that you can immediately get pretty much a great sense of what it was like. She said, I was fat and we moved a lot. Now, that's, that says a lot. There's an awful lot of detail, actually, in there. So I think you can tell the whole story in terms of broad outline, peppered with enough detail. I think you, you, you can do a good job of step five in somewhere between, Tom says, about 40 minutes. I think after about an hour and a half, you're not really saying anything new. It's just the same thing over and over. Because the fact is, there's a limited number of big ticket events and there's a limited number of character defects. So I think you can fulfill this criterion of telling someone all your life story without it taking more than an afternoon or part of an afternoon. When we look down here, where is it? the actual instructions on 75. We pocket our pride and go to it, illuminating every twist of character, every dark cranny of the past. Now, when I take people through step four, it's a slightly unusual way. What I, I've discovered through trial and ever, error over the years is uh, pretty much everyone's hand needs holding throughout step four because they're not only doing a step four, they're learning how to do inventory and using their first inventory as the worked example. Uh, and unless you walk them through it and uh, have, it, have them discuss it with friends along the way, it'll be an absolute dog's dinner. So by the time I've completed the step four with a sponsee, I already know everything. I already know all the twists of carriage and all the dark crannies of the past because they've been revealed as we've been going through. But I think there is a huge therapeutic value in getting everything out in one conversation. First of all, it gives you cognitively a good oversight as to what the problem is. And secondly, because you've conveyed everything all at once, um, and you can walk all the way around it, it seems manageable. And also, uh, if the sponsor then responds, you know, just normally afterwards, rather than, you know, holding up a cross and hissing and telling them to get out, then that's therapeutic as well. When you realise that all these great big dark <laughs> secrets and awfulnesses uh, actually don't amount to really much more than a hill of beans, not even Borlotti. Uh, just ordinary beans. Uh, I think that's therapeutic. But by the same token, if you haven't gone through the detail, there are so many lessons in step four. Unless you've gone through the detail and learnt the lessons along the way, um, you're going to miss an awful lot. And also, I think a lot of step four, particularly 
how we do the second column and the third column and then all that forgiveness stuff, it literally starts to rewire your brain. You cannot, in the course of a step five, a two hour conversation, completely recast how you view every situation you've ever been in, forgive everyone and do the job of step five of illuminating every twist of character, every dark cranny of the past. If you've got someone who isn't cognitively damaged, maybe you could do it. But 19 out of 20 people are basket cases when they get to AA. Incredible. There's, there's that line in the big book. Maybe your husband lives in that strange world of alcohol. So I do that in step four. So by the time you get to step five, the fever, the fever has abated. And you're now on fairly solid ground. And the job is to just get it all out in one conversation. Boom. So in a sense, the substance of it has already been done. But the therapy, by the time you finish step four, but the therapeutic value of getting everything out in one go hasn't been achieved. I give the example of that in my first step five. Um, my sponsor was was unaffected by it. And that was the single most important thing I think that had happened to me in AA was my sponsor being unaffected by my um, step four. Uh, if as a sponsor, you find something particularly shocking, uh, try not to gasp. It's difficult. And I, occasionally I'm afraid I have gasped. But then, you know, we sort of work it out afterwards. But there are some, there are some, you're going to hear some gruesome things, particularly where the person at the business end or the creature at the business end of their behavior was innocent. That, that those are very, very, I find this incredibly difficult to listen to. The more innocent, the, the harder it is to listen to and the, the more defenseless, whether there's a power imbalance. But one does one's best to, to keep a poker face. But anyway, I'm getting slightly off track. So what I'm getting to is this. We've done, we've, we've got everything out on the table, but we need to have this single conversation where we can walk around it in 40, half an hour, 40 minutes, an hour. So I get people to summarize, if possible, their step four. And also I get them, I, I get them to take step, take step five with a couple of other people. By the time you've taken it with three people, you're bored of it. Usually after one, you're still kind of scared of some of the material. It still has power over you. By the time you shed it with three or four people, um, uh, the power's gone. Um, and they did that in early AA, first of all. Secondly, it does refer, even in the book itself, to the person, where is it? Um, uh, person or persons there we go top of 74 before we choose the person or persons with whom to take this intimate and confidential step um people have some people object to that because they haven't heard of it before but if you can just get them to talk to a few people that have done it they're usually fine with it anyone that's very sort of prickly about it. it says well i'll talk about it to you but i won't talk about it to anyone else um i mean i won't insist but i'll say well if you want to keep everything very under wraps just with one person i don't think i'm the right sponsor for you because i've got a different approach um my experience with those people that refuse to share with more than one person is they want to maintain the double standards, the, the uh, stage character that it talks about. Um, they're still ashamed and embarrassed. They don't. They, and, and I've said to people, well, the only method I know of getting over myself is sharing it myself um, or rather the defects and behavior with enough people that I realize I'm ordinary. If you have a better solution, you go and follow that better solution. I literally don't know of a better solution than that. And I'm not going to co-sign not adopting what I think is, is the best solution. So go and you, maybe continue with someone else. It's fine. So I never force anyone. But I don't think you could. And also, when you find out what it is, the little secrets that people are embarrassed about, usually they're absolutely in the middle of the bell curve. It, it, 
it, it's I've never heard you know funnily enough the people with the with the most gory stories are often perfectly happy to share them with two or three people I mean you don't want to share some of these things at a meeting of course or put it in the grapevine magazine or something but that's a different matter um so the sort of coyness about inventory I think has to be dealt with head on anyway I get people to do a uh, uh, a summary and let's go back what have we got uh, twi every twist of character every dark cranny of the past the twists of character are essentially you might as well read out the whole of the sex inventory it will take 10 minutes because it's there's not a huge amount of material if you just read out the words you're done in 10 minutes if you've done it properly um twists of uh, sorry uh, so the fear inventory again if you've done it properly five minutes it doesn't so do those two first get those out of the way um maybe take a small handful of resentments which are illustrative of the whole phenomenon of resentment and then just uh read out the highlights from the fourth column and you can slot those uh, you could. Uh, there are two ways of doing this the summary business. You either take your stack of paper and use little post-it notes, rather sort of stationary tags, to tag the bits you're going to read out. Um, method number two is you actually write out a summary. So every twist of character, you go through the step four, looking for character defects, and then you give a juicy example of each one. And this is a very useful way of doing it and because there's a limited number of twists of character, there's a limited number of character defects. You only need a good example of each one. As, as Tom says, um, if you're a thief, remember step five, the exact nature of your wrongs. If you're a thief, the exact nature of your wrongs is you're a thief. There we go. You've said it now. Uh, you might want to give an example just so the other person isn't bored and so they believe you. But you literally do not need a catalogue of every single thing you've ever stolen. Similarly, if the exact nature of your wrong, it, uh, wrongs is you are punishing, give your two best examples. And so you can you can have you can get a handle on your twists of character very simply using the step four as the basis. So step five is not read out your step four. I'll come to where that's an option in a minute. It's taking the, the step four as the basis and then fulfilling the criteria of step five, twists of character. So there's a limited number of those, dark crannies of the past. Start with the worst and move backwards. And dark crannies can be things you did things that were done to you or things that were just weird and horrible by the time you've been talking for somewhere between 40 minutes an hour an hour and a half if they've done their job in step four i mean they're repeating themselves within half an hour but give it a few minutes and then say have you noticed this is the same as what happened with Jessica. This is the same as what happened with Susie. Can you see it's the same thing? You know it's the same thing. You can, and um, people, the, the penny drops. During the course of the step five, you can then say, well, is there anything else which is different? Look through your papers and say, is there any situation which hasn't in substance already been gone through? Or is it all just variations of, on a theme? And it's, it's always variations on a theme. Uh, you can always, the, the safety net is later on, what you can do is you can always, uh, I'll come to the end of step five at the end, you can always say, well, if there's anything else that occurs to you that you think is a nasty little secret that you feel needs to be conveyed, well, come and just give me a call and we'll run through those. It won't take long. So there's a safety net there. It's not as though if you don't say it now, you're condemned to never saying it in your entire life. Uh, hopefully, they, so if, if they've done their job also of getting friends in AA to help them write the step four, they've already said anything anyway. So the purpose of this is not necessarily to reveal new secrets that haven't hit the light of day. It's to get a sense of where I have been in belief, thought and 
behavior. Okay, so the, the, the two basic methods, I, either you get them to tag the step four for the bits they're going to read out in advance, or you get them to write a summary of twists of character on one side of the page, dark crannies on the other side of the page. Some people, especially if they don't have a job where they've ever had to write a summary or they've, been a, they've never had an academic content or they haven't had an academic situation in 20, 30 years where they've had to write a summary, they just go to pieces. If someone goes to pieces, don't force it. Say, so just bring your whole step four. And then you get them to read. And as soon as they start repeating, you say, as I said earlier, you, you point out the repetitions. Say, should we go on to the next one? This is the same. And then, and then you get through it that way. So you just spot the repetitions as soon as they happen, get them to skip and go on to the next one. Say, is there, okay, is there anything materially different about this one? No. You go on to the next one. Great. And that's how you can, that's how you can get through it in one go. Uh, and that, that works in almost every case. Um, there are, with people taking step five with others, uh, it's very important that they trust the person and the person is trustworthy, which is why people they've test driven by, you know, checking that they're doing inventory right with their friends. Um, hopefully they've already got a sense of who is safe to talk to and who isn't. So if you test drive people on a few minor bits of inventory, you'll find out pretty quickly, is this someone you're compatible with? Um, although it's tempting sometimes to go to, you know, random, kindly old timers in AA or kindly people generally to share your inventory with, unless they've done this in exactly the same way, um, you're usually going to get a funny reaction. Uh, and the reactions you'll get are these. Well, I don't know why you're doing it like this. I don't know why you're taking yes step five with more than one people. Why Why have you got, why don't you use the 14 character defects? Or this all looks very, very complicated. Or you haven't gone into this with sufficient depth. I think you need therapy. By the way, I'm a therapist. You know, you'll get all sorts of weird ass reactions which don't help. So although you may know a kindly person doesn't mean that they're necessarily appropriate. If they haven't done the step five in the same way that you're doing, if they haven't done the step four in the same way that you've done it, don't share your inventory with them. Because even if they're super um, uh, open to the idea and principle, uh, either they'll think you're not doing it right because you didn't do it the way they did it, or they'll realize you've done it better than they did, and they will start to feel guilty and awkward and then turn it back on you. That happens. So you've got to be super careful. So uh, keep it with people. I think keep it with people in your home group who you know who are doing it in the same way, where you're speaking a common language. People can keep their mouth shut. Um, if there's any sense of weirdness, don't. And don't do it with a close friend because that can be weird as well. So people that there's some distance from. So if afterwards you want to go and throw up and never see them again, it's kind of fine. Uh, you know, you're not going to jeopardize a friendship by doing that. Um, what else do we need to know about step five? So listening to a step five is the most boring thing in the world, I have to say. I know we're supposed to be like really interested in it and really compassionate and fine. <laughs> fine. But um, the truth is, my step four was really boring. My inventory is always really boring, um, which is another good reason for keeping it to one or two hours so that, the, you know, there's light at the end of the tunnel and the light at the end of the tunnel is not a, an express train hurtling towards you. Um, uh, if you're going to hear a step five in person, here are the top tips. Go for a walk to do it. Um, there's the sense that people are casting their past to the winds, to the four winds, as they're doing the uh, their step five. Um, 
some people object to this. They say, well, I don't think it, it doesn't seem seemly enough that they do not. So I need you to be sitting down opposite me, paying attention. Well, well, if you want that, you can pay a therapist £150 an hour. You know, you can pay for that. Um, when I was 15 years sober, so not exactly, you know, wet behind the ears or indeed anywhere else anymore, um, I wanted to do a step five with Brian, and Brian was sober, I you know, 30 years at the time. And he said, I said, can I do my step five with you? And he said, and he knew that I worked like nine to five. Um, and he said, I am free next Tuesday. Meet me at my house in Camden at 4.30. I have to be in Paddington at seven o'clock. You can read it. You can walk with me and read it along the way. He didn't ask if I was free then. He said, that's when I'm available. <laughs> and this is how we're going to do it. And the day was like today. It was pissing down the whole time so I was trying to hold an umbrella and my pieces of paper as we were walking down uh you know roads and canals with people passing us giving me very strange looks as I trotted out all of my various things um you're allowed to set you don't you you're allowed to set the terms for how you hear the step five some people want to sit opposite someone for eight hours and love that and the intensity and the intimacy and pouring over any detail. And if you want to do that, don't let me dissuade you. But if you can't face it, it's OK. Um, <laughs> when someone asks Tom, will you hear my step five? He says something like um, next Thursday. I have 40 minutes. And he says they'll respond to him. But I have 10 hours of material. And he'll say, you'll have to find someone with 10 hours of time then, won't you? <laughs> exact nature of your wrongs. I'm an ordinary human being. There's not a lot to see. Um, so I, if I'm doing one in person, um i go for a walk if it's in my i won't don't tell anyone i don't have sponsees in my home anymore there were there were some incidents and jonathan who is scientific talks <laughs> talked about bad energy on more than one occasion so i don't have people at home but when i did i would clean because you you got you got to have so you can listen and clean at the same time some people don't like that if, if if they don't want you to clean, ask them to find a sponsor who has a cleaner so they don't have to clean whilst listening to the step five. There are lots of there are people with cleaners go to meetings in Chelsea. They've all got cleaners there. Then you'll have, you know, and you'll have your sponsors staring at you throughout your step five, wondering why, why? <laughs> um, so walks are good. Um, Listening to a step five, thanks, Lovely. Listening to the step five when you're cleaning is is good. Uh, if you're going to meet in a cafe, some people won't do it in a cafe, and I, I sort of fair enough. But park bench will do in that case. But seat where you can look out the window. So get there first. <laughs> get there first. Find a good seat where you can look out. There's nothing worse than when you get there and they've 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 nabbed the seat and you're looking at a wall. Uh, so nab a seat where you can where you can look out and you can listen, but you can look out. Um, um, and I used to get super involved in detail in step fives uh, and I don't anymore. Um, uh, I think that the great the, I think you, I pour over the details with people in step four. Fine. But in step five, I think the job is to just get it out in the open. When they're doing step five with someone else, you they need to figure out whether some people want loads of input and feedback. Um, some people do not. I remember hearing a step five of a bloke 
many years ago. I tried to interrupt to say something at one point, and the look of pure rage on his face. And so I backed off and just listened for the next hour, and we were done. And he was done, and it was fine. Not everyone wants feedback, and that is fine. If they don't want feedback, fine. When they're asking people to do step five, they must always find out what the person's deal is with hearing step fives. So a friend of mine um, is even more like Vulcan Torquemada Barrister Rottweiler than me, hard as that may be to imagine. And he won't hear a step five unless he has absolute license to go in for the kill. And they're a blooded mess afterwards, but it's very, very helpful. And he's someone that uh, when, when I'm in trouble, I go to him and I, I, I steal myself as I know I'm going to be ripped apart. It's always very, very useful, but it ain't super pleasant always. So, you know, to find out when you're going to hear a step five from someone else, I, you tell the sponsees, find out what you're in for and ask yourself, am I up for that? Um, and to get agreement on what it's going to look like, what it's going to involve. You don't want to just turn up and have a blank check because odd things can happen sometimes. So I did a step five with spiritual Paul, who some of you may know, uh, he died a few years ago. And I got there and I started to read. And within 50, within a few minutes, he was starting to, we, we had, let, let's say, 10 minutes of preliminaries. And I started to read, and about five minutes in, he started, he, his head was hung down. He started shaking his head back and forth to Tim, 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 Tim. Then he talked at me. He'd seen me, you know, um, in meetings. So he got my measure. And uh, again, I was about 15 years sober. And he talked pretty much at me for about four hours. And I took notes. Um, probably one of the most helpful four hours of my life wouldn't be for everyone. And he did that with everyone. He hardly heard anything, but then talked at them. And, you know, every single person that I've spoken to who did their step five with him, he was absolutely spot on about everything. It was, it was extraordinary. And during the course of the conversation over the four hours, all of the dark crannies of the past got somehow sucked out and laid on the table. Ditto the, the, the twists of character. So people have got very, very different ways of doing it. And that's fine. Uh, tell them as well, if at any point in the step five, they get the heebie-jeebies, it's OK to stop. Because if you stop and you're wrong and you should have continued, you can always resume with them or you can just find someone more congenial. But if you get the hit, if you don't listen to your instinct, it can get really difficult because it's a very intimate thing to do. So if you get the heebie jeebies, uh, make your excuses and walk away and then call someone immediately. Um, is there anything else we need to know yet? Yeah. So at the end, once you finish this, uh, you get them to go home, uh, sit with a pen and a piece of paper, turn off all of the electronics and sit for an hour and ask my say, say to your higher power, is there any other character defect I haven't talked about? Is there any other incident from the past I haven't talked about that I need to talk about? Write them down at the end of the hour, call your sponsor, read them out, then you're done. And then over the course of your life, if anything else comes up, you can phone them, you can, you can phone them again. Um, and I, so I think the last point, uh, back to the, the, this person, uh, well, it's more than one person who always wants to read inventory. I think one of the, the, the key purposes, and this should come out of the conversation in step five, is that 
there's a limited number of character defects and everything else is variations on a theme. Once you've captured the nature of the character defect, being worrisome and fretful, being controlling, being dishonest and manipulative, um, overworking, being excessively concerned with appearances. You don't have to get the name of the defect. You just have to name the pattern. Once you've got those, you don't need to then spend the rest of your life reanalyzing everything again and again and again and again and again. Simply the job. So, ah, oh, it's that. So when I'm, uh, uh, when I'm engaging in worry, fret, brood, I don't need to look at the detail of what I'm worrying, fretting and brooding about. It's the fact of it which is the problem. Similarly with, with uh, you know, mental attack on whoever. I don't need to, I, it doesn't need to be endlessly analysed. So that's the big thing that should come out of this, is the analysis is there to get you to the conclusions, which is, here are my defects of character for six and seven. And now you, once you've got those, you know what you're working with and there's no need to pour over the workings endlessly. And that's a very important message which should come, come out of step five. Uh, I think that's pretty much it on step five. So I'm going to hand it back to you, uh, Alistair, to see if there are any questions. Thank you, Tim. Uh, the meeting is now open for questions for Tim. James. Thanks, Alistair. Uh, James Alcoholic. Thank you, Tim. And my question is, do you think there's a significant difference to step five or doing step five with somebody when it's their first time that they've ever done step five and when it's a person who maybe has done it once, twice, three times previously? Or is it the same? Uh, no, there's very definitely a difference. If it's the second one, I mean, we've got to define what we mean by first one. If someone's in AA for two years and then they drink for 10 years and then they come back, the first step five when they come back is like a first step five ever because it's covering years of carnage. But I think it's absolutely the case that once you've done what in a particular bout of sobriety or period in, in recovery, once you've done a step four and five and you've basically covered the past, going back to your childhood and all that, I think one must be very, very strict with oneself about not letting the inventory process and step five turning in, turn into what Clancy would call socially acceptable self-indulgence, socially acceptable self-absorption. With um, AA and the steps, it's rather like Goldilocks. You know, the porridge is either too hot or the porridge is either too cold, and actually the porridge needs to be somewhere in between. So, you know, what one lot of AA don't do never never ever touch the steps i'm all right after 20 years i've done the steps i don't need the steps if you've ever been to canning town <laughs> or by contrast you've got i've done the steps every year for the last 37 years and every time it's this great production number with these endless truths and peeling the layers of the onion oh god spare me I like the middle ground where you do it thoroughly, but you don't turn it. I don't want to turn my whole recovery into the Tim's inventory show. Really? No. At some point, you've got to change and let go of all this crap. So I think particularly with subsequent steps of four and five, they should be brutally succinct. And if you look at the experience of other traditions it's very helpful here so um the uh so anglo catholics and uh the episcopalians in america i think i'm right in saying that i'm not very good at christian dominations but there we go uh have something called the i think the catholics do it too sacraments of penance and what they do is they give people a list of character defects a complete list of character defects there's a list in the st augustine prayer book which is a splendid little volume, 
and they say, right, go away. Here, here's a complete list of human character defects. And it's an absolutely brilliant list, by the way. My favourite one of which is, is beautifully expressed, the initiation, collection and retailing of gossip. I just love that phrase, the retailing of gossip. I say, go away and come back and tell us which of these character defects you have Give an example of each. And you're done, you're done in an hour. You're done in less than an hour. So I think it's very important with subsequent ones to be, to be brisk and non-self-indulgent. We're cleaning house in order to make ourselves more effective in the world. It's not an end in itself. It's, I remember someone saying in a meeting, I'm, I sh shouldn't be recorded saying this. This is all very dangerous. I heard someone in a meeting once saying... The journey of recovery is a journey of journey into the discovery of self. Uh, I thought, oh God, there's there's this. I'm just an ordinary person. There isn't a huge amount of this. There's a life to be lived out there. That's what I want to be getting on with. So it's a means. So it's a means to an end. Now the reason for saying that is because the first one is very important. So. Although, it, when it's someone's first experience of a step four and five, you do your best in the step four process and in the preparation for the step five to get them to be succinct and concise and to, you know, chivy them along a little bit. Um, sometimes they just need to talk. And you have to break the session into two or three to get it all out. And if it's the first one, that's important because there, there may well be things that, uh, uh, which have never hit the light of day. Sometimes there's stuff that doesn't get written on the step four that needs to come out in the step five. So I'm super lenient with the first one. You do your best to keep it contained. But if it if 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 it breaks the banks of the river, fine, you just have to let it because you can't constrain the experience. The other thing as well, uh, with this method uh, the, of, of going through the step four with a fine tooth comb, so everything's been read out already. I don't think I've had an experience of a step five which has taken more than 40 minutes. There's, everyone's fine with it and everything's out already. Where you get these incredibly intense, strained step fives, where you're trying to get all the secrets out, get a handle on the patterns, do the rewiring, reframe all of these situations with huge amounts of resistance going on. That's what happens if you don't lead someone step by step through the step four. Uh, I found that before I did it the way I currently do it, two out of Two out of three step fives was were deeply unsatisfactory for half a dozen reasons, and then you have to spend the next six months catching up and making uh, and and compensating for the mess created by trying to do too much in a step five, and that's the problem with the step the the, the sort of traditional AA methods is I, again I shouldn't really be saying this on tape but the traditional way of doing it is you sort of send your little sponsee off into the darkness with their worksheets. And when they come back six months later, sort of blinking in the light to read it out, you realise it's an absolute, it's a, it's a shit shower. It's a dog's dinner. I haven't understood it. It's a complete mess, full of self-justification, missed the point completely. And then you're trying to redo the step four as you're doing the step five and get them to write stuff down. You can't do a good job of anything. Um, if I may quote Ron Swanson from Parks and Recreation, it is better to whole ass one thing than to half ass two or more things. So with step five, this aim of getting everything out onto the table in one go, if you've satisfy if you've achieved all of the other possible objectives during the course of the step four the step five is left with a, as a clean experience of just get everything out on the table at once um and i, I dread it's i'm sure you've had this with people who have had a lot of mental illness there's a huge amount of step work in the step four 
involved in reframing situations to help people see them rationally and sanely. And, uh, and that, that takes time for the water to seep through the parched ground. It can't be done in the context of step five. So you get everything else out of the way first, and then you don't have the problem of the constraint in step five. So I hope that's answered the question. Yeah, thank you, Tim. If there is a gap, I can cover step six and seven in about three minutes. <laughs> um, can I ask one question? Or just re uh, the, the, uh, the big book goes, it, it's, oh, some detail, it talks about, you know, the, uh, choosing the right person and talks about doctors and psychiatrists and um, even members of the family, I think. Um, uh, you mentioned that uh, uh, people not, well, not maybe not willing to do uh, multiple uh, with multiple people. But have you ever had experience of someone saying, "Well, I'm not going to do it with you. I'm going to do it with a my psychiatrist or a doctor"? Or yeah, okay. So I think this is the, there's a there's a, to a couple of topics here. Uh, the first one is the question of doing your step five with uh, a therapist or a psychologist or a psychiatrist. Um, and the question is one of domains. It's very important that the step four be a moral inventory far more than it is a psychological one. It does involve rewiring the thinking and looking at where your thinking is skewy and not where you've been trusting false ways of assessing situations. But it's chiefly a moral inventory. Um, and then in step five, it's the exact nature of your wrongs. And so it doesn't fall within the domain of, of, uh, of most. There are going to be exceptions. It doesn't fall that the, 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 the therapists uh, are not there as moral guides. Um, spiritual teachers might be. The clergy might be, although they'll have a different take again. Um, I, I, I've. I know people who've had great success taking step five with members of the clergy. Um, some are not used to lurid disclosures, contrary to popular belief. Um, <laughs> so, uh, again, you've got to find out what you're letting yourself in for. Um, but the, th the thing about the the... the uh, the therapy side of things. Some therapists are open to hearing step fives. There, is, there, are, there are therapists who are step 12 people themselves and are open about that and will hear a step five as a step five. But I'm a little bit skeptical about, you know, six months or a year's worth of ordinary therapy, which has got its own objectives, uh, being co opted to say, well, because I've talked about all this in therapy, I've therefore, by virtue of that, I've done my step five. And I don't, I, you know, uh, you could line up all the letters of the alphabet and say, well, all of my defects lie in these 26 letters. It doesn't mean you've actually identified and got them out onto the table in, in the manner that's, that's suggested. Um, the, there's one exception to the foregoing, and it sometimes people have had really very frightful or difficult experiences which are outside the scope of ordinary human experience and in those what they will sometimes do is mention those to me but then go into detail on those with professionals who are fully equipped to hear those disclosures and discuss them um if they don't want to share their stuff with me, I'm the wrong sponsor. Uh, because uh, sponsorship is about 5% presenting what the um, program is and about 95% application, application to what the person's life. If they don't want to talk about their lives, you, you, there's no, there's nothing to... to use as the vehicle for showing them how to work the program so if someone doesn't want to disclose their stuff to me uh i that's fine i mean i wouldn't want to i i'd find myself I, i'm the last person i would talk to it was i was quite remarkable that the phone rings at all frankly 
but um way I talk to people uh, but, but but you get the point it doesn't matter if they don't want to talk to me but as long as they talk to someone that's the point they must talk they must they must tell the whole thing to to someone any uh any other questions on step five of him sort of six minutes if there's not any questions Tim what any <laughs> six minutes and yeah I can absolutely because there's hardly anything to say so step six um where are we there we go if we've answered to our satisfaction so you've got all the secrets out and the character defects then we look at step six and we've emphasized willingness as being indispensable that and what the willingness is is to adopt new beliefs to be custodians and guardians of our own thinking and to act right that's what the willingness is are we now ready to let god remove from us all the things which we have admitted are objectionable can he now take them every one if we still cling to something we will not let go we ask god to help us be willing I think a very simple question is posed in step six, which is uh, the way I've been believing, thinking and behaving up to now in aggregate is the cause of my life. You look at my life. Where does it come from? It comes from those things. And that way of believing, thinking and doing is a package deal it can't be subdivided into little compartments and categories where you pour over each one and say well i do i want this or do i not want this it's an entire system so the question is do i want to let go of the system now if there is uh an objection to a particular there shouldn't be any objections because if you look at it at the level of the system there should be no objections in principle if there is something which is sticking, you can look at what is there must be some kick you're getting out of the defect, uh, which you're not willing. So you, you want the defect to go, but you you're lacking willingness because because there's some benefit you think you're going to forego. And a good example, which is very common, certainly amongst men, is why well, I don't I know this is a, a sententious one. No, I can't even talk about that. Um yeah i can't go into details but on certain character defects because it get it, it it gets it gets too sententious uh but the point is if there is a behavior pattern someone won't let go of uh that really won't do at the level of principle because it, it is absolute surrender but if there is one then you look at well what is what is the the, the benefit that is stopping you from being absolutely willing and then in step seven if you're willing, if you're completely willing, essentially to say, I would like a new set of tools for living. You don't change. The set of tools you're using for living will change. Would you like a new set of tools for living? Yes or no? Pick. You, know, you, know, you look at your life now. Do you want to keep it? or do you? It's like a game show where there are two buttons, red one and a green one. So if you want the green one and you want to go ahead, you say the prayer. And then step seven is done how do defects get removed is very simple in my experience uh, you take steps eight and nine because you said you were going to <laughs> in step three so we don't need to negotiate this it's already been agreed and just get it done as an administrative exercise and then if you live in 10 11 and 12 the practice of those changes your you're, you're adopting new ways of believing thinking and acting and in so doing the old ones are removed so the the direction as to what to believe what to think and what to do comes from god the uh power to do that comes from god so it is god removing them but we must take the initiative so i don't linger any longer than that on six and seven that's kind of it but maybe people have questions on those thanks tim yeah any questions just uh, uh small one a short one um do you have someone you know after their they've they've done their completed their step five they've been sat in a quiet place for an hour you have them quickly go into step six and seven as, as soon as possible yeah 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 there's not there's nothing to wait for and then to get immediately into step eight once you've said the step seven prayer the way you implement your your 
declaration of willingness to have God remove your character defects is to get on with the business of steps eight and nine as a sort of exercise over here and 10, 11 and 12 as the daily exercise. There's one, one more thing that's worth saying. You, you, I can, uh, I must take the initiative for adopting new beliefs for being a custodian of my own thinking, deciding which thoughts which occur to me I'm going to run with, which I'm going to reject, um, how I'm going to spend my day. What God seems to do or what seems to happen as a function of that is the old beliefs die away. The bad thoughts don't come as often or as intrusively and bad behaviour patterns cease to tempt I can't do any of that. God does all of that. But if I attend to what I can attend to diligently, then God does the rest. So it's like we do 1%, God does 99%, but without our 1%, the other 99% can't happen. That's how I figure it. Does anyone have any questions for Tim on that? Six and seven. Okay. Uh, well, with that, I'd like to hand it back to Tim to uh, close the meeting in the usual way. Well, thank you, everyone, for being here. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.